as title sponsors of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. We at NGC look upon the journey of the past 10 years with great pride and a deep sense of accomplishment. This has been one of our flagship sustainability initiatives and we are happy to celebrate this milestone anniversary with the Bocas team. Today, we look forward to deepening our impact beyond energy, supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goals through our green agenda and initiatives which are more future focused and for the purpose of gaining greater insight on how we are positively affecting the lives of people and communities. The work of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest fully aligns with our sustainability focus as it supports UN targets in education, arts and culture, empowerment and economic development among others. This alignment strengthens our commitment to this festival as well as our conviction that with the Bocas team we stand in good company to build a better foundation for the people of our country and the wider region. We are proud to be at the center of his dream and his vision. At the center connecting people with technology and offering tools for research. At the center of their success and creating a foundation for life's journey. At the center of learning and enriching the quality of life. When it comes to nation building, your library is at the center.
And I'll tell you, text me when you're ready. <clears throat> Hello, and welcome to the Bocas Lit Zess. I am Bookie Monster, the Book Zesser. Caribbean playwrights have long had to contend with the legacies of African, Indian, and European theater. Now in this arena, the words jump directly off the page and into the mouths of real characters. The ideas of the playwright become flesh and blood, or in this case, felt and stuffing. Now, we have an excerpt from the most famous of Caribbean plays, Tija and his brothers with puppets. <laughs> what happened to you, Tija? Why are you crying? I'm so lonely, so, so lonely. Oh, why? I have nobody to play with. So you can't play by yourself? You want some cards? You could play patience? You don't need nobody else to play patience? I don't like patience. I like Romy. You can't play Romy by yourself. Nah, to heck with that. All right, no need to get evil. Is you who ain't have no friends. <laughs> you see, you do stink. I don't want to play with you. Calm down. I go tell my mommy. Shh, no, look, no need for that. You don't have to go so far. Mommy, this evil spider monster trying to thief me. Devil, leave my son alone. You want me to send his brothers for you? Boys, get him, get him. Come back here. We come, come back here, come back here. Hey, all you want to play, Romy? He, he feel he could. He feel he gonna get a... Eh, eh, yeah. Come on. Mommy, mommy. Come back here, come back here. Where you going? Oh, you, you take a run in. Come back here now. That was an excerpt of Tija and his brothers. Join us again for another episode of the Bocas Lit Zest. Until then, I am Bookie Monster, the Book Zesser, reminding you, more reading, less stressing, is books have we zessin, is ideas we wetting, and knowledge we get in. Mm. Bookie out. part of our 2021 children's program.
surprise for you. It's a brand new animation. Let's take a look at the premiere of drama at the Tobago Heritage Festival. Our story today is drama at the Tobago Heritage Festival, written by children of Tobago. Every year, John and Nora took Billy, their champion goat, to Buku Race. But one year, Billy ran away from Buku Goat Race. The race was about to start. Bear, bear. Billy bleated because he did not want to race and he pulled away from his jockey. Billy turned around and head off the course and out of Buku. Stop, stop, stop. stop. Nora, John and the jockey shouted as they ran after him. But Billy continued running and shouting. Run, run. You can't catch me. I am the fastest goat on the island. He got to Scarborough and run uphill to the cannons at Fort King George. Nora, John, the jockey and some people from Buku village followed. They all shouted, stop, 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 stop. But Billy stop, shouted back, run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. <laughs> Everybody was out of breath. <sighs> and tired. Some villagers sat down to have a water break. That goat really run fast, a boy said. Yes, he could win the race this year, answered another. Billy heard and looked back. He tripped on a rock and went rolling over and over down the hill. When he got to the bottom of the hill, he get up and he started to run. He ran past the stadium all the way to Mount St. George and bounced into a crowd of people eating food. Stop! 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 You are supposed to be running the goat race, shouted Nora, John and the jockey. But Billy pushed his way through the crowd and shouted back, Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I am the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> but it was a harvest celebration. And the people served plenty dishes. Rabbit meat, crab, dumpling, fish, lambi, lobster, mm, barbecue chicken, duck, cassava. And he heard someone say, pass the goat. Curry, Curry goat? goat? Billy thought and ran faster, followed by his friends. In Pembroke, he ran in and out of houses. Hey, hey, why, 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 hold that goat? Stop that goat, hey, why, why? <laughs> And onto a field where people were pressing sugar cane. Stop, stop, stop. stop shouted the villagers but Billy just shouted back run 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 as fast as you can you can't catch me I'm the fastest goat in the land <laughs> he ran to Roxborough and through the main rich forest then he ran along a river bank until he reached the sea in Palatyville Nora and John followed running up the hills and down the hills and up the hills and down again until they got to Castara. In Castara, two sisters were putting leaves and wood and dry coconut husks in the dirt oven to bake sweet bread, coconut bread and cakes. Mm. Some of the Buku villagers stopped to buy bread, but Billy the goat was not stopping. He kept running. Stop! Shouted Nora, but Billy shouted back. Run, run, run! As fast as you can! You can't catch me! I'm the fastest goat on the island. Billy ran until he got to Mariah and bumped into a wedding party, doing the old time <laughs> wedding brush back dance from church to reception. The bride and the groom jump aside in fright. When they saw Billy Horns, Billy kept running through the wedding party, followed by his friends shouting, Stop Billy! Billy, Billy replied, Run, run, run! As fast as you can! You can't catch me! I am the fastest goat in the land! <laughs> he reached Monku Lane and Golden Lane, where under the gigantic Gangang Sara Silk Cotton Tree at Culloden, people were dancing the reel and jig. As he flashed up and down the hills again, he got to Lescato village and then onto Table Peace, where people were listening to old time stories. Now this story is about the Lajabless and the Lagaho. Wait, wait, wait. Stop! Stop! Shouted the villagers. You are going too fast. But Billy answered. Run, run, run. As fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> he was scared of the fruit bats at Diana's Vale water wheel and 
speed pass and continue running through Plymouth. The village with Tobago's famous mystery tombstone of Betty Stephen. Before the British it was settled by the Latvians and later the Dutch, the British established Fort James overlooking Corland Bay there in 1760s. He never stopped running. You can't catch me. You can't catch me. You can't catch me. <laughs> and sped past Black Rock until at last he reached Buku, followed by Nora, John, the jockey, and the Buku villagers. Billy shouted to the group, run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat on the island, and I could prove it. He ran back onto the racetrack, followed by Nora, John, the jockey, and the Buku villagers. Everyone, Everyone get, get off, off the race course! Shouted the MC over the microphone. Billy and the jockey entered the final race, and they came last because they were so tired. But Billy was given a trophy because he was the only goat in history to run across the whole island of Tobago. 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 Have you ever been to Tobago? Or do you live in Tobago? That's amazing! Now we're going to have another reading with Dragonzilla segment. The story we're going to read is called Drama at the Mariah Wedding. Read along with us. Drama at the Mariah Wedding The morning of the Mariah Wedding was wet and stormy. Sandy the bride was cross. Why is it raining on the most important day of my life? She asked. Ever since she was a little girl, Sandy wanted to play the part of the bride in the Tobago Heritage Festival, just like her mother and her sister, her cousins and her aunts had done. Her family had the best village sempstress make a long white frilly dress with a bustle decorated with colourful flowers and bows. She wore plenty beads and bracelets and long gloves and golden slippers. On her head, she wore a shining tiara and a broad-brimmed hat covered with flowers. Doofus the groom wore a scissor-tailed coat, a black stovepipe hat, white gloves and a bow tie. He carried a huge house and land umbrella. The wedding procession usually danced the brushback up the steep, long, winding road from Kitty Bamboo Gully to Lincoln Gap at the top for the wedding celebrations. But at 11 o'clock sharp, when the wedding was due to start, it began to rain heavily. George the driver arrived in his stretch limo dressed in a new suit, his hair plaited into a neat ponytail. Never mind the rain, he said to Thandy's mum. I'll drive them through Scarborough and Mason Hall before going to Mariah. Thandy and Drufus ran to the car and George drove off. Slow down, you're driving too fast, Drufus bawled. Don't worry all, we'll get there safely. George said, smiling. The rain kept falling and the road was wet and shiny. But when they left Kitty Bamboo Gully with the crowd following behind, the long limo got stuck on a bend with the front wheels hanging over a cliff. Luckily, the roots of a big silk cotton tree stopped the limo from falling into the gully. The bride and the groom looked at George. Don't move, he whispered. Two police officers appeared and helped all three back onto the wet Mariah Road. No one could pass the blocked road. Traffic backed up as far as Mason Hall. A villager offered a bicycle built for two to the soaked couple. The groom took the front position while his bride sat behind and they zigzagged up the steep, slippery hill towards Lincoln Gap, where the ceremony was being held. Guests and performers left their cars to follow the couple up Mariah Hill. Some squeezed through the small space between the back of the limo and the hillside. Some 
slithered over the top. Some even climbed over the root that held the car. They laughed at George, who angrily kicked his car, his ponytail swinging from side to side. Then, Drufus and his bride toppled over into a muddy puddle. Oh no, my dress is ruined, Sandy wailed. The crowd ran with their umbrellas and created a huge shelter for the mud-soaked couple. Somehow, they got up the slippery hill, dancing the brush back. Sounds of fiddles and tambourine music filled the air. The wedding took place under the house and land umbrellas. Everyone told Thandy she was the prettiest bride, even though her hat, her dress and her golden shoes were ruined. Nobody cared. One hour later, the sun came up. Wow, that was one interesting wedding. Can you do the brush back dance? Our next feature is a story called Trapped in My Phone. It's told by Auntie Nikki Crosby. Hi boys and girls! Now, this story is about Sasha who loved her phone. She absolutely slept with it, woke up with it. So one day, a Saturday morning, her mom said, Sasha, come and wash the dishes. Sasha didn't hear her, she was on her phone. Sasha, come and wash the dishes. She thought I heard how she heard her mom. Sasha, come and wash the dishes now. And she came with the phone in her hand. Her mom said, Sasha, you can't wash the dishes and have the phone in the hand. She said, of course, mommy, I could do it. I could wash the dishes with my right hand and have the phone in my left hand. So her mom left her. And while she was washing the dishes, guess what? The phone fell in the sink. <gasps> Sasha knew she would get into trouble if her mom saw her washing the dishes with the phone. So she decided she would reach in the sink and get the phone. <gasps> But the phone started to suck in and suck in and suck in and before you knew it, BAM! Sasha woke up in a very dark place and she just saw some beams shining. How was she going to get out of here? She was very confused. She didn't have her phone. And she looked around, she looked for a window, she looked for a door and then all of a sudden, BAM! A big black firewall stood in front of her. She got very scared. She said, no help, I have to get out of here. And as she tried to turn, bam, the black firewall says, hello, miss, I am your firewall. And I stop viruses from coming into your phone. Oh, am I stuck in my phone, Mr. Firewall? firewall. Yes, you are. And the only way to get out is you have to look for your apps and look for an app called Wild Kingdom. And if you can get past that, you will escape your phone. She got so scared. She was like, okay, okay. And before she knew it, she saw the beams and she decided to follow the beams and then she got the apps and she saw the app Wild Kingdom. And she, she jumped into the app. And as she jumped in, a little boy appeared. Hi, I'm Tim, and I'm going to help you get through this. I don't need your help, Sasha said. He said, yep, you will need my help because there are goblins and trolls, and I'll give you power-ups. And he handed her a magic sword. So before you knew it, goblins were coming and trolls were coming, and she pulled out the sword, and she used all the power-ups given to her by Tim. And before she knew it, she got rid of all the trolls and she got rid of all the goblins. And BAM! She was back in the kitchen. Water was running and she switched off the pipe and she had her phone in her hand. And she looked at it and she tried to switch it on. Then a message came up. You need a new SIM. And she tried it again and all of a sudden, she saw an image of Tim. <gasps> and then the screen went black. The end. Be 
very careful with your phone, kids. Okay? Up next, we have poems and short stories for SEA with Gregory Thompson. My name is Gregory Thompson. I've been a primary school teacher for the past 25 years. Today, I wrote a wonderful poem entitled The Pali. As you know, the Pawi is an indigenous species in Trinidad and Tobago and students are encouraged to protect and preserve this wonderful creature. The Pawi. A picturesque model purchased its beauty on a tall stately mahogany, mostly black in color with a purple sheen, your long neck and dula and tail are rarely seen. Hunters eagerly seek your pale blue face sometimes in abandoned and functional estates. Historically, not where your range used to be, but in lowlands both primary and secondary. An indigenous bird to Trinidad and Tobago, protected by the army both now and tomorrow. Whenever you visit the North, South and Central ranges, remember, please do not destroy these beautiful places. To protect and serve this bird is a noble act for it must not only be viewed as a local snap. The keeping of this environmentally sensitive party brings essential investment to our local industry. Students in SEA especially would be made aware of the importance of this particular creature because it is only found in Trinidad and Tobago. So, I thank you. My name is Nikima Marin and I'm going to read to you a story entitled My Achievement. It was a bright Wednesday morning when the sun peeped through the white fluffy clouds. As I awoke from a deep slumber, I could hardly recall what I dreamt about, but soon began to prepare myself for school. While tying my shoelaces, my mom shouted, Gabriella, it's time to leave! I quickly ran down a flight of stairs and went into the car. My mom and I left the house in a haste. We arrived at school 10 minutes before the first bell rang. The school guard, Mr. Lee, took out his thermometer to check my temperature. He then instructed me to wear a sink swill so that I can wash my hands. I was as excited as a doll with two tails because today was achievement day. After being allowed onto the school compound, I observed and followed all the guidelines. I scurried upstairs and placed down my book bag. My friends seemed very anxious, so I asked them, what is all this excitement about? One of them replied, I saw the principal carrying medals and trophies into his office this morning. After saying our prayers and the national anthem, we then took our seats. The principal, Mr. Kwa, started to call up the winners for the awards. He finally called my name and asked me to approach the podium. As my friends cheered me on, I felt a great gush of pride pass through me. Um, the principal handed me a trophy and everyone burst into cheers. At that moment, I remembered all the dedication and effort I had put into it. All the nights doing my homework and going to bed late, I started in Nassau when I was five years old. I spent six hours each day for three days in a week practicing gymnastics for the past seven years. Now I was able to accomplish my goal. Even though I've been training all my life, I knew that the stress and sacrifice would worth it in the end. I could not have done this without my friends and family. The principal also gave me a big brown envelope. He said that this was a cash prize for my accomplishments in gymnastics. I took it and profusely thanked everyone who supported me. This day will forever be etched into my memory for as long as I live. Thank you, everyone. Oh, wow, that was so cool. I hope you were able to learn something. I sure did. Now we're gonna have a reading by illustrator Daniel Budu Fortune. The saying goes, never judge a book by its cover. But usually the cover is the first thing we notice about a book when we're searching in a bookstore, browsing through the library, or even looking online for our next read. And when it comes to children's books or picture books, the art or the illustrations inside become even more important. 
My name is Danielle Budu Fortune, and I am the illustrator of the children's book Lost, a Caribbean Sea Adventure, written by Joanne C. Hillhouse and published by Caribbean Reads. Now, to help you understand what I mean when I say the magic of illustration, I'm going to read an excerpt of the book for you. Dolphin discovers a new sea. Now this is where Dolphin wakes up and realizes he is stranded in mysterious waters. Where am I? Dolphin asks. Wherever he is, the water is warm, warmer than he's used to. And everything is different. So many colors, so much light, so many things he cannot name. Dolphin whirls and twirls, trying to see it all at once. Is that a blue octopus? A seahorse? A lionfish? His Nima told him of places like this, but he thought she had made them up. Dolphin the Arctic seal feels a tickle of excitement. You're not from around here, are you? asks the jellyfish. He leans in close. He comes so close, Dolphin can see that his eyes are lined in pink. Where is here? asks Dolphin. This is the Caribbean, cries the jellyfish. The Caribbean? No, that's too far from home, thinks Dolphin. Dolphin's Nima will be worried. He wants to cry. An Arctic seal does not belong in these unknown warm waters. Hey, it's okay, the jellyfish sings, patting Dolphin's back. Dolphin pulls away. Don't worry, I won't sting, the jellyfish says. My name is Coral, after the reefs. I'm Dolphin, says Dolphin. Coral frowns. You don't look like any Dolphin I've seen. Now when Dolphin finds himself stranded in, in Caribbean waters, it becomes important for us to show the brightness and the color and the vividness of the setting. And the author makes that very clear when she talks about so much bright, so much light, and so many amazing creatures. I work in watercolor and so it's important for me to show the light, the brightness, the multicolored multi nature of our oceans. So as an illustrator, what we're looking for are the key words in the book. Words like light, bright, colors, things like that that help us see the author's vision and bring them to life. For that is the magic of the illustrator. The illustrator is not only able to see the vision, but is able to translate that into pictures. And enable, in order for us to do that, it's important for us to be able to read, to recognize keywords, and to understand. And this is a big part of the magic of illustrating. What a lovely story! It's time for a special treat! Here's a dramatic presentation of the story Lola and the Battle of the Ladybugs. Lola and the Battle of the Bugs Yellow sunflowers swayed gently in the breeze. The morning sun glowed bright and glorious. The garden was humming as the insects gathered for the annual flower carnival. Barry the bee was there, Casey the cricket was there, and Lola the ladybug was there. They danced in their seats. They were excited about what they would see at the carnival. Soon they would be twisting and turning to the lively rhythm of the djembe drum. Take a jump, take a jump, take a jump, fat now. Start to lift, start to lift, start to lift, fat now. Start to lift, start to lift, start to lift, fat now. Because it's flower carnival. Come on, kids, let's dance. Yes, you out there, let's dance. Start to lift, start to lift, start to lift. Okay. Okay, kids, are we having a great time? I can't hear you. Are we having a great time? Yeah! Hi, I'm Lola, and I can't wait to see my friend Collie the Croton on stage with all her bright colors. Oh, I just love colors. Colors give me that Caribbean feeling, you know. Yeah!
Lola, 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 Lola. Hi, Cassie. Do you really think we should have a virtual flower carnival? You ever stop to think, what if your internet drops or the electricity goes? <gasps> <laughs> Come on! Mary! Sorry guys, you know this pretty just gets on my nervous side. Nervous side? Have you all seen Kali? I think she's running late. I hope everything's okay. She told me a few days ago that she wasn't feeling well. Mary, Mary, I've told you over and over, you need to calm down. Yes, she was sick for about two weeks, but she seems better now. She'll be fine. Testing, one, two, one, no, two, three. No, about to stop. One, two. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our annual flower carnival. This year our carnival is a bit different. Please observe all the protocols, hand washing stations and social distancing. It is an absolute honour to host the carnival for yet another year. Our categories are flowering and non-flowering plants. This year we will be starting with non-flowering plants. Please welcome the one and the only Kali the Karatan. Come on, come. Woo! You don't want to miss Woo! this. Woo! Go, Kali. Go, Kali. Go, Kali. Go, Kali. Show us your bright pinks and purples and blues. Show us your rainbow colors, Kali. Oh, uh, is this a new dance, Kali? I, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling well. I feel dizzy. Oh, no. What's wrong, Kali? Is everything okay? Well, look at all the music. Oh, Kali! Oh! oh my gosh! Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Oh no! I got me up, open! How got me up, open! How got me up, open! How got me up, open! Why now, why now? The parade was going fine. Think, Lola, think what to do. Mom, what to do? Ah! Kissy, any ideas? <coughs> Mealy bugs! Oh no! Mealy bugs? Oh good! What should we do? What should we do? I'm thinking, Lola. Please give me a minute to gather my thoughts. Okay, hey! I remember you told Lola they spotted some time ago. <gasps> yes! She can help! She's the best, I tell you! Yes. Wait, 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 who is Lee Spotter? What is Lee Spotter? Are you sure she can help? I'm not sure, but this is Lee Spotter person. <laughs> Very relax. She's the guardian of the garden. Whenever the insects have any trouble, they will go to her for help. I think my cousin visited her a few years ago when he had the white spots. <sighs> the white spots? Lord, Lola, Casey, please do not tell me it is what I'm thinking right now. I've heard about this when I was very small from my mother. It was like a pandemic in the 80s. <laughs> this is way too much. This is too much for me. Very, too much. very, <laughs> very. I think you should stay here and give us updates. I'm not sure you can handle this. Keep your cell phone close. Tell us the minute anything changes. A minute. Okay. No, leave Carly. She needs to rest. Barry, you can come with us. Let's go. We have to go. But I hardly ever go outside since COVID-19. I'm not as young as I used to be. Just thinking about letting you in gives me the shiver. Just tell me about how your friend looks. Are the white spots moving? Where are the white spots? Yes, yes, it's all that you said. Can you please help us, ma'am? Please, please help us, please. No, I know it's Melvina, the mealybug and her gang. <gasps> I heard what happened at the carnival. Mealybugs are white and fuzzy like cotton. But they are dangerous. They are just like COVID-19. Them could mash up anything, a whole nation. Their damage causes leaves to lose their color, turn yellow, and fall off. I'm not sure I can deal with this now. Melvina is fierce. She has a lot of followers. Oh, 
we not you two? We have to hold it together. Please, Miss Lee Spotter, please help us. Please, please our please, friend please, is dying. Please, please, please. Okay, okay, okay. But on one condition. Barry, stop that nervous pacing and fainting. I must warn you all, Melvina has won many battles. You must be prepared to work very hard to get rid of her. Okay. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, I have an idea. We will challenge Melvina the mealy bug to a stick fight. What? Stick what is a stick, stick fight? fight? A stick Let me explain fight? stick fighting. Stick There's a gael. That is the space where the battle between two stick fighters take place. The fighters are accompanied by a dance known as Kalinda, which requires dancers to engage in mock combat with their sticks. There's also drumming and singing. Mm, I'm not sure about this, Miss Lee Spotter. I don't really have the idea. Oh. No, there's no other way you could do this. Now, who will take the challenge? I don't think we should take it. Come on, yes, it's a stick fight. I will show you the moves. Now, who is in? I will. We will. We'll all do it. Right, guys? Lola, I'm not sure about this. The last time I danced, I was in standard one. And I'm not so good with soccer rhythms. I have two left feet at times. What about you, Casey? Will you join me or do I have to look for new loyal friends? Mm. Yes. Yes, I will. Great. I love a good soccer rhythm. With me, family. With me, family. Sorry. Okay, let me show you the moves. One foot and bent one knee. Jump and hop. Lean your body left and right. One foot and bent one knee. Jump and hop. Lean your body left and right. Now, repeat the steps and look at my feet. Oh, I must get going now. Lola, you'll have to take over from here. I need to get to Melvina's house. She feels she's powerful, so I know she'll come. She loves a challenge. Bye! 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 Okay, guys, we don't have much time. Let's practice. One foot and then one knee. Jump and hold. Very, very. Okay, guys, let's continue. One foot and then one knee. Jump and hop. Your body left and right. One foot and bend one knee. Jump and hop. Lean your body left and right. One foot and bend one knee. Jump and hop. Lean your body left and right. Hello? 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 Oh, it's you again. What do you want this time? Can't you see I'm busy? I have the world to conquer. <laughs> I don't have the time for this. <laughs> Hello? You still here? I don't have the time for no old talk. The ladybugs want back their friend, Kali. <laughs> She's my prisoner. Not for long, Melvina. They want to challenge you to a stick fight. Did you say a stick fight? Yes, Melvina, a stick fight. You know what stick fighting is, right? Um, oh, it's a fight accompanied by a dance known as Kalinda. Who won't know what that is? It's been around for centuries. Impressive, Melvina. So would you take the challenge? Or maybe you are too afraid of the ladybugs? No. You sure? Are you afraid that the battle of the bugs will be won by the ladybugs? Of course not, those tiny bugs. Well, Melvina, if you are not afraid, I'll see you at 5 a.m. in Woodford Garden. <laughs> that will be easy. That would be like taking candy from a baby. 5 a.m.? <laughs> I'll be there. Bwah! Five, five, five in the morning. Five, five, five in the morning. Half past four to five in the morning. Five, five, five in the morning. Half past four to five in the morning. Five, five, five in the morning. Half past four to five in the morning. Five, five, five in the morning. Half past four to five in the morning.
Melvina, I see you made it on time. Please, no tricks this time, play fair. I'm not here to waste time. Let's get to it. Let's begin the battle of the bugs, Lola. <laughs> Kalinda, Kalinda. Lola, you need to focus. The mealy bugs are taking over. Kali, you must stand. Melvina, hmm. Melvina. I say, I say it on loose already. I say it on loose already. Take a towel and bang your belly. Melvina, Melvina. I say it on loose already. I say it on loose already. Take a towel and bang your belly. Guys, I don't know how much longer I can hold on. Honestly, they're killing me. I'm ready. One foot and bend one knee. Jump and hop. Lean your body left and right. I can't let you defeat me. One foot and bend one knee. Jump and hop. ritual dance dated back to the days of slavery when men would dwell with sticks or boars in the center of rings or guyals. Hence the word boarmen or stick fighters. Lola and the Battle of the Bugs gives young children an introduction to stick fighting in a fun and enjoyable way. The end. Jump and hop, lean your body left and right. One foot and bend one knee. Wow, Lola was so brave. Would you agree? Up next, we have an animation called Rock Fishing at Bloody Bay. This story is called Rock Fishing at Bloody Bay and it's written by children of Tobago. One sunny day, two friends, eight-year-old Jack and ten-year-old Ariel, decided to go fishing in Bloody Bay. They each had a basket full of bake and spicy fry fish and pineapple chow and sesame seed balls and juice. Good morning, Jasper, said Jack to the mutt, mutt sitting nearby on a wide, tall, immortal tree. Perched on the branches, just above Jasper, were some large brown birds. You lie in with Cockrico today. Ariel teased and they laughed <laughs> <laughs> as they continued on their way down to the sea. 
Soon they climbed a small narrow path through some slippery rocks, startling a pod of brown pelicans. The birds spread their wide wings and whoosh, 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 they were off. After a little while, they found a spot on the rocks and cast the lines up and out into the deep turquoise sea. Sometimes the wave made loud crashing sounds on the rocks below. Fish darted about, but even after an hour, their lines had hooked not a single one of them. They were just about to have lunch when Jack said, Look, 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 something glittering down below. They could both see it sparkling and shining whenever the waves went out. Yes, there's definitely something there. Ariel agreed. They threw out their fishing lines and after many tries, managed to hook and pull up the shiny object. Ariel and Jack stared at their find, a twinkling chain of tiny gold flowers. This could be pirate treasure, said Ariel. It must be pirate treasure. Jack responded breathlessly. Jack remembered a sketch of a pirate captain he had seen in a book. In it, a blue scarf fell below a big black hat with a blue and red feather pinned on the brim. A large gold earring dangled from one ear. He wore a bright green jacket, a blue silk shirt, and a waistcoat as red as blood. Dazzling multicolored beads covered his chest. Two heavy gold nails buckled his broad black leather belt, decorated with silver and gold skulls. A short gun with a carved handle and a shining cutlass both hung at his side. Loose black pants were tucked into knee-high boots. The picture showed the pirate captain in his cabin looking at a table covered with treasure maps. As they studied the golden flowers, they imagined that the beautiful chain once belonged to a pirate who planned to take it home to his wife. Ariel asked Jack, you remember your granny's story about a ship filled with gold cups and silver plates? Jewels, diamonds, pearls, and gold coins, doubloons, and sovereigns? Yes, said Jack. It broke in half on the rocks and sank. Yes, I remember that. But their favorite tale was the one Jack's grandfather told one moonlit night. The treasure is real. He began. A fisherman told me that once, while he was out on his boat, a school of singing dolphins surrounded his boat. Then suddenly, a giant dolphin leaped out of the water. On its head, he saw a gold crown with a brilliant hummingbird at the front. He saw that the colorful bird was made of diamonds, rubies, emeralds, blue sapphires, yellow topaz, turquoise, and purple aquamarine stones. With a great splash, the dolphin landed in the sea and just disappeared. For years after, divers searched for miles around, but they found not a thing. Could this be from that pirate treasure? Ariel asked. From the shipwreck, I mean? Jack inquired. Yes, why not? She asked. Next morning, they took the strange chain to school and proudly told all the children about their adventure. Remember the story about the bloody bear treasure? Ariel asked, holding up the chain, not allowing anyone to touch it except Miss Romeo, who they call Miss. She examined the flowers closely. It looks very, very old, like a real antique. We'll go on a field trip to the museum. She announced. She called a maxi taxi driver to take the class to the Tobago Museum at Fort King George. Everybody piled into the vehicle. They arrived on a hill high above Scarborough. As they got out of the taxi, they heard two loud blasts. 
and all heads turned towards the busy harbor where the biggest cruise ship was moving ever so slowly. Miss asked the museum curator, Would you be able to let us know the age and value of this necklace, please? The curator looked very excited as she took the shiny, rare piece of jewelry from Miss Romeo. She asked them to have a seat and went into a nearby room. Miss was as excited as the curator. Let's check it out. Ten years ago, the Boca Slit Fest established a storytelling caravan that traveled annually far and wide across Trinidad and Tobago. Coordinating all those community events was challenging, so we added a second team led by Natasha Jones, effectively covering the country. Hi, I'm Natasha Jones and I work with the Bogus Literary Festival, the children's caravan specifically since 2013 alongside Daniel Delore, who is the director of the children's caravan. I have been a team leader and it has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Just seeing these children grow year after year and they come to you and they go, Miss, Miss or Auntie, Auntie, you know, they're, they're so excited. What the children's caravan has done for them is to make them into, you know, free thinkers and also creative thinkers. And children never stop telling a story because we all want to hear it. We were often asked, why did we do it? We did it because we recognized a need to raise the level of literacy in children by involving them in an activity that was educational and fun. From Scarborough to a carcass, we traveled with the best artists who delivered original tales based on our environment, heritage, folklore, and culture. Children gained a true appreciation of what a special and unique country we live in. At our workshops, we provided a story title, and over time we gathered and edited over 120 short stories written by children. Our edited stories were illustrated by the renowned artist Clary Salandi and published with each child's name in the credits. Hi, I'm Clary. I've been doing illustrations for the wonderful stories written by the children during the Bocas Storytelling Caravan. Over 10 years, I've been enchanted, surprised, scared, and inspired by the vivid descriptions of the characters. I've been moved by the suspense and the morals in the stories. Our first book was in full color. Then we did coloring books, so we could add another fun way to enjoy the stories. I choose to illustrate the parts of the stories that are the most interesting to color. That way, while bringing the illustrations to life, we're also learning how to use color effectively. Children, I know that you have enjoyed creating those stories as much as I have loved illustrating them. Thank you, Bocas. Thank you, children, for fantastic stories that keep us reading, coloring, and imagining. Our home in Tobago is at the new Scarborough Library in Scarborough, the capital of Tobago, an island noted for over 10 name changes and which has the oldest protected rainforest in the Western Hemisphere. In the northeast of Trinidad, we worked with children from the villages of Matlot, Grand Revere, home of the Pawi bird and the leatherback turtles, and Toko, where fishing and agriculture are the main activities. Workshops were run at the National Library and Information Systems Authority, NALIS, in the Royal Chartered Borough of Arima, so granted in 1888, and the ancestral home of the Caribs. Then down the eastern main road, we headed towards Sangre Grande. Then south, passing through Sangre Chiquito and Manzanilla, where the protected wetland of the Nariva Swamp drains into the sea. In Mayaro, 
Children from Guayagayari joined us at the BPTT Resource Center. Here in this area, agriculture, fishing, and the oil industry fuel the economy. Hi, my name is Sam Morgan, and I have been a part of the NGC Children's Focus Live Fest for approximately five years. What I enjoyed the most was that they allowed us to use our imagination to create stories. I have looked forward to seeing my name and our story published the following year. I am proud to be a part of the NGC Children's Focus Live Fest. We proceeded to Debe and then on to Separia. We established our annual caravan at the Cedrus Community Center, catering to children from as far as the carcass. Hi everyone, my name is Tia Archibald and I'm proud to say that I attended three Bocalit Fest children's caravan events in Sapphire Public Library as well as Debe Public Library. What I enjoy most about Bocalit Fest is the storytelling from all the different storytellers in the Caribbean as well as Trinidad and Tobago. And the best part I personally find about Bocalist Fest is because you get to meet this dragon right here. Isn't he cool? And the thing is, Bocalist Fest influenced me to write my own stories and poems and to perform them to with confidence. Bye! Turning towards the north, workshops were held in La Brie, the home of our renowned Pitch Lake. Then onwards to San Fernando and the Nalis Library that occupies the original building of the Carnegie Free Library established in 1919. We then travelled to the NGC Coover Joylanders Steel Orchestra Panyard, where we held many sessions. From Coover, we journeyed to Shogwanas, where we worked on the east of the Solomon Ho Choi Highway at the Diwali Naga site. Then, on to the north. We arrived at City Hall as guest of the Mayor of Port of Spain and presented an educational extravaganza with over 300 primary school children and teachers annually. Hi, my, my name is Atiyah, I'm a Chaka athlete. I was selected to run the Crystal Games in 2019. I attend Ashley Gill College, Tinopuna. I attend the Bocas Festival since I was five years old, my sisters and I, which we helped to write numerous of books which our name was featured. We enjoyed the Bocas Festival so much, it was a lot of fun, just we, we got too old to attend, that is the only reason why we stopped. If we could have gone to more, we would have. In Woodford Square, we lunched in the shadows of the 1917 Victorian bandstand and our final destination just past the old fire station Nalis. Over three days students attended workshops and readings and the final event of a month-long storytelling caravan tour. Hi, I'm Penelope Spencer and I have been a part of the Bocas Lit Fest for a number of years. Right, and it's been wonderful. I mean, when Daniel De Leon called me and said, Penny, I want you to do some work with the children at Focus Lit. I said, Yes! I want you to volunteer. And I said, Yes! But it's been fun. I love working with children, I love storytelling, and I love the work that Focus book has been doing this, doing this for over 10 years and it's been wonderful, so inspiring and motivating and the children love it! Children come from all over Trinidad, they know, all over. One time there were children from Labre, there were children from Point, there were children from Cedros, Mayaro, children come from all over. So if you have never been a part of Bocas Fest, come find out about us and join us. Have a wonderful day all. Hi, I'm Auntie Nikki, Nikki Crosby, and I have been associated with this festival for many years. You know why? Because I love to encourage children to read, open up their imaginations. Yeah, you need to read a book too. We are publishing short stories from our Dragonzilla Short Story Writing Challenge, and we conclude our lineup with the launch of a new children's bocus book prize for stories written for 7 to 12 year old children.
for joining our show. Hope to see you again. Bye! Celebrating Caribbean voices and preserving the rich tapestry of our culture. Through literary arts and authorship, we are free to express our vibrance, passion, heritage, and the empowering narratives of our people. As proud title sponsor of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest, we have been honored to support one of the world's acclaimed literary festivals. We celebrate your journey and salute your accomplishments. When I was born, my father gave to me an angel horn with wings of melody. That angel placed her lips upon my fingertips and I became, became her secret name. Her name grew strong, spread like a passion tree. She named the song, I played the melody. And in the morning hour, I awoke to dream of her. And all day long, day long I lived her song. In boat and barge, where songs and seas are friends, our dreams grew large, made love where dreaming ends. And people placed her lips upon our fingertips, and friends became, became our secret name. Now light is low, new angels come and go. The passion tree spreads dense as destiny, and 
and this old angel horn strides like the lifting dawn. Love moves to claim, to claim our secret name. We are proud to be at the center of his dream and his vision. At the center, connecting people with technology and offering tools for research. At the center of their success and creating a foundation for life's journey. At the center of learning and enriching the quality of life. When it comes to nation building, your library is at the center. Welcome to Just Cooking with Just Lisa. I'm Just Lisa, and today I'm just cooking Pelau. Pelau, of course, is a very famous national dish of Trinidad and Tobago, so you know I want to get it right. And today in studio, I have the guest, Abbe Bailey, who's a master Calypsonian and an ex tempo singer, and Speech E. Fai. Miss Fai is a member of a Tobago speech band. Welcome to Just Cooking with Just Lisa. I'm in total dismay. I thought was I cooking the pilau today. Pilau preparation provides a total creation. I'm a granny recipe, so nobody could beat me. Will be better than the rest. My pilau would be the best. Mr. Fiddler, I have a complaint to raise with this preponderance of self-praise. I would never say my pillow is the tongue shall proclaim. My pillow has to be more brown than that. Yes, I find this chicken looking a little pale. Mm -mm. Well, this is what has happened when you only have bottle seasoning and thing, eh? Oh, it's done. Yeah, but it sure is just cooking with just Lisa. You didn't think you had to eat? You know, I did just eat a doubles before I come down the road. <laughs> well, you come on the whole show and wouldn't eat a grain of rice? Uh, um, I can't understand all the man. Go and find something to eat. Nah, only ridiculous. I'm good, I'm good. I'm fine. Nah. This has been Just Cooking with Just Lisa, and today we just made pilau, which these Nimakaram, ungrateful guests of mine, refuse to eat. And you know what? Next time, I will put it in the contract. Because it's called Just Cooking with Just Lisa, you'd expect they would just eat. Anyway, next week, macaroni pie. Ketchup. Okay, give me some pepper. Slight, eh? Slight. I say slight. Stop there. Stop. I say slight. Good man, but you go kill me. I feed this now. That that. Uh, oh, oh, hey, hey, um. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, all right. All right. All right.
Too much kisses. You're killing me with kisses. Ah, oh, you're killing me with kisses. Oh, gosh. You're killing me with kisses. Oh. What? What? You're killing me with price. You're killing me with price. No. No. What? No. You're trying to kill me with price. Sunlight does kill COVID. Mm -hmm. What? What? Is a puppy? Oh, that's the cutest puppy I ever see. Oh gosh! Oh gosh! It's too much. It's too much cuteness. It's too. <laughs> it's too much cuteness. You can't with cute. You can't. You can't. <laughs> Oh God, he's killing me with cuteness. <laughs> all right, all right, so here this one all yeah. So um, a, a kobo, a parrot, and a kiss kitty walk into a bar, right? A kobo, a parrot, and a kiss kitty, right? Like a green top parrot, not, a, not unlike myself, right? Um, walk into a, well, they ain't so much walking as they fly in, right? So it's a kobo, I tell you, it's a scarlet ibis, and a, a oh, no, no. It's a kobo, a parrot, and, um, and a kiss kitty, they fly into this bar, right? <laughs> and then um, the, the scarlet ibis say to the man behind the bar, oh, sorry, it's not a scarlet ibis, it's the kiss kitty. As, as, so, so they fly in the bar, right? And then he asked the man, and the man say, all oh, your serving bird seed here. Well, it's not the man, it's bar man. Well, hold on, it's not really a Why bar. Are you killing the joke. No, no, I have it, I have it. It's not a bar, it's um, killing that joke, boy. It's a coffee shop, but it does serve drinks, right? So, so um, the. It done already? Shucks, this was now getting good. <clears throat> that was an excerpt of A Brief History of Seven Killings. Join us again for another episode of the Bookas Litzess. Until then, I am your host, Bookie Monster the Bookzesser, reminding you, more reading, less stressing. Is books have we zessin? Is ideas we wetting and knowledge we Okay, out. history. Those who have said, oh, well, you know, slavery, plantation, indentureship, all of that was a long time ago. We have moved on. No, it is here, alive, and well. Now, the reason why we have said in the Caripom Reparations Commission that this is all about development, mm -hmm. because the effort to discredit the reparatory justice movement, which says, well, you know, and the reparations is about looking back with anger and looking back with vexation. Uh, black people, rather than taking responsibility for the economic development and the transformation, they are looking for a handout from white people, from people who have nothing to do with the contemporary poverty and marginalization. So those are the counter arguments. What we have said is, listen, let us look at this 20th century. In the 1930s and 40s, the majority of the people in the Caribbean rose up against colonization and demanded independence and freedom. Reluctantly, because of their strong support, they were granted. At the moment where they were asking for sovereignty, independence, and the negotiations took place, they asked for a development grant to fund the first national development plans for these countries. Jamaica was first out of the blocks. Moving to independence, 1962, the premier of Jamaica, Sir Alexander Bustamante, accompanied by the Honorable Edward Siaga. In the first week of July, 1962, months before independence, they went to England to discuss 
a development plan. And they said to the British government, the Macmillan government, and Reginald Morden was Secretary of State for Colonies, Jamaica is now entering independence. You have colonized our island for 307 years. The island is in a mess in terms of infrastructure potential for development. This is the first national 10 year strategic plan and we're asking for a contribution. I think the figure was a mere 20 million pounds to build factories, to build roads, to create the foundations for economic development. The British government told the Premier of Jamaica, literally, to go to hell. Edward Siaga, to his credit, became so irate by what the British government had told Jamaica. He said, listen, Jamaica is in a shambles because you have extracted all of the wealth of Jamaica over 300 years. He said, we have, we have spaces in schools for 7% of the children. 7% of the space in schools for children. Jamaica today is still struggling with providing good capacity for all of the children as a civil right. Or, he said, we have, we have housing for only 20% of the people. Appropriate housing. Only 15% of the households have running water. And he outlined the result of British extraction of wealth leaving Jamaica in a condition that they did need that capital injection to move towards sustainable economic development. They thought they had a right to it. The Jamaica Premier said, we have a right, you must treat us equitably. They were dismissed. Eric Williams was next. He went up to London to discuss support for his five-year economic development plan, which was a magnificent national plan to convert a colony into a sustainable industrial nation. And Britain told him the same thing. It was Williams who I think coined the expression most precisely. After he left the House of Parliament where he met with the British government, he went to give a lecture to students at LSE. And he, he started his lecture with the following statement. For us in the Caribbean, Britain sees us as an orange. And the students looked kind of dismayed by this concept of being seen as an orange. He said, he went on to say, they have sucked us dry, thrown the peel onto the ground, and now their only concern is that they're not going to step on the peel. And that was how Williams captured Britain's rejection. Meanwhile, Britain had given 50 million pounds development aid to Malta to go off into their independence. Meanwhile, Britain had met with the leaders of the East Indian colonies so bear in mind, Britain has two groups of colonies, the East Indies colonies, the West Indies colonies, met with the leaders of the East Indies colonies in Ceylon and worked out what became known as the Colombo Plan. The Colombo Plan was a kind of martial aid plan for the East Indian colonies. So Sri Lanka, India, Burma, Malaysia, and so on. And they received this framework the East Indian colonies received this framework for development in which Britain pumped millions of pounds to facilitate the transition of the East Indies colonies into nations, mm -hmm. into sovereign nations along the industrial trajectory. And off the East Indies went into development, the result is history, we can see what it is now. The West Indies were told to go to hell. And why did they reject the West Indies? Because the West Indies was the place where they had put the white supremacy system in place. The West Indies was the home of their white supremacy culture. Black people were not only in their thinking, not entitled to a development plan, not entitled to a development plan, they were not deserving of it. They were not deserving of a development plan because they are the offspring of enslaved Africans who were property. 
they are not deserving. And they push the West Indies aside, leaving the West Indies in a shamble. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, had said in, in 1926, uh, a few years after he was no longer Prime Minister, he said, the Caribbean is the slum of the British Empire. Mm. It, is, it, has, it has the worst demographic public health indices in the British Empire. We were the slum. And this is why, because we were the slum, we were treated as slum dwellers for the next 50 years. So we got no support. Mm -hmm. And we went for a federation because we thought the best way to lay the foundation for economic growth and social integration was to federate. Britain refused to give them any support of any serious significance. They're underfunded. And now, Andy, we have the archives of that period. Mm -hmm. We have the documents of that period now made publicly available. And we can now establish that the British strategy was to deliberately financially suffocate the Federation because they knew that it was a strategy for West Indian development. And any development paradigm that came out of the Caribbean, they were going to block it. But thankfully now, we have those intergovernment documents where the foreign office was speaking to the cabinet office and we have those correspondence where the British government made it perfectly clear. They are going to give it formal support, but the real strategy is they're going to strangulate it. They're going to strangulate it and they're going to set those islands against each other as they have always done. But now we have the proof of that. And all of this is captured in a book I have just completed entitled How Britain Underdeveloped the Caribbean, a repertory justice response. So reparations then, we have put all of this together and we have said in our commission, it is about development. It's about economic and social development. Britain has a debt and we are building upon the Arthur Lewis paradigm because in 1940, so Arthur Lewis, you know, our Nobel laureate in economics, he said, the only chance these Caribbean islands have of moving into development, industrialization, global competitiveness, is they need, they must have a major injection of capital to lay the infrastructure. Right. The most obvious source of that capital injection, he said, is the value of the 200 years of free labor. He said, Britain took 200 years of free labor. And we did the numbers. 200 years of free labor from about 15 million people. If you take 200 years of free labor from 15 million people, including adults and children, and remember, you know, the children entered the production system as soon as they were weaned, three and four years old, they were out on the plantations uh, carrying out tasks because the notion of an unemployed, an unemployed asset, you could not tolerate the notion of an unemployed asset. All assets had to go to work. And we did a calculation, and you're talking about seven trillion pounds if you were to make a calculation on the unpaid labor Britain took from the Caribbean. That is more than their GDP. But it's just a reference to give you a sense of the enormity of it. And so we have said, Britain must come back to the table for stage two. What is stage two? Stage one is when they sat at Lancaster House and discussed the terms and conditions of independence. Bear in mind, Andy, in those conversations, the CARICOM governments back then had actually said, you need to give us a grant of about 200 million pounds to begin this journey. So there was always a development figure on the table and Britain had consistently rejected any development aid for the Caribbean. Their position was, we will give you social aid. Mm. We are not giving you development capital, we're giving you social aid. So to the extent that we admit responsibility for the poverty and the degradation in the Caribbean, we will give you social aid. We will give you something towards health, something towards um, 
public health care, diseases control, and so on. But support for economic development, out of the question. We have said we want to go back to the table, and we've invited the governments of Europe to come back to the table to discuss the legacy of colonization, the poverty, the endemic challenges, not only with public health, inadequate infrastructures for schools, uh, terrible situations in terms of human rights for hospital and public health care, very poor undeveloped agricultural systems. And we have said, you need to come back to this. Welcome to the 11th edition of the Bocas Lit Fest. Listen, you have to be excited about this because today we're going to be looking at the big idea, the way forward for the Caribbean, especially kind of after COVID-19. Just what does it mean? What is this big idea that we need to figure out to move the Caribbean forward? Well, don't worry. This morning we have all the experts with us to talk about it. We do have Professor John Agard with us. We have uh, Nicola Sagba, Sagba, Sabga, and of course, Justice Ram. And all of us, all of them are here to share with us in the discussion about how we can move the Caribbean forward, whether it's sustainable development and climate change, whether it's leadership and civil society. And of course, we want to look at economy and a trade. So all of this coming up in the program. We're here with you from 1030 until 12. I am Natalie Lagore. I am just the moderator for today. But of course, you can see our guests on screen who are rearing and ready to go. But before we get to them, let us look at what some of the voices across the region have to say about the big idea and the way forward for the Caribbean. Here is uh, Janelle. I'm not seeing the names up there. I think it's a little bit too high, Nicholas. We do have our technical team in the back uh, helping us here. So we do have Nicholas and Alana to help us. So we have, hold on, let me see if I can go up some. All right, I'm not seeing my 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 cursor. Um, we do have Spence in the background, but no problem. We have a three young leaders here with us to talk to us about what's happening in the Caribbean. So let's go to that video with them. Hello, my name is Janelle Clark and I'm from Barbados. I'm currently based in Geneva where I work as the advisor to the executive director at the International Trade Center. I'm very happy to be here today at the Boca Slip Fest virtually and to contribute to this discussion on what post-COVID recovery could look like and what we hope for. The pandemic has laid bare our vulnerabilities and weaknesses within our global economy, but has also presented us with an opportunity to figure out how we can grow and improve in ways that are much more equitable and can be much more accessible. We saw that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women, which is also concerning when we consider the fact that women are primary caregivers in the household and they take on the bulk of unpaid care work. And to be sure, the work within the productive sectors of the economy are dependent upon this unseen, unpaid care work that is in the core economy. And when we can also consider the fact that where these sources of income dry up for women, this has a very direct impact on the social welfare of the communities that these women support. We know that women's economic empowerment has a very direct relationship to economic transformation, and yet, Within the Caribbean, women's levels of entrepreneurship and women-owned businesses are still much lower than their male counterparts. They still face barriers to entry, barriers to trade, and just difficulties with regards to access to financing. So there's still a very uneven playing field when it comes to this. 
Yet, we know that if we invest in gender equality globally, we could add 13 trillion to the economy by 2030. That's it tells us then that we need to think of how we can mainstream gender inclusivity with and women's economic empowerment within the post-COVID recovery plans, not as an afterthought, but at the very beginning to make sure that these existing gender gaps do not continue in the future. So my question to the panel is, how can we make sure that the post-COVID recovery is much more gender inclusive? And what measures would you look at first to make sure that women's economic empowerment is mainstreamed from the very beginning? Hi, my name is Marika Duki, born in Trinidad and Tobago and raised in St. Martin on the dead side. Um, I would like to first start off by thanking all the organizers of the Boca Slit Festival um, in having me here today, um, and also to the panelists who join in uh, on these uh, discussions about our ideas about the future of the Caribbean region. Um, a little bit of background about myself, I'm a education development consultant focusing on strengthening education systems, um, especially to meet the demands of the changing world. Uh, I definitely promote the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, um, especially Education for Sustainable Development, um, which I also find is not being um, sufficiently addressed across the region. Um, and so for that, I'm trying to build capacity in these areas. Um, some of the work I've done, uh, for instance, uh, in St. Martin, uh, involved um, disaster risk reduction work, uh, recovery efforts with UNICEF Netherlands uh, in St. Martin after the devastation of Hurricane Irma in 2017. Um, I also worked with the Ministry of Justice um, to sort of strengthen the education program um, a bit uh, for the juvenile uh, adolescents. Um, and of course, I've done lots of community work, volunteering my time, building projects um, where we enhance our capacity in different areas on St. Martin, um, social livelihoods, uh, protecting and safeguarding those, as well as um, I'm on the board of environmental protection in the Caribbean, um, and we focus on research, restoration, education, and advocacy in the Caribbean region. Um, so a lot of my work spans focusing on education and environmental and the environmental sector where climate change is concerned, especially. Um, and so a few concerns that I have for the Caribbean region um, would involve, for instance, uh, and my heart goes out to St. Vincent and the Grenadine and all the lives that are being sort of displaced due to evacuations with the volcano. But for me, it, it's this, this moment that we're experiencing now through St. Vincent and the Grenadines um, also highlights the fact that the Caribbean region is definitely at the forefront of uh, drastic climate changes where we're going to have um, stronger weather patterns and um, it, it's, it's sort of we're prone to have that natural disaster, um, you know, future, you know, and I just I think about it and I, I it, it pains me to know that, you know, we can start talking about climate refugees and, and people from the Caribbean being displaced um, instead of people coming to the Caribbean and enjoying, you know, it, it's to think that this is the future that we're, we're projecting uh, forward. Um, uh, it's in my best interest and everyone to sort of find ways to preserve um, the lifestyle that we have here, but in doing so, uh, creating sustainable solutions that is going to really reap the benefits for the generations to come. Um, and so uh, I, I find that there's not a lot of talk about mental health services, for instance, um, especially after experiencing Hurricane Irma uh, and, and seeing trauma firsthand, experiencing it myself, um, I feel as though that mental health services, psychosocial support, of course, during the disaster and after post-disaster, uh, these things are very important. Um, for the longevity of the people in the Caribbean, um, especially being that we're going to be experiencing um, such drastic patterns that, that, you know, really can disrupt 
how we interact with our environment out here. Um, and so for our everyday lives, it's important that we really focus on mental health and strengthen those services. So that's one area that I really would love to see, you know, expressed a little bit more out in the, in the region. Um, another area uh, that I find very important is for uh, capacity building um, and also just collaboration. Um, not until UNICEF came in uh, to support the government um, in focusing on child protection services as well as preparing schools for disasters. Um, you know, you don't realize the importance of getting that outside help and that knowledge sharing moment where you can have the support to build and strengthen your systems and then create better systems for the future. And so uh, I really want to point out that it's important for us to have further collaboration. The, the, the Caribbean is very strong together um, and we really care about one another, but I do know that we need to have more access to finance for climate funds. Uh, we need to really come together as one and support one another even further. And I'm hoping that I can see more opportunities um, of, you know, other parts of the world supporting the Caribbean um, and each other. You know, it, it's it's not just you know we take support, but it's also we all support one another. Um, as we foster more sustainable solutions going further. Growing up, we often hear youth described as the future, the hope of a nation, even a blessing. I've even seen some writers liken youth to the lifeblood of a nation. Following that train of thought, it only stands to reason that the Caribbean region should be full of hope and vigor, especially given the fact that it's one of the younger regions of the world. Unfortunately, that hope quickly becomes anxiety when one realizes that the region has a high level of brain drain. As a young person, I often wonder if the Caribbean will continue to be an environment that lacks opportunity for youth, an environment that appears to limit the potential of anyone that grows up here. The question many young people have on their hearts and minds is, do I have a future here? And while there isn't a simple solution to that problem, it's clear that the region needs to create more opportunities for young people, especially those in STEM fields. Many young professionals simply don't see themselves having a future here. We see fast developing or even developed industries in STEM fields overseas. We see attractive salaries too. In comparison, we see that many Caribbean countries have failed to develop a productive tech sector or make major advancements in STEM fields. Additionally, the world is moving to a freelance and gig economy. E-commerce has taken center stage. Unfortunately, for much of the region, e-commerce is notoriously difficult. Sometimes it's a lack of infrastructure, as many international payment platforms are unavailable in the Caribbean. And the local alternatives are either non-existent or they lack the adoption, functionality, or the legal framework to support their use. Local information and telecommunications infrastructure in some countries already limits the practicality and penetration of many digital payment platforms. Young entrepreneurs who wish to succeed in the digital space are also met with big bank fees and red tape, which prevents many of their ideas from ever taking off. This is exacerbated by the lack of regional economic cooperation. And just like we hear with youth, we always hear about the great potential in building ties and economic relations within the region. However, actionable policy continues to be lost at sea, and political will appears to be on vacation at the beach. As a young person, I find it incredibly ironic that a Caribbean region described as a leader in global finance has such an anachronistic financial sector. Finally. Beyond the issues that I've already mentioned is one that many would put at the top of the list, and that is mental health. We can see that most mental health patients in the Caribbean don't receive adequate treatment or counseling. And poverty, unemployment, instability and discrimination are issues that many young people across the region face. Sadly, these issues are some of the leading risk factors for depression. Few speak up for fear of being labeled crazy. And for many persons, there's a tendency to assume that someone suffering from a mental health issue 
is a violent threat. And while people continue to suffer in silence, the number of people with mental disorders in the Caribbean is projected to increase in the future. If nothing changes, most of these people will also have limited access to mental health care. Many of these sufferers are young people. They won't be able to live full and creative lives if the current situation persists. Policymakers need to recognize mental health as a priority, a matter for study and urgent action. These are some of the anxieties that I have for the future. My only hope is that the young people of today can enjoy a region where they have the room and opportunity to truly be the lifeblood and vigor of the Caribbean region. And you just heard from Janelle Clark, uh, Marika Duki, and of course, Omari Joseph. And I think one thing is definitely consistent uh, from what we've heard from the young people is that we need a lot more opportunities. We have to address gender inequality, especially where COVID is concerned and how women are affected as a result of the pandemic. And of course, sustainable development through education. But I think the, the theme through all of this is how does the Caribbean move forward as a block? And where are the opportunities? Where do they come from? How do we address the political will? Or as Omari spoke about, you know, where's the, action, the actionable policy? So gentlemen, I think we have a lot to talk about this morning. So let's just see if we can address a little bit, you know, what the young people brought to the fore. Let's start with Janelle. Janelle was talking about how, you know, the pandemic has affected women more than men. And, you know, we need to invest in gender equality. What are some of the changes you think we have to make right now so that we can address this right across the region? Because we have seen it. We have seen that a lot of places that are closed, that are restricted. We have a lot of women in these sectors. So what can we do to treat with that immediately? I saw John put his hand up. Okay, I'm being very polite. First. <laughs> be very polite, <laughs> but this is a really big issue, and I'm glad that um, Janelle brought this matter up because um, it's something that I've been talking about with others uh, in the UN and heard from more than 200 governments. It is one of the sustainable development goals. That is um, sustainable development goal number five is gender equality. So this is a big issue uh, globally. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that was mentioned was, you know, related to how to promote equality for women, for example, in business. Um, because yeah. the, the United Nations statistics indicate that a, a woman, um, compared to a man, a woman receives about 70 to 90 cents compared to a man getting a dollar. And this is really Im improper and needs to be changed. The disadvantage simply because of gender, not because of skills. <coughs> Um, and there, there is, you know, we have to encourage also a safe environment for reporting discriminatory, discriminatory se sexual harassment and so forth. So in each business, and I don't know, Anthony could address this, um, encourage committees empowered to in investigate such complaints. Okay. Uh, and other, you know, issues that need to be um, done, provide comprehensive training to all employees to indicate about, you know, they can't make comments that put you down because you're female and so forth. Um, you know, bias re related. And uh, to be in fair in employee recruitment, um, because there are studies that have been done that indicate that um, including women in management um, increases 2.5% increase in innovation revenue by 1%. This was from the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, and also when you're hiring people, for example, you want to have a, a lorry driver and you, you can't say women need not apply because you want a man. All of that is improper. And these are some of the changes that need to be made. So I will, I will stop at that, uh, you know, uh, going forward. It's a practical measure. Well, Anthony, you... Anthony, you run one of the largest conglomerates across the region, so I'm sure you've had plenty of experience treating with women, but as we're talking about in the pandemic and the gender inequality, how do we get that gender inclusivity, especially now, right now, where we're seeing more women displaced by the pandemic in the workplace than men? 
Look, I, I could only comment from my vantage point of our organization. And um, we have a cadre of very powerful women across the entire strata of the organization. Um, from strong women who work on production lines, and um, you know who you are, and also leaders who are at the highest level of the organization. I mean, our C-suite has two women um, as senior leaders of the Ansem Macau group. And uh, you know, even within the, the, the core corporate leadership team, I would say there's far more women that work in here than, than men. So this organization has, at, and amongst its leadership team, many women, and that, that comes from sort of employment practices and empowerment practices. I'm also proud to, to acknowledge that as, a, as an organization, we ensure that the right sort of workplace discipline and policies get, uh, get put in place and uh, our, our leadership, um, we have a, a female actually who's our head of HR director head, and she's driven a lot of these policies and it's been supported by our board and, and senior management to protect women in the workplace. And um, so it's, it's, something that, it's something that within our purview, we do what it is that we can do across our jurisdictions. It's something we don't, we don't play with. But it's also something we recognize that it brings that level of productivity that John is referring to. Um, but I think it goes beyond that. I think, I think we have a, a grassroots challenge across the region where, you know, women, women struggle by sort of the nature of our, of our culture. And I was very proud to see very recently, you know, Brand Stag, which is, you know, some of you may or may not know is, is the man's bear. And the man's bear taking a very bold and powerful position, which, look, has been celebrated. It's controversial, but uh, against uh, female you know, violence, gender-based violence and violence towards women. And uh, quite proud of the team. You know, they stepped out of their crease. It's not something that, you know, a bear brand would traditionally do. But the conversation is a, is a real and much-needed one. So I encourage others to, to take it on. You know, when, when there's a need, you got to step up and do, do what it is that you, you need to do. And Justin, what are your thoughts? As I said, what can we do at this point to get that gender inclusivity, especially post-COVID recovery, so that women aren't as affected or disproportionately affected by the pandemic and the effects of it? Thanks. Thanks, Natalie. I mean, I, I just want to say one thing before I get into how we deal with gender equality, but we have to remember that COVID-19 was also very much a medical emergency. And when you look at deaths from COVID, generally it has impacted men more than women. So I think we need to, we need to also bring that balance to the conversation as well. More men have died of COVID than of women. The issue that, that Janelle has raised is an issue that has been happening within society even beyond, beyond COVID-19. Um, it's been happening way before. And it's something that we need to deal with with greater urgency. Um, I think that in the Caribbean, and I think recently, I, I, I used to work at the Caribbean Development Bank up to a year ago, and I've heard a lot of very good articulation, very, very lovely plans about what we need to do to ensure that there's gender equality. But Natalie, the problem that we have in the region is that we talk a good talk. We talk a good talk, but we just cannot improve. And, 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 and the issue here for me is that I am tired of hearing of talk. <laughs> I want to see implementation. Yeah. What do we need to do to ensure that women are mainstreamed into every decision that we are making? We, we, we are at that point in time that every decision that our government makes, we need to be looking at that through a gender lens. So what does that mean? Okay, if I if a simple thing, if I am building a road in a in a in a in a community, can I ensure that that road is also safe enough so that women feel safe to walk along that road? So I'm not just putting up a road. I have to ensure that I'm putting up a mm. road with proper sidewalks, with proper with proper street lighting. I have to think it through properly. And I think what the, the issue here is that we talk it, but we're not thinking it through properly. These are the things that have to happen. On with respect to women earning less in the workplace, a lot of that is down to inadequate um, childcare. When a woman becomes a mother, many times a lot of that childcare responsibility falls on her. And so what happens is that 
she can't work as many hours in the office, for example, as a man could. And so that, that impacts things like the ability to move up in the organization. So there are, there are things like this as a society we also have to look at and deal with. Can we help our women by providing um, reasonable and affordable childcare so that they can have the same level of opportunities that men have? But Natalie, I just want to say to, me, to and you. Justin, I'm happy you raised that point because I think especially since COVID, we've seen where, you know, when, when workers were asked to come back out to work on their proper rotation, their time, and the children being at home for homeschooling, we ended up with a crisis on our hands because parents just didn't know what to do with daycares closed. You know, you have to be out at work. The children being, you know, having school online, we just ended up with a real crisis on our hands because parents now had to determine how to balance being a parent and being able to be in that breadwinner or that earner, you know? And so it, I don't think we've even worked that out as yet. We are having problems, you know? So, and you spoke about men, you know, being, you know, disproportionately affected by COVID through death as, you know, and it brought me to the point that even uh, Omari and Marika raised about mental health. And how do we treat with mental health across the region? How do we address this? And we've been talking about lockdown fatigue. We've been talking about, you know, how people are coping with being in the pandemic, not being able to socialize as much as you'd normally do, not being able to spend time with your family and friends and just how do we cope? So let's just touch a bit on this mental health and what we can do to ensure that if somebody needs that kind of help, they don't feel as if, okay, it's, it's wrong for me to ask for it, that they don't feel stigmatized or discriminated to say, listen, this thing is affecting me, you know, and I really need some help right now. And it's something that somehow at, right across the Caribbean region, we seem ashamed to talk about the, felt, the fact that we suffer from mental health. Maybe if I, if I kick off on this here, Natalie, I think it's a really great um, topic, you know, when you think about the amount of natural disasters that Caribbean countries have suffered, I mean, I I live in Barbados now. I'm I'm a, I'm a Trinidadian, but I, I live I live in Barbados. And two week two weekends ago, I experienced a volcanic ash fall from from La Soufre in in Saint Vincent, and I can tell you, Natalie, that that had a tremendous impact on me. I mean, I I, I was not prepared. I don't think anybody in Barbados was quite prepared for what we yeah. saw, and it had this this real impact. So we have a lot of and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm fairly resilient. I can get through this. But think about people who have gone through trauma after trauma after trauma. We have a lot of psychosocial um, people who have, been, who have been damaged by this, and we're not doing enough. And, and what I have found, Natalie, is that sometimes I would, I would create WhatsApp groups. And sometimes I'm just asking people, how, how, are, how, are, how are you doing? And, and people then write back to me individually and say, you know, I'm so happy that you reached out. This is impacting me far more than I ever, ever thought it would. And so yeah. I realized that we need to have that sort of ability to have that conversation. And people want to have the conversation, but they're just afraid to have it in the open. And why is that? I think. But what do we do, though? Because we, we know the issue. We know that we have these natural disasters, whether it's hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. It may just even be tropical storms, but we have these things that we constantly have to address and have to face. But as the Caribbean, what can we do even through CARICOM to say, okay, let us deal with mental health? Because obviously we have enough on our plates, whether it's unemployment, poverty, natural disasters. We have enough on our plates to get us to that point where we need that kind of psychological support. But as a block, what can we do and how do we do it? And everybody, feel free to jump in. I yeah, mean, this is an open think, discussion. Yeah, I, I think campaigns of destigmatization is, uh, is one approach. Um, this is not an area that is my field or expertise or one that I could comment on um, completely. But uh, creating space and ensuring that, you know, people are accommodating, you check in with, with those under and within your care and do so periodically is, uh, is important. And also publicly and, and, and directionally providing that support. So, so in our group, um, we provide 
uh, an employee assistance program where anyone could, uh, for free, anything that they need to confidentially, no one's checking, no report comes to me, no report comes to anyone, but you have this facility. If you need to talk to someone, it's, it's available for you to talk to. This is not whistleblowing stuff. This is just to help you talk through what it is that you need. Now, is that something, and I'm, I don't want to be sort of um, maybe shaking it up a little bit, but maybe that's, what, maybe that's what it calls for. Is it that as an organization, and you start to put uh, you know, policies across the region that all organizations at a certain size and scale need to make this thing available? Or is it that governments yeah. provide this thing to its public sector and say, hey, look, have a call. I mean, I remember, you know, in school, there were suicide hotlines and in the, in the, at the time, I think it was Telco or, or TSTT um, phone, bo- uh, phone box. You had your phone card and those things would have been free. So you didn't need to top up your card to do it. Um, are there ways that maybe the telecoms could provide this? And then, you know, their call centers where, you know, social workers who are trained in this regard, because I hear what you're saying, you know, um, you know, Dr. Well, Justin, we could, you know, we could provide that support amongst ourselves to who we know and who we care for. But sometimes this thing needs a, a learned mind that could extract what needs to be, you know, proficiently extracted and be able to direct and, and treat accordingly. But, you know, but, we're but dealing Nicola, with... Um, Anthony... I think that's yeah. part of the problem, though, is that over the years, we've seen organizations do what they can. But there isn't this holistic approach to it. It's not something that's right across the board. So you'll find one organization where those members can get help. But you step move from that organization to another, and there's just absolutely nothing in place, which is why I'm talking about CARICOM, how from a policy position, from a, an integrated position, what is it that we need to put on the table so that we can ensure that regardless of what island you're from, regardless of what organization you're a part of, you can get that psychosocial help, that psychological help, because mental illness is real, and a lot of us at different levels suffer from it. Yeah, look, Natalie, I want to say this. I think, uh, and and. I think at some point in this conversation, I would like to, you know, we could explore the conversation of the functioning or the dysfunctioning of, of CARICOM and, and its structures. And I think that's a, 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 a real issue that, uh, that, could be, that could be debated, you know. Um, but I think there's another issue here, and, and we're dealing with sort of the symptoms and how we treat the symptoms. But I think we need to come down to the, the cause. And, and I hold a sort of a broad view a deep part of the challenge in the region is the degradation and almost disappearance in many places of the institution of family. Because your family is where you go to for the love and care, and it's where there's a dysfunction or a destruction of that fabric is where I think these mental issues sort of occur. Yeah, look, we, are, we live in a world of hyper-anxiety. I, I mean, I wonder if our ancestors dealt with, I guess they dealt with something different, war and um, you know, saber two tigers chasing them and whatnot. But we've been dealing with all sorts of forms of natural disasters and it just keeps coming at you and then pandemics and we inventing all kinds yeah. of new things to, to freak ourselves out, you know. Um, but it's that fabric of family and, and the coming together of family. And, I'm, and in many places, this pandemic has reinstituted family, reinstituted a, a deep level of faith because those things that you were relying on, all of a sudden, that, that world that you, you sort of illusionary world that we create around ourselves doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And for some, that create a huge fracas and a, a volcano in and of itself. And for others, it recentered. So, and, and it's the institution of family, I think, that could wrap its, wrap its arms around, around that. Um, yeah. You know. can I, can and I think that institute, I, I believe, yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, it's John just spoke. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Pa, pa, you know, there, there, are some, some countries have solved this problem, um, particularly in the Scandinavian countries, in which they have instituted, you know, and follow up on on policies and laws and stuff like this, making certain things mandatory. Um, so the the problem is when people do the wrong thing, there are no consequences. Okay, we could talk about this in a lovely academic way, but if there are no consequences, everybody could do what they want. That's an overriding problem that we have where we, we, we create a policy 
So CARICOM has a policy, you know, some countries have laws and they don't enforce the laws. Um, people don't even enforce their own policy. Okay? All they take yeah. off in the box is that we have a policy and we have a law, but they don't enforce it. So it doesn't bring about the transformative change. I think Justin has alluded to that as well. The action to, to change things, the way that things, things are done and to change people's behavior. Um, so, yeah, so, we're talking, I, I, so we're talking about no consequences, lack of proper family structures, and also probably bad leadership. Ba and bad, bad leadership is a critical issue. Um, there are some deep cultural issues across the Caribbean, I'm afraid, with regard to this matter. Uh, you know, um, about being in charge and the rest of you should shut up. Okay, we in charge and we could do whatever it is we want. That's part of the, 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 the culture that came out of the colonial yeah. era, uh, in fact. And the surprise is that when your own people do that to their own people, they haven't learned anything, really and truly. So, but so isn't it ironic, though, that the same thing, isn't it ironic that the same thing that we complain about, about, you know, slave masters and master days and what master want to do, is that it's the same things we implement. We have the same kind of mentality and we approach things that way. Yes, ex that's exactly the underlying problem, the deep underlying problem. Okay. Um, and, and that is part of what has seeped into politics. The kind of, I am in charge and I could do whatever I want. And I can enhance me, me and my own and stuff and my party members and, and my, my own little clan and everybody else gets nothing. Um, so that is part of what we need to be very um, insistent on changing. Um, in the modern era, of course, there are new tools. That's the media. And, and, and you, you know, you, you, you can go on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, and you could reach people. Um, this, this is part of the, the, you know, the new game of people showing advocacy. Um, the issue we spoke about before with regard to gender equality and stuff, don't keep, don't keep quiet, you know. You, you, have, you have to shout. Uh, you know, and insist and so yeah. forth that, that there's equality uh, and stuff. If you keep quiet... But you know then, what? Yeah. You know what, John? While I hear your point on, you know, new media and the role that it can play is that new media has also taken us down, in my mind, a dark, deep path because now you have more people with propaganda, misinformation, false information, and all of it, all of that is in front of you. And now you have to decipher between what's real and what's false. And a lot of people don't take the time to do that. You know, we have this idea of just running with it, just run. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that's, that's part of the, um, the new, new problem. And of course, now that we're in COVID-19, it's gotten worse because everybody's communicating online, okay? Not, not face to face, yeah. right? So it's gotten it's worse. And those who know how to exploit that are uh, using that as one of their new tools. But anyway, uh, my main point is really and truly, we have to go to action and uh, enforce policies and enforce laws and stuff. Not leave it is that you could do it if you want, because that is really not yeah. what's not working. In fact, enforcement. All right, All right. gentlemen, let us talk about that. Let us talk about that, because right across the Caribbean region, in my mind, we do have a lot of laws. We have a lot of policies. We tried the whole CARICOM, the CSME. We do put things in place. But somehow, somehow, regardless of what we've put on paper, as you said, we don't follow through. The enforcement is not necessarily there. And consequences seem to be absent, just non-existent. So maybe the conversation has to be about how do we get there? How do we move from putting something on paper to actually having it implemented and to know that if it isn't, there are consequences to our actions? Natalie, I'll say something on this here. One of the, I think the major challenge that we have now in the Caribbean is that we need to think about a new social contract between the people and government. I think personally mm -hmm. that governments governments have become much too bloated and I think are, are, are simply out of control. And, and, and the reason for that is that we have a bias in our minds, and this is not only in the Caribbean, but across, across the world, that we think to deal with any problem means that we must add on to it. 
we already know that our governments are not working for us and not doing things. But the solution always seems to be, let's, let's, let's form another department to deal with that, when it absolutely does not work. What I think we really do need now is a proper partnership between private sector and the public sector. That is how we're going to get things done. There are things that the private sector, they know how to implement. When so, for example, let's, let's, let's think about what has happened at the CARICOM level with respect to the um, implementation of the Caribbean single market and economy. Decisions are taken yeah. by heads of government. Often, more, more often than not, the people don't even know what those decisions are. We, 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 are, we, are, we are not informed. So first of all, we need to deal with communication at a, at, at a much better level. But when those decisions are taken, we have found that governments are unable to implement them at the national level. Why is that? Because we simply don't know how to implement well. What we need to do is to say, well, why not form a partnership with the chambers of commerce within the various countries and let us work together on implementing this so that we get the good private sector notion of implementation alongside the public sector working on this. So I'm saying here, Natalie, we have to completely change our social contract with governments. I think we need, we need, we need, we need less rather than more, and we need our governments to work more efficiently with the private sector to help us move along, yeah. because we can't continue along the and path that we have been going along. I'll start with Anthony on this because we saw recently right here in Trinidad and Tobago where this whole idea of public-private partnership for vaccines, which are so critical at this time, didn't seem to work or, or there was so much noise around it that at this point I don't even know if the population knows how that partnership is going. But it brings me to the point that we, we talk about year after year after year, especially in last year's budget presentation, about the ease of doing business, the ease for the private sector to be able to help for the government to, to, to put that enabling environment in place so that the private sector can do what it needs to do. And we hear all the time in Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica is a lot better when it comes on to the ease of doing business. But, you know, we hear that, you know, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to get an idea out, to put things into place. So, Anthony, talk to us about that. How do we how do we fix this ease of doing business, even though we heard from the Minister of Finance in his budget presentation that they're trying to digitize the economy, they're trying to do certain things so that, you know, things can work out better. But between October to now, has there been any change whatsoever? With respect to from October till now, sorry, Natalie, I didn't catch that. Has there been any change with respect to what no, I was just asking. I was just saying that no, I was just saying that we speak a lot about since we're here talking and, you know, Justin raised the point that we need a new social contract between the people and government. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at public private partnerships to get things going and, you know, be able right. to communicate effectively what we're doing. I think those are the three salient points that he raised. But I'm saying, you know, in October, we heard the government address that through its budget presentation that the ease of doing business, they're trying to Sorry, that all trying to digitize the economy, put things in place so that, you know, it's so easy to make payments online, which was one of the things that Omari Joseph mentioned that, you know, that digital footprint is just not there for you to capture certain things and do certain things. So I'm asking you, between October to now, this idea of the ease of doing business so that we can have the government uh, provides the enabling environment, the private sector can come in and do what it needs to do. Have we had any change between October to now? But well, allow me to take the question maybe in a in a different in a different angle, uh, Natalie, because I think what Please. what Justin has raised is so is so critical and so important, and and there's some stuff I I want to share. You know, I had the distinct privilege of attending a Caricom heads of government meeting um, on the invitation of of Caricom, um, but for and on behalf of the to be formed and now formed. Caribbean private sector organization. So the Caribbean okay. private sector organization is uh, Apex. I think I've frozen. Am I being heard or? Heard. I'm hearing you. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, the image, the image seems to have frozen. But um, the Caribbean private sector organization is sort of the Apex private sector organization, which will seek to align and filter and work alongside all of the other uh, private sector organizations in um, the screen has gone black, guys. As I'm seeing, Kin, Kin, 
All right. I think I'm seeing, I'm seeing it back up. Yeah, I'm hearing you. It's just that I, we, we all look through it. You. So, I'm hearing you, Anthony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can go ahead, right? Okay, let's keep going. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, proud to, you know, proud to share that um, the, uh, the CPSO actually has a seat at the CARICOM uh, table, uh, which is a huge, huge move and could only sort of all go well to the advancement of that uh, of that agenda and that collaborative, um, and I may be living in a you know in a fantasy world where that may or may not uh, materialize, but I think the the move is in the general right direction. What concerns me yeah. is the speed at which. I mean, when one considers what was the the the, the concept, the catalyst of forming um, Caricom and, and what they called it previously, and where it is today. Um, you know, regrettably, I think it, it's largely failed in that agenda. You know, we haven't really brought the, brought the, the islands together. Every, I mean, I, I think we've got, you know, too many currencies in, in this thing. Each currency, none of them trade against each other. Um, so we end, up at a, we end up at a very sort of challenging thing. And, and what I was present to in attending that CARICOM meeting was that there's 15 member states. There was a room with a lot, a lot of people in it. And as a result, I think it's very difficult to, um, to get anything done. And, um, you know, so they face a challenge in and of themselves. And as a region trying to, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, um, trying to garner the, the, the brightest and the best of uh, 15 leaders and then sub, sub leaders for each of those institutions, you know, you're looking for a lot, a lot of talent. And this is not a lot, a lot of people in this region. So in and of that regard, you know, we, we, we set ourselves up for a, for a deep challenge. So I think it's within that that CARICOM struggles to, to function. And um, each of these leaders have their own agendas at play. And, and as such, they're filtering down and they're filtering through. It takes time because, yeah, I mean, they gather and they talk as one but they're not really held together by one, you know. Uh, Jamaica has its own yeah. dollar. Barbados have its own dollar. You know, Trinidad have its own dollar. The EC, Eastern Caribbean, um, have their own dollar. And that functions great because no one man or one entity could touch it. You know, you've got, you've got to talk to 10 people and, and, and it, it, there's a level of stability around it. Um, but look, look at that. EC was able to do it. So why can't we mimic it right across CARICOM, 15 member states? And I mean, maybe, maybe we always talk about the United States, but maybe that's a good model where we can see, you know, you have the different states well, and you have the it, federal government. So is that it a good, each person is but is it a good model? Does the US function and function well as a as a federation? Does the the European Union, they've all struggled with it. They all continue to struggle with it. Um but when you compare yeah. what we have yeah. to what they have, we haven't made any moves. It's one thing to struggle, but it's one thing not to get off the ground. Yeah. It's disappointing. The, the inertia is certainly, <laughs> um, certainly disappointing, but we are dealing with, um, we're dealing with a generational change, I would think. And, um, you know, bringing in that new leadership and that new leadership in the region emerging and emerging at a time where there is digitization and in digitization, the democratization of, of money, you know, and, and, and when you look at sort of the cryptographic and the blockchain technology and what that's going to be able to, to bring. And in fact, as a region, given our small footprint, um, you know, there are ways that you could juxtapose where you're at now and find ways to sort of integrate it in a particular way. But the political will to sort of relinquish it it's, it's power and control, I think, um, is not something that, um, you know, it's not something that I think would, um, would be our, but sim simple things like, look, one stock exchange with one set of rules, you know, it's not difficult. It's not impossible. It's just, you know, it, it just requires the will to, to get it done. And I think people will get it done. Someone will come with the technology. They, do. they just got to navigate the nuances of all these particular sort of archaic structures and archaic laws. But if we as a region actually and genuinely empower CARICOM to do what it needs to do, what it's set up to do, this thing happens in a far more rapid manner. It's just that the leaders that are entrusted with 
being present at there, they, they themselves have to figure out well, how do I navigate, you know, 15 people have to yeah. agree on everything. And and at some point they need to surrender. Okay, look, this 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 component of my power needs to be set, surrendered or delegated in a in a faithful manner. And they need to they, they need to be a level of confidence and faith in order for that to, to happen. And well, gentlemen, if, I mean, let us talk about that. Let's Let's talk about this leadership that is so critical and needed right across the Caribbean so that CARICOM can work, so that we can, we can organize as a block and get things done as a region. But how do we get there? Because as you said, you know, John spoke about, you know, the fact that we have this Mercedes mentality where we're still kind of implementing that kind of colonial aspect of things. You know, just in talking about wanting that new social contract between the people and heads of government, because we don't see, we have a kind of thing that it's about us as compared to it's about the people. And then you're here talking to us about that leadership where people have to be able to give and to, to kind of put themselves on the back burner so that the block can move as a region. But, you know, you, you also talk, Anthony, about how long CARICOM has been around and the time that is taking us to implement things. So what's going to change? Because in my mind, we've always had transformational leaders. We've always had transitional leaders, but somehow haven't been able to get that, to see a CARICOM where we can operate and move forward. Let me ask this question, right? You know, this was something that was very interesting for me, coming out of the Caribbean and having made an investment in North America in Cape Canaveral, which is where you know SpaceX launched all the rockets and whatnot from. One of the largest cruise ship terminals in the United States, where all these large cruise ships actually come down to our region, people actually get on there. And we hosted an event and invited various members of the municipality and the, 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 chief, of, the chief of fire and all these people attended. And the, the guy who looks after the port there, was in the, the tap room and having a beer and I was chatting to this guy and he said something to me that just blew my mind. Um, he said that he was an elected executive. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, look, because the port is so important to Cape Canaveral, the people of this municipality town, I don't know what they call it, they actually elect who looks after it. Let's ask ourselves, you know, a very broad question. Yes, we elected, um, you know, Mia Motley, the, the, sorry, the Barbadians elected Mia Motley, the Trinidadians elected Keith Rowley, the Jamaicans um, wholeness, and we could go on and on and on. But no one elected anyone at the CARICOM level. Have any of these people faced uh, and had to sell us as a region on, look, this is what, choose me, and this is the leadership that, that I will bring. Where is that, you know, where is that possibility? You know, I am, I'm, I'm humbled by, and, and, and also, prayerful because I understand that I'm actually on this talk today because the head of CARICOM, who unfortunately still can't get a positive result, and I know how challenging this is. We've had a, an executive, the executive who runs our U.S. business. I think it took him two months to get a, a negative um, COVID test. He could come back to the office. So very prayerful, but let's not lose sight of the fact that the head of CARICOM is down with COVID. Right, And as a region, we still can't seem to come together and coordinate to get economies of scale and get the buying power to buy enough vaccines to rid ourselves of this um, situation, to be able to you know, bring back in tourism. I mean, imagine, I know people are going to jump out of their skin if they can't get Carnival 2022. I mean, you know, people just lose their mind. They're going to go bananas. We need to solve this and we need to solve it fast. So, yeah. So it's, it comes down to leadership again. But that's an interesting point you raised, that we don't elect, you know, who the head of CARICOM is going to be and the executive, but that we select them. So, gentlemen, John, Justin, do you think it's time for that process? And do you think it can be that catalyst that we need to get CARICOM to start moving forward? Can I just make a comment on this? Because um, you remember there was an attempt many decades ago to have a Caribbean federation. And that didn't work, uh, in fact. So that is part of the reason why we're still operating in silos, everybody doing what's best for them and not working together as a group. That's one of the key underlying uh, issues. 
how to change that and essentially to get everybody to work together in the best interest of the region. Uh, and also um, the problems that CARICOM itself has in trying to make that happen. Um, um, as Justin indicated, talk, talk, talk. What about the action is the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. And part of what we need to discuss is how to change that, how to bring about the transformative change required for action, because we have to change our thinking. Um, our thinking, as we indicated earlier, is still sounds colonial of everybody acting on their own behalf and not working together as a group. And as was, as was discussed earlier about the private sector, the public and the government working together in the best interest of the country as a whole seems to be an underlying issue that has come out of the, the culture in the region of, as you indicated earlier, when there was a massa, you do, Masa used to tell you, you don't do any thinking, okay? I will make all the decisions. And we still seem to have that embedded and really need to change this. And so the advocacy of the public and the private sector is quite critical in, in changing that. And maybe we need to discuss some practical measures of how to make this happen, uh, in, in fact. So I'll hand over to maybe Justin what thinks yeah, wants to just, make a comment. Justin? Well, yeah, well, well, Natalie, I will come back to the point and, I, and, I, and I'll say it and just to reemphasize what John just said. I think we just need to have this new contract between leadership, government, and the people. We need to make it very clear what government is supposed to be doing and what government isn't supposed to be doing. And then, and then, I, and then I want to make this point around and, and coming back to, to Anthony's. Do you know that I think within the next month, there's supposed to be an election for a new Secretary General of, of, of CARICOM? I don't think many people around the, the, around the region know this. This are aware of that. This information who, should be who made. Votes, who votes for that position? The, 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 the heads of government I, select? Yes, the heads of government. Have, so it's, so an appointed, it's an appointed position. It's an appointed position. And so governments have the right to put forward a candidate. But I think Anthony makes a great point here that that shouldn't be the way that, 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 that it works. It's, it's too important a role for us to be unappointed. It should be something that maybe is, 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 is elected, elected. So, that, so that we can have a certain level of accountability every few years when that person has to come around and tell us what have they achieved or what have they not achieved, for example. That would also mean that when the heads of government meet, that person also has skin in the game to make sure that things happen so that that person isn't just a, a pencil pusher, for example, saying, okay, the heads have taken this decision, I'll send out this communique, Whoever reads it, it really doesn't matter to me because I'll still get my salary at the end of the month. That has to stop. Right. And, I, and, so it, it comes and that's back why when that we point, have these... The governance needs yeah. to change within, within, within the region. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we have even these CARICOM heads of government meeting, they put out what they want. So sometimes even things that you're interested in, you just miss. And not only that, as you said, some who, which one of you raised the idea of consequences i mean it's implemented it's not implemented doesn't seem to matter because each country is doing its own thing but gentlemen let us talk a little bit about this idea of sustainable development climate change because we're seeing here in the caribbean where things are definitely changing i think it was grenada puerto rico cuba um recorded last year some of the highest temperatures that they ever did you know we're seeing the sea levels rising, we, we see the amount of tropical storms and, and hurricanes that we've been experiencing. And all of these are things that affect us as a region, not just as individual countries, as a region, and how do we address them? So let's just talk a little bit about that. This whole idea of sustainable development, what it really means, because it's a, it's a terminology that we use all the time, all the time. What it really means? What does it really mean, gentlemen? Can, can I just start off on this? Um, because this has been a big issue in which I have been questioned by, you know, all of the governments and stuff, but virtually. <laughs> um, so I have some idea of, of you know, what, what their issues are. So um, I, I'm, just I'm just going to just give you a little bit of a, of a prelude that... Um, when, when the, in 2015, I think it was, that the sustainable development goals were debated in the UN, people said 17 sustainable development goals is too much. 
it should be reduced to five or six. We can't do all of that. And after they argued between all the various countries, they decided 17 sustainable development goals was the world that they wanted. Starting from no poverty, number one, going up to partnerships, number 17, including things like gender equality and some of the issues that others um, of the young people brought up, like Marika Duki brought up um, the issues of yeah. climate action and life below water and life on land, SDG 13, 14, and 15. And Omari Joseph also brought up the matter of the brain drain and having a future and so forth. So one of the SDGs was decent work and economic growth. Uh, you know, forming, forming, falling within what he was worried about and the mental health issues associated with that. Um, so, um, as I said, they argue this and they decided that this is the world that they want. Okay. Um, the question is, you know, that's lovely paperwork. Okay. How to make it happen? Because it requires transformative action. Because all of the things we have discussed so far about politics and who is in charge and ignoring the public and the private sector and so forth are the underlying issues that make it difficult for that to happen. So we have to change the way that, um, that, that we think. And the, the, the transformative change can be brought about by focusing on certain leverage points, um, you know, and the future trajectories. The way people think is based on previous experience, the past, they learn certain things and based on their projections of what might happen in the future, they, they make sacrifices now for things that could happen in the future. That's how people normally um, think. So one of the things yeah. that brought up earlier is trying to have an alternative vision. Some of those key points were, were actually made aware of people collaborating together, um, you know, is one of the things um, as the, the public private sector partnership uh, and having alternative visions of a good life. Um, because most of what people think at the moment is a good life is dependent on having money. Okay, maybe a good life is dependent on spending more time with family and friends. Okay, to think a little and, bit and differently. John, as, as you speak about that, from where I am sitting, I don't see, I honestly haven't seen you know, the Caribbean, even through individual countries or as CARICOM, really spend any significant amount of time addressing this because, and you could just take something as simple as, okay, so we have a COVID-19 pandemic now, and I am not seeing anything being put forward to say, okay, we're dealing with this now. We're seeing the effects of it. We've seen the, the, the drain on people and their mental health, on their, their money, on the economy. You know, what are we going to do if we have something similar five, 10 years from now? And I'm not even seeing that conversation anywhere. And I think in my mind, that's what sustainable development is about. It's seeing where you are now and trying to prepare for down the road. That's, Whatever that's, the sphere may be, exactly, whether it's the economy, yeah, whether it's exactly. the environment, whether it's human resource. Yes, that's exactly the point. So there are 17 sustainable development goals, quite a lot. And there has to be some trade-offs between them. They're not individual sustainable development goals. It's a group. And consequently, uh, you know, you, you, you have to balance them off. And there might be some trade-offs where one pursuing one sustainable development goal might be at the expense of another and so forth. So the trade-offs is what yeah. is supposed to bring everybody together to think through this and to decide on how they're going to balance these, these things off. But that kind of depth of thinking does not seem to be going on in the region. And COVID-19 has made it worse, in fact. Um, you know, and you thought it would have been a catalyst for change. You thought people would well, have said, I listen, think, yes, look I at think, where we are and what we have to do. Yes, I think it is an opportunity. Given COVID-19, here is the opportunity during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's a time-limited opportunity to restart along a transformative pathway. All of the things we've been talking about are not happening and so forth. We learned something out of, of COVID-19. This is not the first pandemic, okay? You, you know that there was Spanish flu in the 1918s or something and people were wearing masks and stuff like this. So it's not the first time that this has, this has happened. Um, 
but it is an opportunity for us to rethink. Your life is short and there are so many things that you need to do to work together to advance the region and the countries and so forth in a collaborative and cooperative way as we keep bringing the same thing up over and over again. And here is the chance here is the chance now with COVID-19 to see if we could make this happen. Take it as an opportunity and turn it around. Turn around the thinking. I'll hand over to the other. All right, uh, Justin and Anthony, let's talk about the economic sustainable development because I think that sustainable development is that thing that you look at different areas of your existence. So let's talk about economic sustainable development across the Caribbean, where we are, and what we need to do. And I'll start with Justin, because you're part of the CDB. Uh, let's talk about, you know, what's in place, what are we even aware of, and where we need to go. Thanks, Natalie. Well, I, I used to be a part of the, C, of the CDB, not, not anymore. But, um, right. but the, the thing about it, with respect to, uh, about, about 10 years ago, I used to work in consultancy, advising oil and gas and mining companies around the world. And I had the unenviable task of trying to advise them around climate change and the economics of that. And back then, I simply used to go into them and say, do you know that much of, your stranded, or not much of your assets are going to be stranded? So a lot of this wealth that you think that you have, you're not going to be able to bring it out of the ground because we have to deal with climate change. So all this oil reserves that you have, you're never going to be able to uh, extract all of that. So, don't, so, so stop counting it on your balance sheet. I can, I can now flip that to the Caribbean and say, do my Caribbean brothers and sisters understand that much of the assets that they have on their coast are, pro are probably going to be stranded because of climate change? And so the tourism model that we have now, where, which, is, which is quite dependent on coastal tourism, if we're going to have sea level rise from climate change and so what's going to happen to many of those assets with hotels that are on the coast, for example, where... In Jamaica, I know some insurance companies have stopped even insuring some of those of, of those properties. But more importantly, what do I have to do in order to think long term? What are the building codes that are required to ensure that if I'm going to live in a vulnerable part of the world as a result of climate change, what are the things that I need to do now to prepare for any sort of event that happens? And so, Natalie, I think one of the major things we have to do here is to flip the conversation and start talk, speaking about what do I need to do to become resilient at the individual level, at the household level, at the community level, at the, at, at, at the organizational level, at the company level, and of course, at the national level. And let's work together. And to that takes us back that. to leadership. That takes us back to leadership because to, to, to address that and to get each person invested in his or her own future it means that we need people who can, you know, make us understand the importance, how critical this is for us to do. And that, it to me, is absent as well. And I, and, I, and I think if I just say one thing here before the others come in, it means that we have to reorient our education curriculum. We have to re reorient it towards our lived reality right now. What are the things that are important for us in the Caribbean? Well, we need to ensure that we have much more entrepreneurs coming into the, in, in, into, into the labor market. We don't necessarily want to have employees. We want people to start their businesses. But we also want people to be aware of the vulnerabilities that they have around them so that they can build that personal resilience as well. Like I mentioned to you two weeks ago when I, when I, when I suffered from the ash fall from the, from the volcano, I told myself my resilience comes from being prepared. I was not prepared for that. If I had known... I would have been prepared. And so the education curriculum has to constantly reinforce this, that you need to be prepared. This is, the, this is the neighborhood that we live in. We're vulnerable. And so we have to manage our vulnerabilities to turn those into resilience. And then, you know what, Natalie? Once we master that, we could start selling that to around the world. You know, we, could be, we could be the sellers of resilience to anywhere in the world because we know how to build resilience. And, and you so, know what? So I that, think we already do that. I, th I honestly think we already do that, just not in a systematic way, because honestly, I don't know anybody who is more resilient than us as a, as a Caribbean people. And those on the outside, it's one of the things they talk about us, they mention about us a lot, how resilient we are. But the thing is that it's not systematic, it's individual, you know, it's not as a country, it's not as a people it's individual, but and and because it's we're so good at it, it it gets outside. It translates into 
the Caribbean being resilient. So maybe if we just recognize what we have, you know, so that we can package it differently, that we can get buying from everybody instead of just at the individual level, we might get there. Anthony? Yeah, I would, um, you know, I would say this, you know, the, the 17 um, sustainability goals, I think to John's point, you can't just surrender one or two because you need that entire sort of ecosystem of stuff to be able to build that ultimate sustainable world. But not everybody can work on all 17 at the, at the same time. So th th there's a level of prioritization. When I look at some of our ESG work, I'm able to identify, okay, this one is five, this is seven, this is 12, this is whatnot. Um, and we're able to integrate it in there and, and tick it and tie it to, to what we are up to. You know, I, I woke up this morning and recognized that I had this, this chat and, and this conversation. I was quite quite intrigued by it because um, it, it's something that I think, uh, you know, how do we chart a way forward is, is what keeps me up at night. Um, you know, I took over leadership of our organization January 1st, um, 2020. And um, I was like, cool, this is, this is nice. You know, we could, we could settle in this thing. And then March hit and like we all got put in our in our washing machine and our dryer on, on nonstop cycle. And I think we've been we've been in there, we've been in there since. But I, this morning, the front page of the business guardian talks about growing bananas. Right? I think they, they, they said the country going to a banana republic. I mean they you know, making a, a, a making light of it, but mm -hmm. talking about, you know, creating an agro economy. But we cannot lose, and this is a sustainability conversation. I think look, sustainability as technology being prepared for all the various climatic conditions. You know, in St. Kitts, they're talking about taking all the electricity lines and putting them underground so that when these hurricanes pass through, like in Florida or what have you, look, they just sweep the street and wash the yard or whatever, and they back up and run the next day. Um, in the Caribbean, we take a we take a serious lash. But coming back to the to the banana point. We are net consumers of foreign exchange. All of our technology, right, is imported. The cars we drive, the computer that I'm talking to you on, our phones, um, everything, the machinery with which we produce, even the stuff that we manufacture, the machinery to manufacture that is all imported too. And we are at a fundamental and an unsustainable mismatch in foreign exchange um, needs and be able to trade and you know i i argued this and it was it was just funny i argued this with my international trade professor when i was studying um economics i said you know we're talking about balance of payments and i was learning about international trade i said but you know the amount of bananas i have to sell you to be able to buy a car have to trade a car with you i mean is a is a complete mismatch i mean i need a whole farm is going to take months to grow and and whatnot um to be but yeah. so when you look at it as a region, and we're under pressure by these um, international, because the, the offshore sector has been a, a pretty thriving area, and all the, the global watchdogs are looking at us in a region, and rightly or wrongly so, and saying, you, know, you can't do that. Uh, so our tourism is there, some of our exports. Uh, but how do we get to a point? Because to me, that's where the sustainability comes in. So we're not competitive you know, we, enough based on what we put out. So is it that we need to rethink our manufacturing sector, just the kind of things that we get in, involved in? I just think we need, we need a lot more of it. And in essentially, you know, you look, at, you look at a blockbuster movie, right? You could take local currency and produce a film and generate a Caribbean film. These films go on, they become blockbusters and whatnot, 300 million US on the opening night and all this kind of thing. I mean, so what's to stop us? You know, we have this vibe and this energy that is so attractive. Where is our film industry? You know, where's our music industry? How do we take those, those arts and turn it into more and more business? How do we create those entrepreneurs who can come in and, I don't know, create the next, the next mega app in, um, in the region and be able to drive and bring the, what is needed into the region? That is what I think we need to be retooling our education system to do. There are only so many engineers that we could 
that we could hire. There are only so many plants we're going to have. There are only so much road we're going to build. So how yeah. do we retool? And this is where I think the, 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 our education comes in. And it, it comes down to a So we need to look more plan. at the services sector. So we probably have to look more at look at all of it. All of it. I think we need to look at mm -hmm. all of it, Natalie, and we need to look at it within the context of sustainability. I mean, generationally, we got to look at where money is gone. You know, money is gone in yeah. um, you know heavy industrial stuff. You know, globally, it's gone into to arms and munitions and stuff that really you think you know. Okay, if we're talking about sustainability, do we need to be buying all of these bombs and planes and all this kind of stuff? How do we take capital? And, and in a disciplined global way, and we are part of that global village, deploy it in sustainable industries and sustainable projects that continue to, because it has to generate economy, it has to generate wealth. Wealth is what's going to keep the world ticking. Um, you know, people need jobs, people need income to be able to trade. What that looks like may evolve, but uh, I think that's what's, that, that for me is, is where we need to contextualize ourselves. I definitely take that point because you're right. If if I'm going to have to do bananas, for example, or even peppers, the amount I'm going to have to put out to compare to one film then, for example, you know, or even one, one phone, I am at a disadvantage so, already. Yeah. So well, we need it all. Yeah, we really we have need to. It. We need it all. Mm -hmm. We need it all. We need it all. Natalie, can Gentlemen, I we do say... have some questions. Go, go ahead, uh, Justin. I just, Sorry. I, I, also, I also want to say that how we prioritize our education budget has to be re-examined. So take, for example, the money that we're spending at tertiary level education. Much more of that money needs to be going into postgraduate and to research and development. Right now, we're spending a lot of money on, under, on undergraduate degrees. People can go in and get a degree, but a lot of that money needs to go more into R&D. So that John and his students can do what well, John, I'm, so I'm then, assuming you're still at you. Justin, let me ask you. <laughs> yes. Did this did this government it. make a wrong did this government make a wrong move then by cutting a gate, especially for postgraduate studies? Because that's the direction it has gone in. It has made cut to gates to made cuts to gate, and one of those cuts is for postgraduate studies. So was that a wrong move? I, I absolutely think that that was an incorrect move. It was a bit short sighted. I think that all, society, all economies that are on the cutting edge right now, you would look at them. You look at a percentage of GDP, how much they're spending on research and development. It's about maybe 3 to 5%, let's say. Our expenditure is, is way less than 1% on R&D. And that is throughout the Caribbean. That is insufficient if you want to have a cutting edge economy. And so a lot of R&D spend has to come from the public sector support. Then Anthony, with his firm, will, will start doing more as well. He would start to be able to use those ideas coming out of UE to now build new industry, for example, based on our lived reality. But John is the expert. Let's give John and his students the money to start building out our economy, giving us ideas. Not, not all of the ideas we will use, but a substantial proportion of them we will. And so I think that is the thing that we have to look at. How we reprioritize our education expenditure is going to be critical at this point in time. Gentlemen, we do have some questions from online and some comments. One, uh, Texas says, whether CARICOM countries could be better off together. I think I'm missing a part of that. Hold on. Um, all right. Let me just go to Jeanette says, don't sell bananas, sell sargassum, sell breadfruit, sell items that bring about sustainability. And Annalise oh. says, governments in the Caribbean are not supporting the arts. There isn't an infrastructure to sustain the arts sector in practical ways. What do you all say about that? Can I just respond to that? Because, listen, in the Caribbean, we have really clever people. Eh? Let me just take the example of the yeah. sargassum. Um, you know, there, there, there was a, 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 a challenge from IDB, okay, to come, for people to come up with ideas around the region. And one of those was um, from St. Lucia, in which somebody created um, making sargassum into fertilizer. Okay? And they employed 20 yeah. persons. So instead of sargassum being a problem on the beaches, they're collecting it. This is a resource that you can convert into something that you could sell. And they set this, they're sending and that it comes to India, to freely. Canada, all kind of thing, and they're employing 20 persons. There was a young man in his 20s, uh, in fact. In Barbados, they're turning sargassum into soap bars. 
cosmetics, which they're selling. In Trinidad and Tobago, some really clever students in the University of the West Indies have discovered how to create plastic out of sargassum. That's uh, uh, amazing as well, that you can create plastic out of sargassum. So we're not short of smart people in the region, uh, in fact. Um, and that's why I'm saying the resilience is at an individual level, but we don't have it collectively because you'd want to believe that when people come up with these ideas and are finding ways to get rid of something that could have harmed us, that the government would step in and create that an enabling environment for them so that they can have the kind of investment they need to do what they're supposed to. So that yes. the government itself will benefit because if, this, if the beaches are free of sargassum weed, then that's more more leeway for your tourism and for your tourists, you know, for your sector. Yes. Well, that's, that's exactly the problem. We haven't created the environment to support people who have innovative ideas. I happen to be the director of a center for innovation and entrepreneurship is what it's called, because we're trying to change the, the model. I'm trying to see if we could convince the government to put in the resources. Um, in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, they even had an economic development advisory board who suggested that you should divert the, 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 the income and so forth um, to supporting yeah. people who have ideas to turn into business and employ other persons and so forth, rather than looking for a job, because that's not working, especially in the current circumstances. But somehow or the other, that hasn't taken political traction um, in a situation where we are not short of part people who come up with clever ideas throughout the region who could be, can be turned into business and start a business and employ other persons and make money rather than sending out your CV to try and get a, a, a job in the, in the ministry, for example, which is not working, uh, in fact. So yeah. how do we create that environment? But, but John, you know what? The, the thing about it is that I think what you just raised brings me back to Justin's point about communication. Because there is a program, I think it is through NITCO, where you have mind in your own business, where they actually, the ministry, one of those ministries invest in young people who are starting out their business, they give them capital. But if people don't know that these things exist and they don't know how to access them, then it seems as if it's just not there. Yes, that, the communication issue, the, the media issue is one of, one of our problems, um, where I, I guess um, when you have a program like that, you have to involve people from the media who will know how to put things on Facebook, Instagram. You know, a lot of young people are on those social media and really you may not be reading the newspapers and stuff like this. So you have to use that whole range of communication, uh, methods of communication to, to, to get people to, you know, and in the current situation, maybe you should be able to fill in the form, form online. And not have to go in right. person and line Let's go up. To, yeah. Let's go to one more of our comments. And this one is from, is it from YouTube? It says, in digitization, uh, the democratization of money, when we look at the blockchain and crypto, and there are ways to integrate that now, um, did we not just talk about gender inequality? Second, I am not following Jeanette's comment. In digitization, the democratization of money, when we... I'm, I'm sorry, Jeanette, um, I'm not following it. There aren't complete sentences, so it's kind of throwing me off. But she says, and how economically women suffer, how will the digitization of money prevent harm or hinder that? Yeah. I, I, how will the, digiti the, digit the digitization of money prevent harm or hinder women economically from suffering economically? Well, Anyone? One, one thing I could say about when you digitalize currencies, so for example, if you're now dealing only in digital, digital transactions, it is a great way to reduce crime, let's say. So I can't speak specifically to gender. So if, for example, all transactions are done digitally, then you can trace those transactions throughout and you know who is doing what. So you could imagine then, Natalie, things like corruption would, would actually fall because now people can't be walking around with big bags of money and and and, yeah. and, and, and and paying off persons for example so that's one thing um with respect to digitalization and and and, and gender 
I would imagine that now, if, for example, we start using e-wallets, for example, for the, for, the, for, the, for the holding of your electronic currencies, for example, it can easily make women a lot more empowered. But at, but, at, but at this point in time, women can now get bank accounts, for example. But if, for example, it's, it's going to be quite easy for us to now make transactions much more easily so that we can get money to, to women in a lot easier way rather than without significant transaction costs, maybe in some way that could help gender equality. But it's, a, it's an area that I have to say I have not put much attention to. But when it comes to digitalization and crime, I know that there are significant benefits for it there. Yeah, I agree. Well, Winsom says, the question is not whether federations a struggle, but whether CARICOM countries could be better off together. Leadership must rel relinquish some control. They have so far not wanted to do so. I agree with Winsom. Gentlemen, thoughts? Well, we've spoken about this before thinking that that is one of the underlying problems of not working together. The silos is an in inherent underlying problem. When the whole region would do better if it collaborated and did the trade-offs, um, as Anthony had indicated earlier, even among the sustainable development goals, you can't be done in silos and you, you have to talk between them and clusters and trade off certain issues where one might affect the other and so forth. But that, that is part of the underlying cultural issue in the region of not doing that to advance the whole, whole region. Yeah. Right. And uh, Justin, you made a point earlier about you know, looking at the education and making changes to the educational model. And you spoke about investing more into postgraduate studies. But what else do we need to change with the educational model? Because for me, the curriculum is a hot, hot, hot mess. We're in a digital age and we're in a technological age, but we don't teach networking. We don't teach critical thinking. We don't teach any of the things, cryptocurrency even, you know, how to, how to address the stock market. All of these things that are moving the world economy, we seem to have a hands-off approach on. Yeah. Well, Natalie, I, I think we have to look at the education from the moment a child is born. So one... One thing is that we need to make sure that parents, both men and women, be involved with the raising of their children, but they're also able to have parental enough parental leave to, to take that child through the first few months, if not if not a year of, of its life. Then, of course, I think we have to provide significant amount of early childhood education because we all know in the first two years of life, going in maybe to the first 10 years, those are the critical times when an, an, a human being learns and if you don't get that right, yeah. it's very difficult to correct that later on. But with respect to curriculum, I think that digitalization has to be mainstream. We have to, we have to make sure that we, we understand that when we're teaching, that as Anthony says, we want to become the builders of technology now. That's how we have to start thinking about it. So we also have to mainstream as well entrepreneurship. That sort of thinking must yeah. be in, in a young person's mind from very early on that, you know what, when I finish with, with school, I want to think about opening up my own business. And, and, and that has to be critical. And I think the other thing that we have to think about, and, and this is where John is so critical, his work that he's doing, is on understanding the environment that we live in. We live in a very terrible neighborhood where we're visited by these hurricanes that we give names every year. We have to understand that we have to prepare for that and understand how to live with that and to be resilient. So I think we need to change our curriculum based on our lived reality rather than what we have been doing previously. I mean, I should not have been here in Barbados and, you know, as a as a 40-something year old, not known en enough about La Soufri. That should have been taught to me when yeah. I was, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't think so? And maybe it, it, it is down to me that I should have learned yeah, about it. Yeah, no, I, I fully job. agree. But I should have learned. A lot of us it. don't even yeah. know how to pronounce it you because we've never Nobody heard expected. anything about it before this eruption. Look, exactly. the winds the winds usually blow the other way. It just happened at that time the wind blow. So it's so um <laughs> it's, it's, I guess the stars uh the stars lining up and you just happen to be, as you say, wrong place, bad time or, or what have right. you. Right. Um <laughs> yeah. Nat Natalie, I just want right, to say something. Me... You know, I heard yeah. I heard earlier in the discussion, you know, we use the and we need to be careful here because I don't think we suffer from bad leadership. I think we suffer from maybe more disjointed leadership. 
and finding and ensuring an evolutionary way that the leaders that we entrust to lead us are actually, you know, within the, having the right conversation and the conversations within the context of regionalization and sustainability. And it's on that basis, and we have a we have a, a, an obligation, um, you know, to ensure that that's the type of leadership that we seek out. If we seek out tribal leadership, we'll continue with more tribalism. You know, we we, well, we have and that's the point. Yeah, we have. I agree with you. I don't think it's that, that we don't. Us. I don't think it's that we don't have leaders. But the thing is, maybe most of them are just charis charismatic instead of being transformational or transitional, or maybe they're autocratic. It's the kind of leadership that we have in the Caribbean region and the kind of people that we are, how well is that kind of leadership serving us? And I think that's where you and I probably part ways because I'm not seeing it serving us well in, in terms of our growth. As you said, how long it is taking us as CARICOM to even get from point A to point B. From the time, Eric Eustace Williams talk about the Federation and said, you know, one from 10 leaves not. Two now. How much growth have we seen within the region as a region? We I love up 
pay anything back. What I have to tell you is true. Darling, right now we want a topic from you. Any topic that you give to me, we could sing about it immediately. You know what I mean? The lady tell me to sing on black scene. Well, you know, I am so upset because black sage ain't getting vaccine yet. Because that vaccine can make me great. But to take that vaccine, I feel kind of afraid. I don't want AstraZeneca. I don't want Pfizer. I'm going to wait on the vaccine from Cuba. <laughs> Situational singing song. I feel Megan 
is very wrong. You marry the greatest prince, and it is true. You should have known what you were getting into. It is very swell. They say that the marriage is going well. Internationally, the wedding between Megan and Harry. They say yes, Mr. Harry. Boy, he I in the monarchy. He said right now he married and he has been a tree for finally boy. Black meat he gets to eat. I love her man. I have to tell him quite a 
candidly Brian London, you should go and pay your money But I want to tell everybody flat He want to go free, I know why he doing that Just looking at him, me I be so bold Brian London looking more than 60 years old This is what I want you to know. I will pay my money if I have to go to pay. Talk for yourself, father, a grandfather, and a pensioner. Why what I want to say, boy, look class is class, but don't be afraid, boy, to the people here, free bus pass. <laughs> The police commissioner daughter Well, I was flabbergasted When I hear the lady was arrested And you know I don't brag They take up their hand all up in she handbag So what I have to tell the Minister of National Security They go back to be the lady one set of money <laughs> Country. 
the only volcano we have, I know, is a stupid mud one down in the paro. Well, for some people that is a task, playing they don't know how to wear their mask. Boy, this is what I suppose. You're supposed to cover both your mouth and your nose. But this is what I always see. People wear their mask all under their chin. But what I see it is made me bored. Some of them even they're wearing no mask at all. That is hypocrisy. It is a fact. Ryan London like a kettle calling the blood pot black. Look at him, I suppose. He don't have no mask on his nose. But I want you to hear me call. Look at him, Ryan London. He have no mask at all. It's not a crime, I suppose. They will need a very, very big mask to cover your nose. Who going to take our boy? I waited to see. All the time they used to call 
know that what's in Duke getting on bad. But by and none on PNM have the trunk card. Because I know what's in Duke getting on dread. But the man have a rape charge over his head. It's only Trinidad I will have you know. A man with a rape charge could come leader in Tobago. And ladies and gents, this cannot escape. I don't want my prime minister to be someone who was accused of rape. There's a woman in front, I have to come in. When I look across she chest, I see it mark, ramen. Well, you know, I am in the group. I think the lady talking about ramen soup. Well, you know, please consider. I know ramen soup come all the way from China. I don't like it, and I want to be a crook. But when you're having ramen, it's quite clear, you cannot cook. Lava, <laughs> 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 What you do? What you do to me? It make you want to run and take off she nice jersey. <laughs> I saw this said no poop. The woman say, boy, she don't cook her soup. Boy, she stretch the blow, blow, blow. <laughs> say she find what you're saying wrong. <laughs> so next day, lady, if you go take it in a crunch, tomorrow me and still go past the summer on your Sunday lunch. Don't get the ball back well, I suppose everybody know that the borders close. Well, you know that is very sad. You can leave and you can come into Trinidad. Well, I have to tell you without a doubt how you come, you can leave the Venezuelans out. But to that same ramen lady, I sincerely hope you open your borders to me. Pick they gave me is cancel culture. 
Well, I have to tell this lady culture in Trinidad cancel already. I want the whole nation to know. You know how long me and Brian London then do a show. And right now I tremble in with fear. Covid might say no carnival next year.
thank you for having us here this morning. We are just Feel it. Thank you very much. Hello, this is the Bocas Lit Fest event, Family Ties. I'm so glad to be here hosting it because I'm with my countrymen. Alicia McKenzie and Wendika Gill. I have known Alicia for some time and um, I'm still looking forward to finding out, picking her brains about what, um, what she does, when she does what she does. But I'm very, very, very glad to be meeting Wendika for the first time. Um, Wendika is the author of Motherland, which just came out. Motherland and Other Stories. She's a Jamaican writer, visual artist, and assistant professor of creative writing at Spelman College. She earned her PhD in English creative writing from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette and has received writing fellowships from Himbilo Fiction, Hallelujah, Hurston Wright Foundation, and Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing. Her writing has appeared in The Rumpus, Prairie Schooner, Transition, interviewing the Caribbean and other journals. Alicia McKenzie, also a Jamaican writer, is the author of Satellite Cities, Stories from Yard, Sweetheart, and most recently, A Million Aunties. Her short fiction, poetry, and other writing have appeared in a range of literary journals and in anthologies such as Stories from Blue Latitudes, the Oxford Book of Caribbean Short Stories, Global Tales, Girls' Night In, and To Exist is to Resist. She's a recipient of two Commonwealth Literary Prizes and the pre carbade Lycian and was long listed for the Sunday Times Audible Short Story in 2019. Again, ladies, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. First of all, I just want to say congratulations on having published in this past year, in this very, very strange time. Um, kudos to you. Kudos to you. It's not easy. It's not easy. I know it's not easy, but I'm so happy that I get to sit here and find out everything about, you know, what you, what you went through, what it was like. What I want to start off with, however, is um, both of you reading just short excerpts from your books um i'm gonna kick it to you alicia start 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 off okay uh so i will be reading from uh, a million aunties and before i start reading i would just like to say uh, a big thank you to the organizers of bocas for the invitation uh, to participate and to mm -hmm. you sharon and it's great to meet you wandika um, and, you know, I'm looking forward to, very much looking forward to this uh, conversation. Okay, so I, I am um, going to read from uh, A Million Aunties, which uh, is published by um, uh, Blue Banyan uh, Books, which is a Jamaica-based uh, Jamaica uh, publishing house and Akashic uh, in, uh, also Akashic in, in New York. Um, and the... Uh, Section I'm going to read is, uh, I think it's chapter 11, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's uh, anyway, it's um, from the point of view of one of the characters in this fictional village called uh, Port Segovia. And it starts, uh, you know, after a, um, after a storm. So this piece I'm going to read is the day after, after a storm. Um, but next day, the sky clear and sun bright like nothing did happen. When I go outside on the veranda, I see him, the new man, another one of them artist people staying at Miss Della place. Last year, she had a friend of Stephen staying with her for a long, long time. Chris, his name was. 
painting flowers, flowers every day and night until all her walls full of them. Everywhere she look is flowers, but they're nice, nice. The first time I go up there to take a look, he gave me one of the paintings them as I was leaving. See it right there on my wall. But imagine, when Miss Della come down here to work at her nursery, she have to look for even more flowers. I tell her that would have made me go nuts. But she just laugh. She love her plants to kingdom come. Know how to make them grow and send out blossom like no tomorrow. When Albert go off, she bring me one plant that look all dry up like it's soon going dead. Vera, she say, just keep watering it. Take care of it for me. So I care for that plant like my life depend on it. Making sure it always have water, putting it in bigger pot, feeding it fertilizer. And look at it now, big, big crop on my veranda, like my best friend. It's yours, Miss Della say, when it come back to life. This new man is from I don't know where. Tall, bony and kind of shy looking with a thin face and hair cut short. I think he may be a little bit older than, than me. He walk around each tree lying there on the ground, then bend down and run him right hand along the bark of one, like him saying sorry or something. He probably feel me watching him because him glance up at the veranda and him smile. I smile back. I would like to hang around and see what he plan to do with the tree them, but I have things to do. I have to go to the supermarket because the fridge looked like I just buy it. Brand new, not a thing inside. And I've been longing for some fried sweet potato. Wish I had somebody to share it with though, because one of the things that most make me spirits drop these days is the eating by myself. I take a quick bath and put on my favorite olive green skirt and blouse, another present from Tina. And I have to say, I feel good that it still fit me nice. Mean that I don't put on too much weight. Thank God for that. I've been doing the exercises on the video them that Tina sent down and it looked like they're working. When I walk out the yard, I stop to look at what this carver man doing. And even though he don't look up, I still say hello. It's like him harder hearing though, because it's a full five seconds before him raise him head from scraping at the tree. Or oh, I then make four and him look over the rest of me before coming back to my face, but him not face dear anything. Hello, madam, him say, and I can hear right away that him don't really speak English. So maybe him language is Spanish or something. I smile and go about my business, wonder if I'm going to cut up the tree them and haul them away. I'm sure them would lie there and rot before government send anybody to clear them up. When I come back from the market, one of the three of them is a woman. Yeah. All right, Wandika. Maybe you could just jump in now if you're excerpt. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and to share with you this work. I'm going to read an excerpt from Help Wanted. Mama had given me money to fly out of Kingston three years before, not knowing that our dear daughter would spend the next three years with Leroy in his tiny Miami apartment and not entering any college, like Mama surely was telling the whole lane. But as I watched the gray New Jersey streets whiz by, I couldn't help feeling this was going to be a ride down to rock bottom. As I say, I find cleaning up and feeding other people's offspring just too much. I told myself it was beneath me, but really it was because the year I turned 15, I birthed and buried a baby. I was no longer the same. But that's something I don't want to think about. What I had to face was the fact that I had given up the dream of further schooling. Maybe I learned to hate work because of mama's example. She hadn't worked for years. She scammed foreigners out of their pensions with the promise of lots of millions, and she was good at it. She never had to lift a broom again in another woman's household. Well, to me, even mama supposed non-work looked like hard work. She had to change her voice for different victims. 
pay strangers to collect incoming money at different Western unions and make hiding places for the money, like under a tile in the kitchen. So when the police raided our little one floor home, there was nothing to find. Besides, the police had bigger fish to catch. The people who lived in the mansions that seemed to spring up overnight, they thought mama was small fry, caught up in some big scheme and not its mastermind. No, that was her thing, not mine. But maybe if I hadn't confided in her sister, Auntie Maxine, she lives in Fort Lauderdale and I thought she'd ask me to stay, I wouldn't be sitting on a train going to work for some uppity lady. As the train jostled on, I remember the first boy who caught my eye at 14. What a fool I was, the cliche girl believing herself in love for the first time. I was led away from simultaneous equations to street corners and ganja to bareback sex and being dumped. It was a long, it was long ago, but it's, I still have to try not to think about the baby. It was dark when I arrived in New Jersey. I walked out of the station toward the escalade the woman had described. The vehicle was like the woman at the wheel, big, obnoxious, black. She insisted that I call her Claire, but it felt better to just keep calling her mom. Finally, the woman said, climbing out of the vehicle, what an ordeal, but you are here now. I smiled, hoping it didn't look too much like I was bearing my teeth. Claire <laughs> took the small pulley from me. This is all you brought for three months, she said, as she tossed a little black bag into the back seat. I did not respond and got into the front. This is my husband's, but you can use the minivan when you take the children out, the woman said as we set up. Drive, ma'am? I had not thought about this. You don't drive? She said this in the same way she'd asked me why I didn't own a cell phone. The moment I got here at 20, I just had to get a driver's license. I don't know how you manage. I let myself enjoy the warming seat and the light air coming in through the vents. So tell Delvina, tell me about yourself. Why do you want to do this babysitting job? I glanced at the woman's profile, wondering how someone who looks so ordinary could be so well off. She had an African print scarf knotted at her forehead and a large white gold ring glistening on one of the fat fingers gripping the steering wheel. I took care of my younger siblings when my mother died. I even surprised myself at how easily the lie came out. My mother as hearty as ever and me an only child. I wouldn't go near my young cousins when they came to visit us in mm -hmm. St. James in the summer. I'd never do one thing to make their stay easier, not even when asked. Oh, sorry to hear. So you like children then? I pondered the question, watching cars fly by. Not all children, ma'am, I said. <laughs> I only like children who are at least four or five who can say what's wrong with them and can feed themselves. They can answer when you call them and they can play on their own. Claire was crinkling her brow. Then suddenly she laughed a loud, long belly laugh punctu punctuated with short, sharp intakes of breath. For a moment I thought you were serious, she said when she'd quieted down. I have a nine-month-old and a two-year-old. I'm sure your aunt told you. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, I said meekly. I had for once told the woman the honest-to-God truth. I'd never dreamed of being a mother. I'd never wanted to hold a baby or smell the top of its head. I'd never played house or mummy or cook, not even when that 14-year-old boy breathed me. I decided I would not keep his baby, especially when the boy showed me the moment I told him. I decided, um, sorry. Yeah, I decided I would not keep the baby, even if I had to throw myself off the roof into the ravine. I hoped that Mama would kill me and save myself from having to do it. Mama just said I must remove my disgraceful <laughs> self from the good, good Catholic school, that I would carry the baby to term and get a job to support it. And that was all. I did as I was told. And when the baby came, I named him Philip after my father to spite Mama. Like a cruel joke, Philip lived for only three days, dying without no apparent cause. I did not let them know how much I loved this squirming little body or how often I pressed my cheek against his to feel his warmth. After, I would cry and try to talk to my dead son when mama was out of earshot. I still can't abide other people's offspring, even now. I think I'll stop there.
Okay, wonderful. Um, I love both of your, the, um, the, the, the excerpts that you chose to focus on today. And I just want to go back to you, Alicia. Um, can you tell us, talk to us a little bit about why you, how you came up with the concept for this novel. And um, I guess a question that I want to ask personally is how you decided that it was a novel as against like a collection of stories. I always, as a short story writer myself, I've always wanted to explore um, the novel. And I've always thought, well, you know, maybe I could do um, a collection of stories as a novel, but your novel, it's sort of like that, but I just want you to tell me how you came to classify it as a novel. <laughs> It did. It, it, start, it started off. It started off in a certain way, and I thought I knew how it was headed. Then the multiple points of view you now came in, and I thought, "Oh, okay, this is not your typical novel." And I wasn't sure if it should be classified as novel, you know, a novel in stories or collected, you know, or connected stories. Just tell me a little bit about um, about that process. Well. Yeah, it, it's funny you, you should ask that. I mean, it's a, it's a good question because uh, some people have actually said that, oh, um, it seems to be a cross between a novel and short stories. And for me, I mean, it started out as a sort of sequel to Sweetheart where I was uh, exploring the whole idea of, uh, of art and what art can do the healing powers of, of, of art and just, you know, how often as uh, I think as writers, we also try to express ourselves in, in other ways. And for me, one of, one of those ways is, you know, is, is through um, painting, through, through drawing. So it started off as a, a sort of a sequel uh, to Sweetheart. And then as with most things, the characters took over and went their own way. Uh, I mean, this uh, A Million Aunties is, is, you know, it's also about artists. Um, and in fact, the original title was How to Paint Flowers because um, I was uh, on a sort of art, self-imposed art residency and I was painting flowers uh, all the time. And at the same time, there, uh, there, um, there was a, a, a series of uh, attacks uh, in, in, in France and around the world in Belgium, you know, there was a, a period when there were quite a few uh, uh, terrorist attacks. And so things came together in that way. Uh, you know, the looking at all the, all the uh, horrible things taking place uh, in the world and how, how, do we, uh, how do we find healing uh, through friendship, through community, through being together, through creativity, through art. So that's the, the very long yeah, answer because in to fact, your question. Yeah, Sorry? but it, in fact, um, I think community is a very big part of, um, of, of, of the novel. Yes. Um, do you want to speak to that? With um, all these yes. disparate, disparate, is it, am I reading it right that all of these different people um, eventually found community, especially in the end, with each other. And, and is that what you're saying? Is that the importance of community? I, I think so. I mean, I didn't start out with that in mind. Oh. But it, it's always it's always something. I mean, it's in our background, right? And when when things I don't know about you, Sharon. I think you're 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 younger than I am. But I don't think much not. younger. <laughs> <laughs> I lived through I lived through the political violence of the the, the late seventies, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know uh, uh, there were uh, people from my high school who got caught up in the violence, uh, people people whom we lost uh, mm -hmm. to 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 the violence, and and so how how do we get over these things? How do we get over? Uh, uh, bad things, you know, and it, and, and for I think uh, throughout the Caribbean, this is very important. People giving a helping hand 
people mm -hmm. saying, you know, look, look, Miss Della, look, this is for you. And, and so I wanted to, I wanted to uh, uh, address that in, in the novel or in the, the well, <laughs> I won't call it. <laughs> I won't no, say the stories in the novel. In the novel. Um, so I, in the end, what I gathered, what I took from it was that, okay, it's various points of view, it's multiple yeah. points of view. And the, what, because I usually think that if you tell a novel from different points of view, they, all these points of view coalesce around a certain, a particular story, a particular idea, particular theme. But I read it as all these stories coalescing around the idea of what community is. Was I, that I right? Think, was, I, I think, I mean, when I read the, I, I tend not to read, uh, you know, the books after they've been published, unless I have to do a reading, <laughs> because yeah. you go back and you see all the faults and you want to, correct them and you want to write things uh, differently, but of mm. course it's too late. So, but, <laughs> but, but I think um, from what I've heard from readers and from reviewers, that is something that, um, that people take away from it, you know, mm. that community is important and we have to be there. We have mm. to be there for one another. Uh, mm. And, you know, this pandemic is, 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 is a, a, a case in point. I, I have a, a friend in, in Jamaica who tells me, you know, she goes shopping for her, her neighbor who's blind and so forth and so on, because, you know, uh, this, this lady doesn't leave her house uh, anymore. And, 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 and I think all these things are important. We hear so much about the crime, we hear so much about the violence, but how do we, how do we keep ourselves afloat and I'm not talking just for the Caribbean I'm talking for everywhere because we're all you know experiencing this situation right now how do we how do we um, behave in a way where we we're there for for our friends for our family and mm -hmm. the family family doesn't have to be you know uh, blood ties Fa yes but, family comes in all shapes and all sizes right, exactly. and all forms yeah yeah, yeah. And um, so I'm just going to jump to you now, Andika, because I feel like um, your stories, your collection, um, it's really about women trying to find their way. Um, and, and for purposes of this particular chat, um, I've just decided to focus on three of the stories. I'm glad you read from Help Wanted because I really, I really wanted to talk about that character, that Delvina character, but also um, Motherland and Melba. Your stories are about mainly about women. Um, I love that. But it's also about immigrants. It's about Jamaicans trying to find their place in the diaspora. Um, I wonder if you could just give, first of all, um, did you collect these stories over a period of time or did you write the stories for this collection? How did it all come about? It's a really funny story because I was working on a novel for my dissertation, but to procrastinate, I'd say, let me work on this short story. Let me finish this short story. It's not coming. And so I ended up with more short stories than I was working on. And I said, you know, this could be it. And they all mm -hmm. seem to have, as you say, that theme of, you know, displacement or like trying to find your identity, being an mm -hmm. immigrant. And so, and because that is part of my identity, even though I always tell people that these are not autobiographical. And as we know, as writers, we use things that we have observed and we have experienced, but it's not like, you know, it's my story. So I wanted to tell different kinds of stories because all of these women are different but they mm -hmm. still have that same kind of yearning and mm -hmm. so I figured this would be you know something to focus on in the dissertation and when um when I finished the program I said I definitely see this as a collection because it had to be presented that way but I also saw it as a really um good collection of stories that would depict you know what it's like as an immigrant and especially you're at the you know the apex of all of these identities that you're, you're intersectional in that sense where you're a woman you're an immigrant you know you are black 
all of those mm-hmm. things collide in a way mm-hmm. that others may not experience outside of that. So I definitely wanted to show that with these women. I do, you know, present a few of the stories from the perspective of Caribbean men, like only two of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but definitely my, my passion or the focus that I had was to think about you know, how gendered the experience can be and how people can think about, you know, um, what it is, what it's like for women to navigate these spaces, especially, you know, America, the white world, England in that sense. Mm -hmm. So that's how they came about. Um, Yes, go ahead. No, I was just, because I I really do love that character, Delvina. Um, I know that people will think that she's a horrible person, you know, <laughs> just because of what she does as soon as she reaches the um, the host family's right. home and how she actively sets about trying to seduce the husband. But yeah. I don't see her as a bad person per se. I see her as somebody who's just trying to figure out, who's trying to come to terms with her sexuality, um, just, just who she is as a person. She says, she's very confused. She doesn't really want to work in that bit that you read. She, does, she didn't really want to be taking care of children, but here she was and um, so she's just trying to find her way. Can you talk a little bit more about this, this girl? Uh, what is she, what's gonna happen? When, when the story ended, I was like, what, what's gonna happen now? Where, like, suppose I, suppose we bucked her up 10 years from now. What's gonna happen to her? Where is she going? What's gonna happen? That's the thing with this story. I mean, it's interesting you said that because one of my friends said, you know, I have a bone to pick with you. You did Delvina dirty, you know? (laughs) And and because um, you're right, she is not the most likable character. And I kind Mm -hmm. of thought about that because people aren't always there. Sometimes people can be abrasive, but they've gone through things and it informs how they behave and how they think about and so I wanted to present her as like this complex character in that sense, because mm-hmm. we don't have, you know, you think about the villain, like the mustache twirling villain. They don't <laughs> exist in the world. That like, People have a reason why they are that way, even if it's not apparent to themselves, even not apparent mm-hmm. to um, others around them. And for her, because she's gone through trauma, because she had these hopes and everything that she tries just doesn't you know, work right work mm-hmm. uh, But as you mentioned about, you know, how it ends, the because with short stories, that's why I like short stories because you can just give people a, a slice. Even you say, all right, I am going to answer a question that I set out in your mind to say, who is this girl? What does she want? Why is she in this predicament? And how will she make it through? So I, in my way, I think that it's almost hopeful because she is thinking about other avenues than just going back to to Leroy and just Mm -hmm. like continuing that cycle where Mm -hmm. he doesn't seem that he's going to you know make her legal he doesn't seem like he cares about her and she's thinking well maybe I can do other things but I don't want to also go back home because Mm -hmm. I'm trying to also touch on this stigma of uh, why this idea of America as the golden paradise mm-hmm. continues to be perpetuated, even though people in Jamaica have the internet, they know what's going on, but not really in the sense of lived experience. And so mm-hmm. people think, oh, you come to America, you've made it. So to go home and not, you know, realize what you set out to makes you feel like uh, you're some kind of um failure so that was my commentary because people do have that mindset she not Mm -hmm. even bring one barrel come home she you know so (laughs) that kind of idea that she was thinking if I went back home you know my mom is already telling the whole lane how great I am and yes it would be better because she's getting money even though she's getting it illegally you know at least she would be able to help me but it's greater of a problem for her to go back home and not and not be where she is. So, so I left it kind of open and ended that way because it continues in your mind. What do you think mm-hmm. happens there? Mm-hmm. We'll see her again in another. <laughs> <day or so. laughs> yeah, you know, um, it just had me thinking about the question of identity. I think she says there's, a, um, w- w- what does she say here? Um, I, I could just go home to Jamaica, but that idea died. She's very 
you know, torn. Um, and there was a part that she also said, I looked at the back of his head, but I didn't really see him. So it just, it had me thinking about the immigrant as being invisible in a sense, um, as well as the immigrant woman, you know, this whole big idea of identity and being seen, you know. Um, I wondered if, Alicia, if you could jump in at this point. Um, the, the Miss Pretty character, um, I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure what to make of her, but it seemed, and, it, and even Auntie Della, Auntie, mm -hmm. yes, Auntie Della, these are women of a, cer a certain age. And I wondered for Miss Pretty, I, I, and I'm going to ask the similar question because I know it's a short story and it should just end in the moment. And, but even with your novel, um, I wondered what happened with Miss Pretty, what happened with Auntie Della in the end. I feel like it's going to be, if, if again, if we meet them 10 years down the road, that some, that is very optimistic. Um, Auntie Della, to me, she found her calling when she mm -hmm. decided, yeah, um, I, I felt like she found her calling. She was just coming into herself. Can you speak to us a little bit about that? Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I've been thinking about these characters recently because uh, a friend of mine who's a, a professor here, she said to me, so um, Miss Pretty, it's, it's uh, I mean, she's, she's, uh, she's symbolism for for africa right so it's the it's the african mother uh looking for her lost child so she's uh <laughs> and of course and that I, was thought of that that was not in my head when i, when I wrote the character <laughs> but i thought that this is interesting because yeah. you know it could it could work maybe subconsciously yeah i was i was thinking of that so you know we we uh were taken uh, uh, from Africa, uh, brought uh, to the Caribbean, and we're constantly searching for, you know, for the lost child, for 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 the lost home. Um, so, so that that that's a, for that lost a, new, a new perspective. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, that, the lost identity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and yeah. Um, you know when I. I, uh, as a writer, I don't like to wrap things up at the end. Mm -hmm. I prefer to have the reader um, think about the, the characters and what might become of them. Mm -hmm. And to imagine, to imagine um, their own ending in a way. Maybe, maybe that's an excuse because I'm bad at endings. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but even, with, even with the short stories, you know, I tend to leave things open-ended. Open -ended. Yeah. yeah. Does, does that... I mean, that's, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. that's something that I've had to try to convey to the students, but it can be confusing in that sense because you are trying to answer a question you set out in your work. You're not showing the person's whole life, but mm. you are kind of showing what the piece is concerned with. So once you have that clear in your mind, and for a while, that's why some stories take longer than some. Because mm -hmm. some of my stories took me years. So I kept tinkering at it. Others, mm -hmm. it was like maybe a few weeks because I came to that question sooner to say, what does this person, what does this person want? And what can I show about this? So whether it's a commentary that the person doesn't get what they want, but it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Or they get what they want and they realize it's not right for them. Or they get what they want and they're happy about it. And it's, you know, also, so that is my question all of the time because it's, it's still like maybe the beginning of something. Like for Roxanne in, in Motherland, that, mm -hmm. that idea that she's come to England and she's seen all of these things that happened to her there as a black woman and noticing the differences with how people are treated and, you know, also thinking that she doesn't have anybody and this old white guy that she has to take care of, in a sense, becomes family. And, you know, so what is that question I have is about her trying to find her identity about family through that, you know? Yeah. And as we see with Delvina, yes, she's not the most likable person, but she also has that question of 
where do I belong? I need to figure this out. We don't know if she does, but the, it comes to her mind fully that I need to figure this out. So yeah, it's open-ended in that way because you don't, it's, it's reflecting life. And, you know, that's the, that's the challenge to say, is it really done? <laughs> <laughs> but in, um, in Motherland, um, the, the character Roxanne, mm -hmm. she is always being asked, where are you from? What I wanted to, kind of from both of you, um, I tend to see writers writing from the diaspora. The, their characters tend to have this looking back, a look back to where they're coming from um, because of the disappointments of where they are now. They thought, they went there thinking that the streets were paved with gold, whatever. And then they just want to go back to home. She says, um, Roxanne, there's something she says that I really, really found interesting. There was nothing to go home to Jamaica for. So she's, it, I find that some of these characters are kind of in purgatory. They're in the United States, they're in England, but they're not quite content. Their lives are not, you know, what they, not shaking out to be what they thought they would be. But then again, I noticed that people, writers who write from this space here, the characters are all trying to flee, to, to, to go towards it. And I'm just wondering if you, if either of you have any thoughts on that, because um, Alicia, your character, Chris, when he suffers this loss, he comes back to Jamaica. There's always this coming back. And yet people, writers writing from this space, if their characters want to go, they're, they're kicking on the gates, the doors, beating down the embassy gates, they want to go. Can you just, both of you, just speak a little bit about that? Do you want to go first? Um, go, go ahead, go ahead, Wendy. As you said, you know, about beating down the embassy, because it's the unknown. They think they know. They think they know. And even somebody who is aware about it intellectually when you come here and you have the lived experience it's you different. realize that it's not what you you've lost home that's mm -hmm. the the trouble um i don't remember who i think maybe it was carol davis or somebody who had written that you lose home the minute you leave it that you're always you continue to search so when you go back home because i do have characters who go back home but they don't they're not the same mm -hmm. anymore and they don't fit squarely back where they used to. So just by the process of leaving, you're changed. Mm -hmm. So you come here or you go to any other place, you know, foreign, and you feel homesick because you mm -hmm. have either romanticized what home was or it's a way for you to cope with being in this new place. So I think which, that's which, what, what's going on. Yeah. yeah, which makes me wonder, the title, Motherland, where is the motherland? Exactly, because for, mm -hmm. for the character, motherland is fraught because it, the British came and they claim the Caribbean, of course, through colonialism and through you know, slavery first and then colonialism. And so um, because now we have that legacy of that kind of um, reshaping of our identity as African people and now we are British subjects, motherland is britain because that's where those colonizers came from but then mm -hmm. we also come from africa which we have never been there but we are african extract we are african um, descendants and so is that the motherland mm -hmm. because we still try and you despite all of the things that happened with cultural erasure africa is still evident in who we are but mm -hmm. is it is it you know can we call it motherland so it's like that idea of where is the motherland definitely mm. you know it could mm. be those one of those things or both or neither you know mm. yeah alicia i noticed um when chris came back you know it was very striking to me when he came back home and then he went on a day trip to the country and they he came across an accident, really horrible, horrible accident in which the woman was beheaded. 
<laughs> Don't give it away, Sharon. <laughs> okay. But the, 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 it was so stark. You know, I thought, okay, he, he's coming back for comfort from home. But then he comes back and then he sees something like this happening. You know? Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the awfulness of home at the same time. Where, so where is home? Yeah, but the thing is, awful things, terrible things happen everywhere, and there is really no paradise. Yeah, there's no, you know, no, no matter where you go, and mm -hmm. I, I, I have the, <laughs> the problem of when I say I live in Paris, people go, oh, and I'm like, I mean, I could tell you some things, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, uh, it's, it, it's not, it's not paradise. I mean, I, I do enjoy certain aspects of, of living here. Mm -hmm. But then you're also the other and, you know, with everything that that uh, everything that brings. Right. Um, so uh, I think a part uh, a part of the, the, the reason for always looking back is that. Your home is your home. And I, I consider Jamaica home. I mean, I, I, I grew up there. I went to school there. I went back every year, you know, when my when my mother was uh, still alive. Um, and I try to, you know, to go home as often as I can. Um, so, um, you know, it's this thing of you're, you're being pulled all the time. And this is probably why so many people, I mean, they spend 30 years, 40, 40 years in yeah. abroad, and then they, they go home, or the, you know, because it's, 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 it's a part of you. And th the other thing is that, I mean, we have a we have several um, Jamaican groups here. You know, um, we have an annual picnic. We do things. We just had a Miss Lou competition mm -hmm. organized by the Jamaican uh, diaspora in France, and uh, we 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 know where we come from, right? And we, you know, people might say, "Oh, you've lived abroad so long. You're you know you're no longer Jamaican." But I know I'm Jamaican. I feel Jamaican. Mm -hmm. And and nobody going to take that away from me, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> did I hear? Did I hear the distinct Jamaican coming out there? <laughs> and, and 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 maybe this is the thing we're we're always looking back. You know, we want to go home, even if circumstances prevent us uh, mm -hmm. from. And, and you know, I don't think a lot of people do. We leave because we think that the streets are paved with gold elsewhere. I think we leave because of various circumstances right. and opportunities. You know? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. lots of diff that's good too. That lots of different, especially now more recently too. Like it could be work, school, family mm -hmm. members. You know, opportunities. Sometimes escape. You know, because yeah. people do leave because maybe they're trying to leave a bad situation that they're in. And even those people say, well, you know. No, the mangoes would be ripe and you know, start to have <laughs> yes, these feelings yes, about, yes, even yeah, though they had yes. such a horrible domestic situation they mm -hmm. can still sit by the window looking out at the concrete you know streets and 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 think about all the lush and you know that wasn't even the reality that they had so it's 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 very interesting that you say that because there are so many different reasons why you can right. you sometimes feel in interest, you said home when I go home, you see? Mm -hmm. when you, yeah. you said home, even though you've made your home somewhere else. And sometimes right. I find myself, I really want to go home, home. I have to qualify, you know, <laughs> so that this is the real yeah. home. But is it, you know, it's like... It, How long have you been there, Wandika? I left in 2009 to do graduate work. And um, I, like you, Alicia, I would go home every year. I try to go home every year. Because I felt like as a writer and somebody who is interested in keeping the conversation about Jamaica, I don't you know, want to be so detached from it. And also because I missed, I missed the place itself and the people. Right. And even though I used to be a reporter and saw all of crime and violence and things and reporting on horrible situations and things that I've experienced myself, would say, people would say, why would you even want to go back there, you know? But it's something that you hold on to an aspect of it that you consider to be home. That's why I think it lives in the work. You think about it all the time. You still feel homesick. And you still 
catch yourself saying going home. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. obviously, you can have another home too, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I... And, and, and an aspect that I found very interesting in, in, in both works is just the, how you deal with women of a certain age. Um, I love the story, um, Melba. Melba is coming off um, and the loss, a horrible loss. Earlier she lost her children and she loses her husband. And in and in in a sense, she reminds me again of Miss Pretty and Auntie Della. These are women who are they've been in the world a long time. And again, here comes the idea of identity for them. Like um, Melba says, no. Um, after her husband dies, she says it says she was neither wife nor mother. Now, so who is she? Um, Miss Pretty, she has that situation there with the, with the child. Who is she? You know, and I thought I thought that you both dealing with women of a certain age, I really really found it fascinating. You know, and I just wondered if you wanted to comment on on that because there's there's so many people who write now, and it's all about young women and so on. But the older women still have things, still have issues, still have things that they need to, to, to find mm-hmm. out that they're, they're seeking about, you know? Who was Melba now that the husband is dead? Who is, who is, Miss, who is Miss Pretty? It was, it was an interesting question to me because I did find that I was writing about younger protagonists and then, mm-hmm. you know, people more my age. I mean, I don't know, I still consider myself Young, I just had a birthday and I'm getting close to the big, you know, four oh. But um, <laughs> I, I also wanted to um, write about an older woman, partly because I saw a woman on the bus one day and I realized that she would ride the bus all day because I would get on to, there are only probably two of those buses with that number. And every time I would get on, no matter what, she would be on there. So I thought, what's going on here? And so I started to envision her life and I realized that she represented for me women like that who they've accomplished a lot in their lives. And then what, what the question of what if she doesn't have um, a family anymore? How would mm-hmm. she view herself? Did she feel herself diminished? And also I think too, because people have said to me like, you know, do you want to be a mother? Do you want to be a wife? And those are not things that I personally would say definitely that's what you know there are people who this is something that is very important to them they actively seek it out but what if somebody had those things taken away from them how would they how would they conceive of themselves and that was an interesting question to me you know because it's 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 something you can empathize with to say you are not um, an extension of somebody else. You can be your own person. And, and why I kind of made Melba this kind of character so that she wouldn't be pitiful. I don't know if I- No, I've she's not pitiful at you. all. I don't know. <laughs> she just reminds me of my mother, even though my mother passed before my father. I just thought that my mother would, would seem like that, like that Melba, you know? She's, yeah. but I, I, I love the fact that She's dignified. She's riding the buses every day, but she's dignified, you know? Um, I guess it would play into Alicia's um, theme of community because your characters, your woman characters who are of that age, they are alone, but they're not really alone. The idea that community is there for them, that's really important. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think we see that, you know, all at, at throughout Jamaica and across the Caribbean. Talking about writing about women of a certain age. I mean, I'm a woman of a certain age right now. So, it's, you know, it's, it's not, um, I mean, it, it wouldn't be strange for me uh, to write about mm-hmm. these characters. Although even when I started out uh, years ago, I think uh, Satellite City was published in uh, 92. 
two. So we're, we're looking at coming up to 30 years, right? So mm. the first collection of short stories. Mm. Uh, you know, I had characters who were aunts and grandmothers and because I grew up with these very important uh, maternal figures, if you like, mm. uh, you know, in Jamaica. And whether they were uh, people in the neighborhood or whether they were teachers, um, I mean, I think we all we all have a stories to tell about uh, interacting with um, women of a certain age, if, if to use your phrase, Sharon. <laughs> well, I think why I'm so the, these characters, Melba and um, Miss Bella, I think I was really struck by them because I too, <laughs> I'm a woman of a certain age, I'm single. And you know, you get to that point where you're saying, okay, every time I feel a headache or something, I said, oh, this is the big one, it's coming now. How, who's gonna find me in my apartment then? Um, so the idea of community, that idea mm -hmm. of community, I guess that that's why your book stands out for me, Alicia. Who is my community? Who are my people? Who is my tribe? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I find as the older I get, the more important that question becomes. You know, especially when you're when you when you don't have a family, when you're not married, whatever. Who is my tribe? I have friends, but in this pandemic now, you're at odds and ends because you know you're not seeing people, you can't hug people, you can't. You know, the, the Friday evening limes that I'm accustomed to doing, that's not happening anymore because mm -hmm. I would die before I do a Zoom party. It doesn't make any kind of sense to me. But then, mm -hmm. you know, you just wonder. It's, it's, it's times like these, you start to really wonder who yeah, is yeah. is that, who is your, who is your community? And yeah. I, I think this pandemic has really shown us how important that is to have, yeah. to have friends, to have um, to have people who are who are looking out for you, and you know, my my family is uh, uh, most most family members live somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So you're you're here. There's there's a small Jamaican community we try to keep in touch. As I told you, we had this Miss Lou uh, event, mm -hmm. and everybody tuned in, and you know, people from Jamaica were reciting um, um, uh, Miss Lou uh, poems and so on. But just on a day-to-day -day level, for me, it's so important to uh, to yeah. have a couple of friends to call up and say, "Look, we put on our masks. Can we go for a walk?" Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. to come back to Miss Pretty walking and people helping yes. her. You know, yes, people helping her. That's struck yeah. me. That and really struck me. I, I I found that just I've been walking a lot since because this thing started a year ago, and we've mm -hmm. been we're in our third lockdown. The, the the fourth one for the Paris uh, area with a curfew and you know everything that comes with that. So um, trying to keep your sanity is not easy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you you need that community, and yeah. you need to figure out a way to 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 stay positive, to uh, yeah. I, 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 and just to uh, continue to interact somehow. Yeah. So you don't feel, and, and, and also to look out for people who are isolated, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I am, I'm definitely an introvert and I thought, oh, no big deal. You know, you say, <laughs> but yeah. you need people, even when you are somebody who stays to, your, to herself, you still need people, you know? Yeah. Um, I find that I still, I reach out more to family members now than before, you know? Because when, when something is taken away from you, then you start to see to what see the value uh, yeah. was in your life. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So Absolutely. Maybe you don't Absolutely. have a family of your own, but you can connect. And I think back to when I just came here by myself, my, my other siblings were scattered and in other places. And the way that I found community was on the campus, there were other Caribbean students and we just kind of drew together we would have potlucks we would be able to just like so what does that mean in your dialect and I wouldn't mm -hmm. understand some of what you're saying you're from St. Lucia and we don't say that and you know and we get this kind of community going because we are away from our you know our own network and our own our own um, biological families and 
So mm-hmm. I definitely, it really smacked me in my face to say, you know, listen, even though you're somebody, you're pretty much, you know, like a hermit, even you, <laughs> you definitely need to, to reach out yeah. to people more because yeah. this is very isolating, you know. It you know, is. You it know, is. All, it you is. know mm-hmm. is maybe I have all this stored up energy and it's just like, normally I would go somewhere and it, you would be able to dispense yeah. all of this energy, but, you know. Yeah, you, you know, funny thing too is that uh, as writers, people keep saying, uh, I mean, people keep asking writers, so are you writing? This must be a good time. <laughs> you're right, you're right. And somehow you're so worried, you're so distracted yes. by the news. You have to have the motivation. Yeah. I, listen, I don't think I've written one sentence in this in a year. I can't even. I can't. I can barely sleep. Um, yes. It's 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 really this whole time has been but you know I'm just so glad that I've been reading I haven't been writing but I've been reading and Mm -hmm. I'm really so happy that I came across both of your works you know it's been the reading that's been getting through getting me through this time and I'm really really very happy Wandika for you know just stumbling across your work I mean it's a very strong collection and I really 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 love it um I do wish you more success, big success. I know it's coming. I know it's going to happen. Alicia, you keep writing, keep writing about art. I, and I'm, I've been enjoying your photos on Instagram, walking uh, walk the streets Thank of you. Paris and just taking all those lovely pictures. It, and in, you know, in a very weird way, it helps seeing those pictures and see they're just beautiful and you 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 know you get well for me at least I get a sense that okay I'm not alone strangely right. enough you know you're there in in Paris and I'm looking at the streets I'm looking at how deserted the streets are and it reminds me of when I drive home in the nights mm. and the streets are so deserted I'm called an essential worker for you know, um, working at the Observer, but um, driving on this on the roads at night, it makes me so sad. But then, you know, I just get to read all of y'all works, and it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And we have two minutes, a little over two Sorry minutes left. It. That's that's good. That's good. And um, we have a little over two minutes. Um, I wondered if any one of you um, wanted to have the last word. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, this is really great. You're like, oh, I oh never get the last word. <laughs> There's somebody at the door. I'm, I'm so sorry. No, I'm that's so okay. Sorry. That's I'm okay. Sorry. <laughs> what I would say is that, you know, the, that what you said about not being able to write yeah. during this time and the fact that people say you should be writing because you have so much time to really get into your work. And I have to dedicate time I find that I have to be a lot more disciplined Mm -hmm. than I was before because writing about home is what I think kind of you know works maintaining my sanity and one of another writer you know another Jamaican writer Julian Fong I just had an event with her and she said that when you're a Jamaican and you're writing um, about home or you're away from Jamaica and you're in another country, sometimes you can be like, you're in limbo. Mm-hmm. You feel like you're in limbo. And so I think mm-hmm. writing helps me to be a lot more centered about it. You think more about- Yeah, about, that connection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So definitely mm-hmm. something I want to keep doing, especially I will write about my Caribbean people for, <laughs> for my life because we have so much to say and so oh, much- yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I I apologize. I'm so sorry. It's okay. You're, it's, you're deli- home. it's somebody it's delivering. delivering. Of course. I hope it's books. I hope it's. Books. <laughs> <laughs> That's, all I can say. That's all we can do now. Read books. Just read books. Just read books. But um, it's really it has been a delight talking with you, ladies. Um, you know, and I I too am really grateful for Bocas for the opportunity for asking me to just sit down with you. Um, I really enjoyed myself. I really enjoyed the hour, really enjoyed getting to know you, Wandika, and getting to know you a little even a little bit better, Alicia. Um, thank you. Thank so thank you guys, thank you. Thank um, you. Much success, much more success, you know. 
Lots um, of interesting questions I hadn't thought about. So yeah. Oh, yeah. oh good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Thanks oh, good. for the moderation. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think. Oh, yes, it's time. It's time. <laughs> so bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, bye. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Then. Stand up and deliver. Now is your turn. This is day three inside the NGC Boca Slit Fest. My name is Rokas and I'm so grateful to have you guys here for a third day. Oh my goodness, this is mind blowing. All right, guys, let's not waste any time. This is 2021. We're getting things rolling with some fiction all the way from Canada. Please, behind your screens, put your hands together, snap your fingers and welcome H. Nigel Thomas. He has been pacing the corridor backward and forward, from the main door through the living room to the dining area, his skin stingling. It began as soon as he got into the elevator on the ground floor, now sweats coursing down his, arm, his sides from his armpits. An hour and a half ago, he received his permanent resident visa, starting over at 36, tough. He takes off the navy blue blazer he wore to the citizenship and immigration office earlier and hangs it in the coat closet. He should change his damn shirt too. It reeks of the Paco Rabanne he sprayed himself with. He moves to the couch, begins to sit, but hears the crows clamoring outside. They come around 11 a.m. on a Tuesday, garbage collection day. He walks to the dining area, unlocks the patio door, goes on to the balcony and watches them. 21 are feeding rowdily from atop the three overflowing dumpsters. On the ground below, five gulls, their white plumage contrasting with the crow's black, move around and eye the crows nervously. The simple, instinctual life, he sighs. Do crows worry? If they're as intelligent as the biologists say, they probably do. He hums. All things which live below the sky or move within the sea are creatures of the Lord Most High and brothers unto me. One of the few hymns from his Methodist past that he's still comfortable singing, minus the third line. On the metro on his way home from the immigration office, he vowed to start focusing on what's beautiful in his life. Took over three years, 2012 to 2015, to process his immigration application. Yesterday was Thanksgiving. Today, he has something to be thankful for and one less thing to worry about. He returns inside walks back to the living room and sits on the couch. His mind turns to Gladys, a parishioner back in Barbados, now studying at McGill. This afternoon, he's meeting her for the fourth time since she arrived in Montreal at the end of August. She insisted that he, she must see him urgently, but wouldn't say why. He thinks she has found out something. Is she about to confront him? No surprises, please, not today. He wonders, will his nightmares end now? Will he stop dreaming that he's back in St. Vincent looking for a job and a purpose for his life? The feeling that his marriage to Jay is a mistake, will that end at all? Suppose just Jay says to him when he returns from Atlanta today, Millington? You're a permanent resident now, so let's annul this marriage. That Friday evening, February 17th, 2012, what came over him? Why did he uncork so easily? Why did he spill like that? He'd sealed it for a long time, longer, and he might have exploded, gone insane for real. If Jay's brother Paul hadn't stayed behind in the hotel lobby, 
he would have been more measured. But the stopper blew and he gushed like a geese. The bar was deserted, just a man and a woman at a corner table at the far end from them and the bartender behind the counter. He told the Jay that he's resigned from the Methodist ministry. Jay complimented him for doing so, if that's what he wanted. And now I'm destitute, he resisted saying. He asked Jay about the possibility of immigrating to Canada. Jay said he'd heard that the easiest way was to marry Canadian citizens. That the government had launched a campaign to discourage Canadians from marrying people they meet while holidaying abroad. A long pause. I'll check out the Citizenship and Immigration website and let you know, Jay said, his head turned away. Millington took a deep breath, held on fiercely onto the sides of the table, his hands slippery with sweat, closed his eyes and said, did you ever suspect that I'm gay? It was a real colour of folks out there in La Fontaine, the clock thought to herself smiling. And by and by, it looked like every one of them wanted to see what it was about banking with the atrium that made them so special. You'd have young ladies, old ladies, big hardback men and all. Each of them... The clock stopped herself mid-thought. She peered through the glass door at the slim, gawky figure making its way up the office steps. As soon as she made out the silhouette, she sighed and slumped into her chair. Yes, you really did get them all, and some days you would even get Minnie. Minnie was a local woman approaching her thirties, like almost all the clerks in the office. But the difference with her was that she had never had to lift a finger in her life because her mom had fixed her up good with plenty of tree money. Still, for all the work she shirked, she was remarkably thin and made some even more remarkably fat babies. She slung the youngest from her hip to her lap as she took her seat in front of the clock. There's only two minutes to take in here, don't worry. A very good morning to you too, replied the clock. Yes, good morning, good morning, but let me do this quick. You see, I have a part of the statement here that confused me. She pointed one long acrylic to the first line of the statement in hand. She looked up. The clock stared back at her expressionlessly. She tapped on the microphone. Miss Madam, watch, it's here that I want you to look at, she said, pointing at the statement again. Minnie, you know by now they have a number system. It's not no roll up and hoppy in kind of thing, you know. This is not City Gate. Here's another maxi. Where had I be you in here today, boy? Where Yvonne? I could handle she. Play fresh with me now. I have a case right here that can embarrass you and this whole office. Bad. You that last line for me, please? The clerk looked at the statement. On it were all of many transactions, the atrial in pink at the top and the ventricular in teal below. The statement was divided into four, with the bottom right quadrant showing outgoings, and it was this section that had left Minnie in a fit. So there was a girl up at dawn on a Saturday. She paused gloweringly for the clock to appreciate the full gravity of the fact. I dare, set and ready to buy my VVIP tickets. Tell me why when I go to place the order now, they're telling me my card decline? What is that? Skimming dismissively over most of the page, the clock glanced at the recent deposits on the right. It's very simple, she said, looking at the far from simple diagram with mock pity. Here, she said, pointing to the bottom left corner. I don't have any money. So if you don't have any ventricular funds ready in your outgoings, you can't make a ventricular purchase. Right, but what happened in here? Said Minnie, pointing now to the pink section at the top of the statement. And if it have money here, it should flow down to here? You know it's not just so it does work, Miss Lady. Once you open up an atrial account, you have to wait the standard processing time before it is released from your atria. Everything passing through the corona system have to get the approval of the atrium. God boy, all the people just like to drag things out for spite. Mini, said the clock again. It have people waiting here long, long from before you could even wipe out the ampy from your eye this morning. 
would really have hair so that you could know. Before she had finished her sentence, the clock felt her blood run cold, as for the first time in the conversation, she had actually read all the figures on the right half of the statement. Minnie, that figure there, is that what you're getting for this month? Well, I find it a little fast, but yes, it saw it as movement dairy. It was a pending deposit, but something about it did not look right. This one was larger than any she had seen approved by the atrium in one transaction. The clock looked again at the statement, and then up at Minnie. She looked down at the statement again, and then at the baby, who stared back as blankly as its mother. It grimaced as if to relieve itself, and then quickly repositioned it again. Well, sugar's in truth, said Trish, leaning back in her chair. If these numbers were indeed correct, and they had no reason not to be, they were indeed in a serious mess. What a moral dilemma indeed. Ah oh boy, as we did say in Trinidad and Tobago, pressure? All right, speaking of Trinidad and Tobago, the next writer I'm going to present to you guys inside Stan and Deliver is hailing from right here in Trinidad and Tobago. Check this out. Albert, Albert, get up, get up, it's raining and the roof is leaking again. Maisie sat up in bed. She poked her husband's shoulder. The steady drip drip of water coming through the galvanised roof of their little wooden house had woken her. If it's raining, there's not much I can do now, grumbled Albert. Put a bucket to catch it. I'll fix it tomorrow. He turned over and went back to sleep. Next morning, the sun was shining. Albert sat in his rickety rocking chair on the porch, smoking his pipe. He watched the clouds drifting like puffs of white smoke across the blue sky. Albert, Albert, oh, Albert, wailed Maisie. The cow's gone from the field. How many times I ask you to mend the fence and he keeps saying tomorrow, tomorrow. It's too hot now, responded Albert, but I'll do it first thing tomorrow. Later that day, after she had caught the cow and tethered her to a post, Maisie came out onto the porch waving a bundle of letters at her husband. Albert, she cried in despair. The water, electricity and telephone bills are all overdue. When are you going to town to pay them? Tomorrow. I'll go tomorrow, he replied. I have to fix the car and put air in the tyres first. And while you are there, you can get some cooking gas and check the lotto numbers. We might have won enough money to buy a new roof, Maisie told him. Next day, it was raining again. Maisie grumbled as she placed buckets and pots to catch the drips from the ceiling. You say you can't fix it when it's raining, and when the sun is shining you say there's no need because water not coming in. Meanwhile, the cow broke free from the rope. She ran through the broken fence and galloped off down the road. That evening, Albert was watching football on the television, when at the precise moment his hero was about to score a goal, the screen went blank and the lights went off. He gave out a great roar. Maisie, who was cooking in the kitchen, let out a scream. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I'm sick of hearing tomorrow, she bawled. Current gone, no light, no water. Wasser done disconnected it and now the gas has gone. How am I going to cook the supper? Well, it's too late now, sighed Albert. I'll get up early tomorrow and go to pay the bills. Maisie made bread and cheese sandwiches. They used rainwater from a barrel to wash the wares and sponge themselves down before going to bed. Early next morning before the sun came up, there was a bang, bang, bang on the door. Police, police, get up Albert Brown. You are under arrest for non-payment of fines for traffic violations. But, 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 Albert protested, pulling on his pants. I was going into town tomorrow to see after everything. That's what they all say, growled the police officer, snapping on the hand for cuffs. Don't you know, tomorrow never comes. You should never put off until tomorrow what you can do today. Later, Maisie caught a taxi into town. She paid the bills and took her lotto tickets to check the numbers. 
Imagine her delight on discovering she had won $5,000, enough to buy some sheets of galvanised for the roof and purchase an extra cylinder of gas. Come after lunch, she told the roofer. I'm not waiting for tomorrow, it might be raining. And maybe tomorrow, if it isn't raining, I'll go and bail Albert out of jail. Crick crack, monkey broke his back, all for a piece of rotten pomerac. Neighbourhood Posse, written by Robin Kirkley and read by Robin Kirkley. Glancing out my window whilst passing casually, I see somebody bending over by my neighbour mango tree. I step out on my gallery to take a closer look, freeze right in a footstep when I see it was a crook. I slide like book constrictor down the wall and to the floor, do a ramble through the living room and in the kitchen door. My blood was boiling over as I dialed the telephone. When I break the news to neighbour, my neighbour only groan. I say, neighbour, neighbour, a man in your yard is a damn old thief, man, he making life hard. Call the posse, neighbour, we taking a stand. It's time to fight back, but remember the plan. Neighbour get excited, like he want to break away, when he hear the call to action for the neighbourhood posse. I tell him, pay attention, call Mr Jones and Jack, or they set the ambush by the big drain in the back. Georgie on the other side must stand up by the wall, and everybody listen for when you hear me ball. Then karate kid across the road will rush in from the gate, but neighbour let us hurry, otherwise we'll be too late. So neighbour, neighbour, the call went round, we circled the yard not making a sound. Action stations, let the posse rule. Show this damn old thief who is the fool. With each man in position, I was just about to ball when something startled old thief like a Julie Mango fall. Cause suddenly he jump up and he ball out, ay ay ay. It's then I hear Karate Kid jump the gate like he could fly. As he hit the ground, the neighbor dog did rush him with a rar, And he end up like a ninja on top me neighbor car. Well, old thief pull out iron and he run down in the back. So I shout me out to neighbor and Mr. Jones and Jack. I say, neighbor, neighbor, the man have a gun. He come in your way. Run, neighbor, run. Tell the posse, neighbor, the man packing lead. So scat like a cat if you don't want to dead. I did not quite believe my eyes as neighbor jump out from the drain. But if you see me partner strike a pose like old John Wayne. He right hand stretch out way in front. He left hip pointing down. The top lip bent round the side, man the sheriff was in tongue. Stop right there, you criminal, I hear me neighbor shout, or else you're losing every tooth inside your nasty mouth. I waiting now to hear the bang if old thief start to blast. Instead I had to drop my jaw as he sprawl out on the grass. I say, neighbor, neighbor, what happened there? Like thief shoot himself as he getting away? As I watch him closest, then I see is laugh the man laughing hysterically. Me, myself and neighbour, and by this time Jones and Jack, we stand up watching old thief as he rocking on his back. If you see the great big shotgun man, it's swinging in his hand. I want to know what happened. Neighbour, what you do this man? Well, Jonesy couldn't take it. He bust up laughing too. When he watched me crazy neighbour, how he stand up in his shoe. Like madness take him over. Something bite him in his brain. I see my neighbour stand up more John Wayne than old John Wayne. I say, neighbor, neighbor, quick, turn your back. Now it's Jack like he having a heart attack. Well, as Georgie reach and he take one look, he drop down next to the howling crook. It's then I hear the police stand up shouting by the gate. But my leg was crossed so tight, I could only tell him, wait. Eventually, with caution, I start to make my way. But nothing could prepare me for what I see in there. It's two van load of police and soldier toting gun. And not a man would pass the barking dog. Instead, he want to run. Karate kid on top of the car, he begging for some help. So I raise me hand and neighbor dog did scatter with a yelp. I shout, neighbor, neighbor, police arrive. Jump on the teeth, we go take him alive. But as they reach in the back and they see Sheriff Wayne, not one of the constable's composure remain. Well, they had to carry old teeth because he couldn't even walk. Just as well they know his name, cause he couldn't even talk. Apparently the police had been hunting for this man. And now it's thanks to neighbor that he lock up in the van. Like a hero, single-handedly, 
my neighbor stop the thief, who every time you watch him laugh so hard he get in grief. He begged the police take him quick before he dropped down dead. Well, neighbor didn't like that. He want a bossy head. I say, neighbor, neighbor, don't be a fool. You catch the thief, man, the posse rule. Now, George and Karate, Jones and Jack, they all give a neighbor a slap on the back. I say, neighbor, man, it's a night to be proud. But he vex with the thief who's still laughing loud. Because the police gone now, it must be a mile. You could still hear the man. I had to hide and smile. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin, and the whole neighborhood posse. <laughs> Let's keep things moving now. I want to welcome to stand and deliver Ivy. Ivy, gonna talk about the market. Well, they just let me let me check it out. Ivy, take it away. The only one of the trio left on the farm, Calvin Joe felt alone. He spent most of his evenings with Anna but his new boss continued to make his life miserable. Calvin Joe had to wake extra early, although his pay remained the same because his boss wanted to increase production in every area to show he was better than his predecessors. Take it or leave it, he told them repeatedly. There are many others dying to get the job, many more lining up to come, killing themselves to come, dying for what you got. A part of his peeve with Calvin Joe, too, was that the boy never stopped talking about the former boss or comparing them even to newcomers, so he was told. Calvin Joe bought more lotto tickets and more rum, though he was trying hard to save. He tried to be good and keep his mouth shut, too. Most of all, the boss man must not know about his marriage but his bossman never let him go undisturbed. They were in the slaughterhouse that Saturday morning. Calvin Joe had gotten there at six o'clock instead of five. He had drunk copiously the night before, gotten home late and overslept. His boss descended on him with an onslaught of uglies. Calvin Joe did not respond. His teeth were gritted and his jaws were hard. His nostrils opened wide as if he were about to bray, but he kept on working. The boss walked up to the huge bulk and sneered. I will ship you back to where you come from. Calvin Joe began to think of the trip he wanted to make home to Jamaica and remained silent. His friend Buddy had warned him to stay out of trouble. The other workers, they held their heads firmly and looked out of the sides of their eyes. George sliced off the heads of three chickens in the seconds of sharp silence that prevailed. The boss man ranted, fueled by the fierce silence and the thick fear in the room. Resentment, which had been corroding his insides for weeks, spilled over into his glassy gray eyes, which shone with a kind of madness, like a rabid dog. Common sense gave way to anger, reason gave way to resentment, and self-preservation gave way to power. Red in the face, the boss man strutted up behind the boy. I gon' get your tail fired, you hear me? Fired, I gon' put your back on that plane, he squawked, and he poked his right index finger in the back of the boy's huge head. Energized by anger, Calvin Joe spun around with the neck cutter raised high and angling down towards the man's throat. The Guatemalan beside him and three others grabbed his hand before the cutter hit the throat. George stood with his mouth wide open, his neck cutter held high and glistening above his head. In a rage and anguish, Calvin Joe wielded the dead bird with its freshly cut neck and whopped the man square in the face. He grabbed another, a live bird, and swung it and clawed the man in his face. Everything happened so quickly that neither the boss man nor anyone else was certain where the blood originated, blood that was draining from the boss man's throat and face. He stood there gawking, scratches on his face, his gray eyes bulging, chicken feathers gripped in his yellow teeth. 
Knowing he was dead, he looked at Calvin Joe with weakly reproving eyes and slumped. After the others realized Calvin Joe had not killed him, they silently cheered their champion for whopping Beelzebub. Slowly, Calvin Joe doffed his bloody white coat and cap, headed down the green path out of Mitch Farm onto the unpaved road. Like a long, verbless sentence, he dangled along, dangled along. Thank you. Chauvé. Horace loved carnival. He lived in Pleasantville, and although he visited Port of Spain for some carnival events, his heart was in San Fernando for mass. Every year, he would take his vacation around carnival time so he could go to the Calitro tents, attend the various steel band competitions, visit mass camps, and most of all, jump up in San Fernando for Juve and Last Lap. He worked at the Texaco refinery at Point de as a refinery operator, and although he applied as early as November for vacation, his application was refused that year, as his boss indicated other workers had applied before him, and to besides, he had been given vacation for the carnival season for the last three years. Horace was very disappointed. Still, he controlled himself that since he worked shift, he could do his visits to the pan yards and some cultural tents when he was off or when he was scheduled to work nights. Many a night, he would relieve me late, coming straight from a calypso tent or a carnival fit, often tired and regularly still boozed. He had studied his work roster and made out a list of the events he could attend without being absent from work, for he knew that the bosses were paying attention to his attendance. He had already received a warning letter for being absent without cause and would have to be very careful. He looked at his list and was quite pleased. He could make most of the key events, but he was scheduled to work 73 on Carnival Monday and 3 to 11 on Tuesday and would miss Juve as well as Last Lap in San Fernando, his most favorite carnival activities. He kept trying to devise a plan to get off from work on these days. He tried changing shift with me and the other operators, but was unsuccessful, as we all loved our carnival and Sando Mass. Carnival Monday, a little hungover after fetting at Naparima Bowl, and with just two hours sleep and a heavy heart, he woke at 5.30 a.m. Horace took a taxi from his home in Pleasantville to San Fernando. He reasoned that he could have a little jump up before going to work. He was on Coffee Street next to Royal Castle, chipping to Guinness Cavaliers playing sparrows drunk and disorderly, and checking his watch regularly to decide when was the latest time he could jump in a taxi to reach Point Pier for his shift which started at 7 a.m. Drunk and disorderly, always in custody, my friends and my family, all man fed up on me because I'm drunk and disorderly. Every weekend I'm in jail, drunk and disorderly, nobody to take my bail. Horace sang happily as he followed Guinness Cavaliers towards the Carnegie Library. Suddenly, a bare bottle crashed on the ground right next to Horace. Screams and confusion as people pushed and ran aimlessly. Men and women fell down as a big fight broke out. Sirens and police. Horace felt handcuffs on his wrist as he was thrown in the police van. He spent the next two days in a cell at the police station. Getting locked up on a Friday in Trinidad means that you are inside for the weekend and would not get bail until Monday when the court, courts reopened. Getting locked up on Carnival means you remain in custody until Ash Wednesday. He was, on, he was released on Ash Wednesday with the other people without being charged, so there was no proof that Horace was arrested. Anyway, that was a story Horace told me 
as he apologized for not relieving me that carnival Monday morning, causing me to work a double shift. He told the same story to the bosses as his excuse for not coming to work. They could not prove otherwise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mutilal Budu Singh, for wrapping things up for us inside Stand and Deliver 2021. What a fitting way to end it with Horace's Carnival. Ah, boy, it's been a fantastic year for us inside the NGC Booker Split Plus. I know it's still a little bit different to do it virtually, but I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you're able to experience so much more than you would have been able to if you couldn't make it here to Trinidad and Tobago, or if you just couldn't be a part of the festival before. Thank you guys for coming on board with Stand and Deliver. Until next time, my name is Rokas. Do enjoy the rest of the festival. and welcome to the NGC Boca Slit Fest. You are with the panel Imaginary Homelands. We have with us today Barbara Lala, who has written 1,000 Eyes, and Leone Ross, who is the author of This One Sky Day. They're going to be discussing their new novels, which explore alternate geographies and histories. I am Karen Lord, and I'm very excited to be um, welcoming them to this. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. And um, I'm just going to quickly introduce by their bios, first Barbara. Barbara Lala is Professor Emerita, Language and Literature of the University of West Indies, St. Augustine. In addition to the novels Grounds of Tenure, Uncle Brother, Cascade, and Arch of Fire, she's the author of numerous scholarly works, including Postcolonialisms, Caribbean Rereading of Medieval English Discourse, Defining Jamaican Fiction, Maronage, and the Discourse of Survival, and the companion volumes Language in Exile, 300 Years of Jamaican Creole, and Voices in Exile, Jamaican Texts of the 18th and 19th Centuries, which was co-authored with um, Jean de Costa. And also Caribbean Literary Discourse, discourse co-authored with Jean de Costa and Velma Pollard. And her latest book, um, the novel 1000 Eyes, published this year, is what you'll be hearing about today. Thank you so much for joining us, Barbara. Glad to be here. And Leonie Ross, Born in England, grew up in Jamaica. Her first novel, All the Blood is Red, was long listed for the Orange Prize. And her second novel, Orange Laughter, was chosen as a BBC Radio 4 Women's Hour Watershed Fiction favorite. Her short fiction has been widely anthologized and her first short story collection, the 2017 Come Let Us Sing Anyway, was nominated for the Edgehill Short Story Prize, the Jalak Prize, the Saboteur Awards, and the OCM Bocas Prize. Ross has taught creative writing for 20 years at University College Dublin, Cardiff University, and Roehampton University in London. She is editor of the first Black British anthology of speculative fiction due out in 2022 with People Tree Press. Prior to writing fiction, Ross worked as a journalist. Ross lives in London, but intends to retire near water. Thank you so much, Leonie. Uh, is, your, is your microphone on? Can I just... Hear you speak again? Yep, absolutely. Okay, good. Sorry. No. Yes, I didn't hear you before. <laughs> yes. So I am going to ask these two authors to give you a little taster of their works. When we were talking about how speculative fiction often is, is very difficult to find a reading that doesn't give the whole game away. So we'll give you a little taster first, and then we're going to give you a longer reading after some discussion. And I'd like to start first with, with Barbara um, to give us a short reading from 1000 Eyes. Thank you. 
In 1000 Eyes, a group of abandoned children from various Caribbean islands endeavor to survive on one unidentified in a small sanctuary they know only as the Trust. Before <clears throat> was the thing to leave behind, and now the puzzle to unravel. Everything outside the Trust had come to them in driblets from the older ones like Shine. Nish had read everything Shine brought in, but books that had survived were few and far between, and in scrounging for over, overlook, overlook ca um, caches of oil, cloth, sugar, vicks, knives, ointments, or garden tools, he said there was little space to stop in the odd volume he might find. When he did, it was the rarest of all treasures, transporting her to places that she could not distinguish between as real or made up. Either way, none of it told them anything about where they were or why they had come there. What else is there, they had asked Shine before he left. Rand and Misha had been lying on their backs looking up at the sky, but she added, not up there, down here. And Brand insisted, what else? The whole world, Shine said. The world had five big parts and the nearest was a huge place where different countries or parts of countries were united. Homeland was one of the names it had for itself and it was a powerful influence on other places. Shine had been in school before. When the trouble started, he had to stay home reading all he could on his own. I don't know much, he said, but some countries got together so as not to get taken over by others and made this agreement they call a treaty. Homeland was part of the treaty before, but I guess a set of tiny countries can't join up as how they scatter in the sea. The island where the children lived in the trust hung close together with others like in a necklace, but only here were their children living on their own. Normally the islands had helped each other before a hurricane hit or a volcano blew up, or sometimes Homeland lent a hand, at least it used to be that way. Beach cracked her knuckles as Shine traced a map in the dust to show them what the world was like. Homeland had remained strong while some other countries had come through wars or disasters like earthquakes and tidal waves. A few still stuck up for each other, others were in turmoil, and the necklace of islands Shine had told them about got left more and more to itself. It was no point Brand asking why, because he did not know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara. That's just a taster, but it's a beautiful taster. It gives a very much a, a shape of the world, a glimpse of the world. And now we're going to hear the same little teaser taster from Leonie reading from this one sky day. Okay, so my first tiny reading, as you say, is a tease. It gives only a sense of what is possible in this made up, this fictional archipelago I'm talking about, which is called Poppy Show. And everyone in Poppy Show has a magic power called Cores. And today mm -hmm. of all days, magic is even more important and urgent than before. Uh, I'm going to read to you a tiny section from the point of view of a woman called Half, and she is a radio DJ, and something odd is about to happen to her. Half Genevieve Ochelia Nathan pulled off her old cracked earphones and nodded at her engineer. He queued up an hour of music as she got to her feet, stretching her stiff spine, rotating her neck. She waved. He grinned back. She let herself out of the booth and walked around the squat radio station with its massive antennae threatening to crack the roof. He was waiting for her in her tiny private room, sitting against the wall. His hairline was starting to thin off his fine high forehead and it made her feel affectionate. She sat down on the floor beside him and leaned in so they were nose to nose. His heavy arm lay in her lap. She was thinking about asking him to move it when her pum pum rolled down her leg and fell between them like a brown sea sponge the smell of salt. Io struggled to his feet and yanked her up beside him. They stood looking down at the pum pum, fetchingly displayed against the white board floor. What a ras, said Ha. You all right? asked Io. Well, no, she said. Io picked it up. They examined it together, plump in the right places, creased and glistening. It's like a sculpture, said Ha. No, wetter than that, fresh sour up. Io nudged her. It's alive. Here, hold it. She slapped his shoulder lightly, skittered backward. You hold it. You afraid of your own pum pum? No. Then hold it. I'm afraid. They laughed until their stomachs hurt. It didn't occur to either of them might be a problem with reattachment. 
Io sat between her legs. Ha drew up her robe. Io gently pressed it back into her body and crawled in closer to be sure the edges were neat. Io, said Ha. Yes, his lips twitched. I think since you're down there already, you should stay. Well, since I'm down here, said Io, already. That's a little <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Leone. I had the pleasure of reading your two novels um, during a very interesting, a very interesting and active fortnight in Barbados, where we were experiencing some ashfall from the um, the Soufrier, um, La Soufrière eruption in Saint Vincent. And I do have to say that it is it is incredible to me just how many of the themes, how many of the <laughs> some of the questions and so forth of the existence that we have now are very much in your books. And it's almost like you're making a modern myth. And the way you use myth and legend is fascinating to me. And I was wondering if any of you wanted to talk to me a bit about um, how you address myth as authors, how you use myth, how you see myth as acting in the core of our Caribbean literature. <sighs> jump in, jump in, anyone. <laughs> well, um, I feel a little guilty <laughs> to speak of myth. For only this reason, when I got to the point where I began to conceive of this book well, quite a long time ago, I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to do very much research for this one. The first two <laughs> research to the death of me. And this time I thought, I want to trust my instincts. I want to see what comes up naturally as this thing comes out of me. So I certainly am aware that one of the first things I became aware of wanting to play around with was the idea of the Obia man or Obia woman in this case. So my um, made up country, my made up culture is very much to do with Obia women and um, which of course are usually associated with negativity and rich, witchcraft, which also suggests African things that we said we don't like and we disapprove of, particularly in Jamaica, some of us anyway. I really wanted to revisit the image of the Obia person, in this case, specifically women, and make them positive, make them a very, part, a very um, essential part of the everyday community um, for them to become both the thing about my Obia woman is you're not quite sure what they look like. Sometimes they look very old, but sometimes they can also be very young. They are always women. There are no men. And they're also sometimes they look insectoid. So I love this idea that I didn't have to align myself with any particular rule of mythology or legend. I could actually take a baseline idea within my community, turn it upside down and then mm -hmm. play around with it. And I, I don't know if, if that resonates with Barbara at all. Yes, in a way. I am. Um... Well, I had a made up place too, <clears throat> and it will seem very familiar to some people because of course there are ruined oil fields and there are ocelots and there are any number of things that people in a particular island of the Caribbean will recognize. But the children are from all over the place mm -hmm. and some things are strange to some children, some are familiar to the others. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that there are Caribbean myths that I drew on um, in places, uh, not so much as, as myths. Um, they are realities, they are realities. Um, but it is difficult to draw a line between myth and reality yes. in, in the stories because the children do not know where they're from or why they're there. And everybody in the book is trying to figure out what happens. And of course, myth is, myth is a mechanism that humans have for trying to figure out how things got the way they are. So as the children try to figure this out, the myths are built. And there are points at which the children themselves are seen by others as myths. So that line becomes a very fuzzy one between the real and the unreal. And they, they, even the stars, they try to figure out what, 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 is, what is going on in the heavens. And to them, these stars could be the spots of a giant ocelot and so on and so forth. And so this, there, there is a making of myths and a reusing of myths and an explosion of myths as history and an undercutting of history as myth that we are very familiar with um, in the Caribbean, both from the, the criticism. Wilson Harris was talking mm -hmm. about that, that negotiation between myth, myth and history so, so long ago. So, um, but I, I did have to, 
I did have to look up. I ne- always seem to think that I have something that I know about and I should be able to just write from it. But always I get entangled in having to hunt things. I, I, had, I had to find out what an ocelot was really like to begin with. Um, I, I didn't want to present something and look stupid when somebody tells me that is not an ocelot. That is a, 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 and so on. So, so I somehow I always get um, bogged down, not bogged down because I enjoy it. I, I enjoy the research but it always becomes necessary. I know what you mean though, Barbara, that makes total sense to me. I mean, I'm, because I wouldn't want to suggest that I did no no research at all, but I know that anxiety that you think, well, what does the thing look like? I mean, there are conies in my, in, 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 in yes. my particular made up space, mostly because I felt really emotional and connected to the coney as something that the Arabax as in the Taino et, and that's something that had entered my imagination um, from very young, when I was a little girl, when I first he- he- started hearing about the then called Arawaks and now um, Dino. Um, and so I wanted to give the Coney a way to be in this, in this place. Um, it's interesting that we should both respond so much to animals in that kind of way. Yeah. But for a while I realized when I first hit writing about Coney, for some reason in my childhood memories, it was more pig-like. And then I was like, you know what? I need to go look and see what's going on. Like, oh my God, it's more rodent-like. And that had all kinds of implications for the ways that people oh. had a relationship with it, how they consumed it and so on. So I, I, I can completely relate to what you mean about doing that necessary research that makes you not look like an idiot at the end of it. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I, I wondered, I'm sorry. No, 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 please yes. go ahead. I'm saying, I wondered, you know, um, when, well, I read your, I, I had to read very, very quickly. And of course, I don't read as quickly on a computer. I had a PDF and I don't read as quickly on a computer. So I read this very thought provoking story. And I was looking at your world construction and wondering, um, and the way in which you seem to draw on multiple cultures, even though you um, had a setting where it was recognizably Caribbean and you had dialogue that um, came from, that showed a great deal of Jamaican in it and so on. And I was wondering about that. Your, the way, your I think that was work. deliberate. I, I think, I, I, and I think you're right. I, I became very self-conscious reading your own biography about the, the immense um, wisdom you have about language and how much um, research you've done into this and the way <laughs> that kind of played with, I was trying to play with both Francophone sounds, but also mostly Jamaican Patwa sounds, but not nail myself to something because I, I think along the way the journey of this novel and it was written over a period of 15 years so very long mm. I think I began to realize that I wanted it to have all kinds of different sounds of different Caribbean islands I'd lived in or visited and that I didn't want to say this is Jamaica even though very Jamaican of course but I also didn't want the language to be just straight up Patwa even though there's so much of it um, mm. so so I think that there was a sense of there's also a sense of occasionally even a couple of European mm-hmm. myths making their ways in. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a, a multi-god. Uh, uh, they have many gods rather than one god. Um, and that felt very Greek to me. But I think the bottom line here was that it was a, attempting to be a love story to the Caribbean as much as I was able to do that. But also I wanted to allow myself to do on the page what came to me naturally mm-hmm. after a, quite a long period, frankly, of feeling quite... Um, blocked and difficult with literature and with writing. I think I wanted to allow my imagination to truly flower. Yes. Do you find, Barbara, that in the, in your own world building, that you, that it, it rolls naturally off you? Do you feel self-conscious about the creation of it? Do you have full permission to do it in your own self? Or do you have to kind of, because sometimes we have to kind of encourage ourselves to, to be courageous about creating whole worlds. I mean, it's playing God, no? Well, I, I, funnily enough, in this particular book, where the the nature of the world that they find themselves in is such a mystery to all the main characters, it was not so much a world building as a world discovery. Oh, it, was, it was a continuous effort to discover. Um, the, yes, there was a building because you had to have a clearly visualized setting, and I wanted that. But still, the building up of it had to come through the eyes of people from many different places and speaking many different versions of Caribbean um, language 
And at the same time, because as lo- as once the children live together, the longer they live together, the more their voices mix, and the more you come out with something that is Caribbean rather than Jamaican, rather than although the Jamaican in it remains very Jamaican because you know she's stubborn, um, <laughs> and so <Aunt> on. <laughs> um, you know, aren't we all? So there's that. But but yes, there's a there's a continuous effort to find out to find out what what the world is like. What is it about? Um, and different people had different have different views of it, and nobody has a complete view. Mm-hmm. Nobody has a complete view. Nobody has a, a the, has e- even half the story, let alone the full story. And so it can only come about from the different voices with the different children whose memories have been shattered and who have come through so much trauma that mm-hmm. a lot of what they remember is best forgotten anyway. But actually, um, I don't want to. Sorry, I was just going to say, when you're talking about world building, what I found fascinating about both of your works is that you did construct some amazingly intricate and yet deeply familiar worlds, but then you weren't afraid to put them in jeopardy. You weren't afraid to almost destroy them. And there's something about the way the Caribbean deals with disaster, deals with the concept of natural disasters, disasters of human origin. And you have made a strangely hopeful picture of disaster because disaster is like a reset button. I was wondering if you could could talk about that a bit. Apocalypse is not the end, but maybe a beginning. In in, in my case, because the characters, all the important important characters are children, Mm -hmm. it had to be a reset because there was was only one way it was going to work. They they had nothing to build from. They they have no sense of what was before. And therefore Mm -hmm. they can only move towards trying to find somewhere else or build something new. That is is the only possibility for them as children. And I think for in, in truth and in fact, if we could throw our minds back to that type of perspective, it might be a better way forward for us. Um, to, to, to see in each catastrophe how mm-hmm. this crisis can be um, not manipulated, but at least traveled through so yes. as to arrive at a possible, at possibility. And so I'm talking, I was, I've always been interested in both academically and, and um, artistically, interested in the idea of a possible world, the building of possible worlds. But it's not only the writer who is producing a possible world. And in what I was trying to create, the, the, the group themselves are trying to arrive at a possible world. Mm. And storytelling yeah. is the, the most obvious and sort of life and death mechanism for doing so. And storytelling, of course, is a way to survive. And I really love the idea that we both use this idea of apocalypse as a um, reset button. I think it's, it's really finally recognized, Karen. Thank you. Because, I mean, that's, unless the, unless the apocalypse kills us all dead, right, mm-hmm. is a new opportunity to rethink who we are, what we can do, how our society runs. In the society I've created, their history is, has, been, um, has been affected time and time again by the earth screaming at them and various mm-hmm. things happening, you know, and again, of course, it's a hurricane in this case, but I remember um, someone said to me recently, it feels often like the Caribbean as a construct, it's what happens in between the trauma of an election and a beauty contest, which made me laugh <laughs> what goes on in this book. But this idea that we are constantly dealing with trauma as human beings, but also particularly within the Caribbean, we are dealing with, of course, our historical trauma, which remains and affects us to this day, and the traumas that come from economics and politics and so on. And so I, I wanted to create an environment in which another chance was offered. Mm-hmm. very earth has said to these inhabitants of this place, what choice are you going to make again? Essentially for me, they, they, um, they reject capitalism. Um, someone in the, I won't give too much away, but someone in the um, novel is monetizing magic, is selling it. Yeah. And this is something that the earth will not allow to happen. And so it, it makes lots of things, including the pum pum falling, it, it, to get attention and to start things again, mm-hmm. to invite people to rethink. 
I think that is something that we as human beings constantly need to, to, to do yeah. though, to ask ourselves yeah. what constructs, what economics, what politics, what society, what is our culture doing? And we do it naturally. We ask ourselves questions about what is the internet doing to us? What is the media doing to us? These are all important questions that can be illuminated in, in our form in speculative fiction. It's the yes. construct. And, and so often what the earth does is, and is triggered entirely by what particular groups in the society or particular nations versus other nations produce. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in the process, um, the, the nation one is in, is seen almost as unreal. It, it's, it's not just, mm -hmm. it's, it's, make, it's almost make-believe as if, as if it doesn't really require um, an actual, Inter not an actual intervention. It's, I, in, in the case of this particular story, the children are living in a circumstance that nobody else even knows about. And if they even hear about it, they will only see it as, as possibly make-believe, not a real place. In the mm -hmm. same way that the Caribbean is often seen by larger nations as hardly a real place, really a vacation opportunity, <laughs> um, that, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And I think that um, that effort to, to arrive at something real Mm -hmm. um, and to build something real is one of the things that I was interested in. in I want to pause you here because now that we've had a chance to talk about the bones of your story, the spirit of your stories, I think this is a good point for us to have the longer readings. Mm -hmm. So now I would like to invite Barbara to give us a little more of her world in 1000 Eyes. Okay. So no one knows what happened. Different children can only tell whatever parts of the story they recall. Tourists again, Thelma had said. Tourists can be good smarty, but they can't take care of you because they don't have nowhere that belong to them to take care of you in. Sometimes they can't take care of themselves, much less. How do you think me and Darity land up here? Thelma remembered, and probably Darity did as well, even though she didn't talk about it. Well, Darity didn't talk at all anymore. Thelma and Darity came from a larger island further north. They had lived in town. It was a tight, loud place with heat radiating off the sheets of metal that were walls and roof. Zinc, Thelma called it, though now she said galvanized so the others would understand. When their stepfather put them out, they walked and walked till they came to a wide open paved space on the waterfront. Thelma and Darity had found their way there a year before and learned to dive for coins while people threw from ships and shoot back up to the surface with a money or two in their fists. But now they looked for food. So one day they were searching a bin where people threw leftover food and stuff cleaners swept up from the street, as well as the fish guts dumped by the couple of fishermen who had cast a net from the dock because their boat had been stolen from them long before. That was when a woman called out to ask the two little girl children rifling through the garbage whether they wanted a thing called plantain tart. Want plantain tart? Any picnic would have killed for plantain tart. The woman said somebody bought it for her to try, but she didn't fancy it. She had thought the thing would have meat. The tourist lady watched them closely while they were yamming down the pastry, and she decided to buy them chicken. She told them her name, but it wasn't anything they could pronounce, and since it made no sense to them, they now only remembered her as tourist lady. Anyway, now they were friends with this tourist lady who had come off a cruise ship and was getting ready to board again. And just as she was saying that she wished she could take them along, water become a crowd thickened, tightening around them, desperate people shouting and cursing on the waterfront, demanding to get on the cruise ship. The people in charge of the ship hustled their passengers onto the launches and up the narrow steps on the side of the ship. Then the ship pulled away as fast as it could go because people on the shore were pushing off in any little thing that could float and some just threw themselves into the water and swam frantically for the ship. But somehow, in this fracas, tourist lady managed to smuggle the two little girls, born and growing ghetto, onto the ship. One big shiny ship with brass rail and glass cut in pretty shapes, tinkling and get around the lights overhead. In no time, she had them bathed and dressed into her t-shirts, which fitted them like dresses, and she said she would grease some palms to keep the children with her, whatever that meant. It sounded to Thelma like some type of dirty work. Only in no time, it came down to the same, same story. They were barely out to sea when another boat drew up with man and woman cursing and slashing, ordering some people into cabins and locking them in. 
when some of the crew on the cruise ship agreed to join up with them ruffian, that was that. The people who had taken charge separated the adults into groups, deciding who they could get money for and locked those up. They threw the rest overboard. Some they shot first, some they didn't. And one of them was tourist lady. The children scrambled away into any crevice they could find, behind stacks of beach chairs under lifeboats every nook. But that was no escape. The crewters sailed that cruise ship with their own boat close behind till they reached whatever point suited them. Then they told the children that the water near the shore was rough that day and they must do the best they could to reach land and stay alive till they were big enough to be useful. And they throw these children in the water. Plenty picnic, as Telma recalled, might be 30 or so, but most couldn't swim at all, let alone in rough sea, or not so far. In the end, just five or six washed up that time. Every year, these people the children called crooters came back for whosoever they wanted. But the rule was not to talk about that. A couple of the children had grown, have grown predatory and they have been driven out into the bush. From the bush around the trust, some of the children have acquired ocelot kits to which they're deeply attached. Sometimes the twins came sneaking near the fence. Only that could have get them ocelot right up so. The twins had had the habit of stoning the cats whenever they could, so the children would hear hissing and growling at night and heavy bodies plunging through bush with dry leaves underfoot. Whether the twins eventually went off on their own or the crooters took them would have been good news either way, as, Dor as Dorothy had liked saying a couple years back. She did talk then. But two years ago, Dorothy lost spat. Spat was older than most kids when a litter was robbed. And even after a year with Darity and Telma, when Spat knew them well, they didn't leave him free outside the trust in case he ran away. Not tame, tame, Telma said. Is that what make us tie out Spat in the bush when Darity and me and the rest take him gone out the trust looking for egg? We say we wouldn't jump up in a tree like the rest of the puss them and get lost. And it's then the men come down on us. Huge, fierce men with bright head ties swiping the bush with mashets. The children screamed and scattered. Only Darity crouched down beside Spat and refused to leave him. So Telma Wan crawled back to see. Nah, we're not taking you yet, one of the men told Darity. He gave her a grin so friendly that Telma could feel it crawl along her skin. You will work more later. Then he wrenched Spat away with one hand and swiped down the blade with the other. And in no time, spat skin rip off and everything's supposed to be inside the puss skin on the ground and they kick it with. Then the same man throw the skin over his shoulder and grin at Darity again. He say, how you fat and nice? I'll go come back for your skin too, next year or so. It was after that happened that Mitch, Celia and Shine started to insist the younger ones stay in the trust all the time. Darity had never spoken since. Thank you. Ooh, thank you so much for that reading. That was a point when I said, this is definitely not a children's story. <laughs> that was definitely the point. And it was very, very striking. That image of, I will come back for your skin too. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Leone, can you please give us your extended reading? They got Barbara for that moment is really one in which you stop and think yeah mm -hmm. okay my second reading tells the tale of a 19 year old twin called romanza intasar and he is the son of the local governor and this little bit tells how romanza came to be living with the indigent which are a group of disparate homeless people in a place i call the dead island and Romances is only one of several love stories in this book. And this section tells how he met his lover, Pilar. It also introduces how important it is in this culture to identify magic and use it properly. Uh, Romances' magic power is that he has the ability to identify a lie when he hears it. When he approached 15, his parents, like all families, considered how his cores, his magic, could make a life. What to do with a child who knew a lie? He needed an exceptional master teacher, his mother insisted, one with the time and passion, with impeccable reputation. 
Most of all, the father said, the boy need to be useful. You know how these blasted people are, teacher, looking hard at the Obia woman in attendance. If they don't think you have use, life is hell. Romanza knew his father had already paid this woman much money, slipping it into her hands, pockets, not even trying to hide it. Money to say his son was strong and could take the reins one day. And how much did a lie cost? The Obia woman was a pragmatist. She took the money. She also told the truth. This cause, this magic deep. It may take us time to find the right place for him, but he can acolyte with the police chief. Not one fool will get past him. So Romanza sat with the police chief. The chief shoved men and women into a seat in front of Romanza and asked them questions. Romanza said no and yes when the police chief looked at him. You thief the man house, you stinking dotty liar. No. He lie? Yes. The chief smiled and hugged his hands under his armpits and looked up at the thief and said, I did no. Look at how I'm fierce, scrunch up. And then he would take up a large implement and beat them around the shoulders, a blow in between every single word. This is for lion, you dog, court going deal with you, but this is for lion. And also, you hold on, woman, and touch our breasts. No, sir. He lie. Him telling the truth. Why you think about hold on, woman, and touch our breasts? No, him lie. Yes. And then another beating. At night, Romanza's father took him to dice rooms. His father always had two big men with him, and he sat with strangers, debating into the early morning, clinking and drinking and yelling. Himself, Romanza dozing in the corner, his father rubbing his shoulders, whispering to keep him awake. I need you to remember who lie. A roaring, ebullient man with sour eyes. Send a boy to him, hammock into sorry, not even grow crutches here, yet I have him out here. Can I trust them, Romanza? Not the one in the blue tunic, Papa. He's a liar. Good. Anyone else? That loud man. Yes? He says his wife is sweet-tempered. And? He don't believe it to be so. The father rubbed his son's head and rubbed the wrinkle between his eyes. It will all be well, don't worry. I'm not worried, said Romanza. He knew all that he was. He hated his job. The Obia woman had made a mistake. This was not his master teacher. This was not the proper use of his chorus. It was dirty and violent. It was dishonest. Then he met Pilar Tomas, dragged into the police station and accused of setting spell on somebody's cane field. Pilar, no more than 18, rags barely covering, dirty but sparkling teeth, red skin in the days and cool at night, purebred peasant, but the boys look like kin. You curse a lady, Canfield boy. Pilar won't answer, so the police chief applies his knuckles. On the floor, Pilar spits out blood and hums. You curse a Canfield. I speak. I gesticulating from the floor. The police chief bends close. I curse you, said Pilar. Good. The chief is merry, because I feel to give a good beating today. So lie right there, boy. I don't see no witness. Stay right there. I go and cut a rope. I soak it in salt water for you. The boys regard each other across the room when the chief is gone. Is you cursed the Canfield? Asks Romanza. No. Then why you don't tell him? He's a idiot. That is not the answer. I'm not answering any question like I'm a criminal. Romanza squinted. No, that's not it either. I proud like my mother. No, I hate cruel people. No, said Romanza. Pilar has a look about him Romanza has seen before. A willingness to consider the lies he didn't realize he told himself. This kind of lying gives him thin burning lines in his gums. Pilar looks at him like he's interesting and hums. They can hear the splash of water outside. The salt water and the rope will dry on the skin and get into the cuts and burn. Romanza pours water from the chief's jug and Pilar drinks, lying on the floor, one leg hitched over the other. Why you don't tell him the truth? I like to look strong, said Pilar. You like to look strong, yes, but that's not the answer to why you don't tell him. Pilar hums. Romanza says, that's a Coney song. Yes, says Pilar. Lizard, teach me. If you work out why you can't tell him, then you can tell him, 
and I can confirm it and he won't beat you. No use telling. Why you won't tell him the truth? Because beating is nothing, says Pilar. He pulls his clothes aside to show Romanza the scars wheeling across his shoulder blades, whipped around his waist, deep into the cleft of his buttocks. <coughs> Romanza can hardly breathe. It will hurt me if he beats you. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Pilar considers. They look at each other, recognizing what they share. <coughs> Worst time in a reading to cough. <coughs> I will tell him I don't mess with no cane field. The chief is coming up the steps. Romanza touches Pilar's back for the first of what will be so many times. Master, he says. Pilar smiles. Can I sit by you? The parents scream. What is this boy to teach him, this nasty indigent? His only friends, the moon and the bush. The Obia woman is called back and three others for the parents will not be hushed or comforted or trust Romanza's decision. Indigent, homeless, never, never. He will be of no use, no use, roars his father. But eventually judgment was made. The only important question was whether Pilar had something to teach Romanza. And he did. He knew the land and it never lied. Mm. Sorry oh. for the coffee, guys. <laughs> no, no, it's, mm. it's, thank you, you so much. Drink water. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Take a moment. Yes. Take a moment. This is this. These are two fantastic readings, and and I'm so glad that these were the selections you made because very much in the heart of these stories is is the, the character, the people, and there there's it's a it's a very large cast. Both of your of your novels have a very large cast, but you treat each individual story with such care and attention and such love that even when you're hearing. Um, something, well, somebody who's only going to be on the pages for, you know, maybe half a chapter, you get, you get very caught up in it, you know, like the neighbor who, who is, um, you know, eating the butterflies, you know, just that little moment um, it was, was something that I could get very attached to. And um, I, I do have two more quick questions that I would like you to consider before I look at the questions that other people are asking um, that are coming through to me on the, on the chat box. And one of them is the way you use time, the, the perceiving of time, the observing of time, the recording of time. Again, this is sort of tied to when you have a kind of a, a mythological approach, a, a folklore type approach to a story. But I was wondering if there was any conscious use of time in a not quite linear, not quite Western culture way that you were conscious of, of doing when you were writing your books. I... I, I certainly was very conscious of it because I was dealing with a situation in which time was interrupted, in which, in which every, every child had experienced a massive interruption in time and in, in which um, they had to deny, they had to forget things that had gone before. Um, and there would be a group of people who had their own version of what had happened. There were so many versions of time. And so there was this continuous interruption. And also there was a, a framework of um, uh, as, um, many narratives set within an outer framework of another frame, uh, a frame narrative um, on the outside. So I, I was very conscious of it myself. Yes, I was. I think I was conscious of it only as a kind of, not only, but primarily as a narrative device. My, my uh, work goes across one day, it goes across 24 hours, and I have timed it to make sure it's possible to do all the things that happens in the time. I did at one moment think to myself, if I can't fit it all in, maybe I'll apply some magic. <laughs> but I think, <laughs> yeah, I think um, it was fine. But I think, I think what I wanted is I wanted the narrative urgency of things have to happen in one day. I also mm -hmm. wanted the kind of psychological underpinning of that. For me, this is a day like no other. This is one in which all of my characters, my composite cast, kind of get a clue they needed to. They mm -hmm. all know, it's almost as if everything has come together in a kind of conflagration of understanding that people can make their next step forward knowing what they know now, what they know on this day. They're not, they're still flawed, 
you know, they will still have problems with addiction, with, with sadness, with, with, you know, they will still have challenges of relationships that have gone wrong and so on. But today mm -hmm. really is a day in which everybody went, hold it a minute, who will I be next? Yes. And so I think that, that that's the way I've manipulated time. In the world. Excellent. Now I'm just going to read a few of the questions that have come through, questions and comments that have come through to me. And um, I just want to invite anyone who's watching now, if you're um, on the YouTube site, of course, you can comment there. I think some people even are, are tweeting. Uh, we, we, we do see your tweets eventually, you know, remember to use the hashtag. And the first comment I have here is from Jen R from the YouTube, um, from our YouTube feed. And it says, interesting, myth reinvents, resets. The world one knows, is learning to live in, and also needs to recreate. Myth reinvents and resets the world one knows and is learning to live in and also needs to recreate. This is true. And then Winsome Monica, also on YouTube, says to you, Leone, that as a person of mixed heritage, you perhaps, finding your mixed heritage, you needed more than one God. You're in between space. Would you, would you identify with that statement or you're not sure that that's necessarily I mean, I think, motivation? I, I mean, I think that's a complex thing to talk mm -hmm. about and I, mm -hmm. I have another space for, for its complexity. Um, I don't think, I suppose my short answer is I don't think it's as simple as that. And mm -hmm. I think that assumes, obviously I, I as, as someone who is biracial and also bisexual, I, um, I'm in a space that is liminal and complex. Nevertheless, because I tend to relate as a black woman and as a Caribbean woman, I feel like that is less. <laughs> I'm more interested in the, the multi dimensions of black womanhood than I am uh, other parts of my background. So okay. I don't make the immediate connection in that way, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And um, what I would say as well is I still go back to how both of you use nature, both of you use your animals as almost in an almost um, iconic fashion, I would say, um, to, to kind of move through your stories and to indicate things to different characters. So I think that, that there's a certain level of almost um, minor deity in that. Well, I mean, I, I certainly got obsessed with moths and butterflies. In my in this in this world, um, moths are like heroin, and butterflies are like <laughs> liquor. You know. Yes. The relationship with them are then as culturally and socially and personally complex because people can walk around and just take a butterfly out the sky, which, by the way, I just did because it amused me. The idea of just <laughs> you have to kind of had I had in my head a visual of kind of like what mm -hmm. motion would it take now to get that in your mouth in a way that didn't interrupt everything. How would you swallow it so you didn't cough like I just coughed my head off? <laughs> um, you know, how would that work? And so I became actually quite obsessed with the physicality of that, but mm -hmm. also the idea that there is an underground of people using moths in a different way and are dealing with their own kind of addictions around it because addiction is an, also an important theme. Mm -hmm. and, and you have direct religion in, in 1000 Eyes because there's the memory yeah. of religion that the children have as well. Yes, and an, and an anxiety um, in the main character who feels she doesn't remember and that she needs to. But, but also the, the business of the animals is, is extremely important because the children are now just another set of creatures of the wild and they can only survive by learning from, from those that are there already, how to evade, how to climb, how to stay very so still that you disappear and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they, that, is, that is how they learn survival. Um, so it was the, the other creatures around them um, were crucial to the story and just as crucial are those creatures that they understand exist, but they're, we might think that they're myths, the, mm -hmm. the jinns, the, the, the dwens and so on. They, we don't know, the children don't know what is real and what is not real, but they're sure everything is out there and the only way they will make it is to watch very closely mm. and see um, how 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 the how the other animals in the in the wild are survived. I think Maybe. for books there is this importance, it seems to me, of paying attention to small things, to the way that the body reacts to reality, to mm -hmm what's going on in the environment to the small movement of the bush and what that may imply both about beauty and about trauma or danger coming. There's a mm -hmm. attention to detail. I think that we both, I mean, it sounds like we're blowing our own horns, but I would blow You can do that. <laughs> attention to, to detail in, in Barbara's work in particular, the environment mm -hmm. is tremendously important and mm -hmm. a kind of 
commitment to color and sound and motion and texture that I mm. think feels very necessary as writers who are dealing with their craft, but also Caribbean writers who are, uh, for me, certainly um, celebrating the gorgeousness of what we are. Yes, doing. absolutely. We've, we've got one of the best dime. things. Yeah, it can turn on a dime, you know, I should even say dime, yeah. a cent. In a minute, <laughs> we're in danger because it's also interesting. I mean, we could probably talk forever, but interesting that both of our, you know, we didn't confer on these sections and yet the suggestion of violence in mm -hmm. both of our sections and danger coming is, is yes. Really and in fact, this go ahead. There's a thing that's really interesting in your work too is the the operation of magic and also the sense that the different characters have a personal magic. It's not just it's not just a a a a, 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 a large a wider sense of magic. So much as something that is extremely personalized, which I found mm -hmm. extremely very very curious. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just, I was thinking of the implications of being magical, the truly psychological implications of it, mm -hmm. and particularly hierarchy as a hierarchy as well, because some yeah. people, they just have nice hair, and that's the magic. <laughs> and then they're like, what the is that, right? Some of them like, part. there will never be any flatulence. And the poor mm -hmm. old women have to seek to find that magic and take it as seriously yeah. as someone mm -hmm. else in time travel. But then it creates not only the laugh, but it creates this understanding of, what happens when my magic is better than your magic? Mm -hmm. How does that, you know, have an effect on both the individual and the society? Well, um, the magic is important. So if you can't fart, you have to find meaning in that. Yeah. I like the way you put that. <laughs> <laughs> and there could very well be meaning in it. It's, it's also yeah. about the creativity behind it, how you use the talent that you have. Yes. Um, I'm just going to share this last comment, which I um, from Le Fleur. Colburn. This is on YouTube again. And um, this is a, a beautiful statement here. She says, I'm holding the statement about disasters being reset buttons close to my heart as I wrestle with the surreal reality of Soufriere's ongoing inter eruptions. Vincy Strong. Le Fleur is, is one of our um, Vincentian writers based in Barbados. And um, yes, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely, um, we're holding a space in our hearts for, for St. Vincent and the Grenadines as they go through this. And um, I do invite people to just like, you know, so when we have ongoing dis the disasters, sometimes they fall out of the news, even yeah. when things are still going on. So I invite people who are watching this now to please remember that this is not a one and done thing, that things are still happening, that there's still support that they can give. And, you know, as, as always, Caribbean people are going to pull together and come together. So we don't have much time left. So I'm going to ask one short, easy question of both of you. Titles. How did these titles come to be? Well, mine was part of the part of the myth, the part of the explanation. The children grew up to grew up to explain the skies, to explain and and to give themselves assurance that there was a giant ocelot above them, and that the star, the spots on the ocelot were were extra eyes. It wasn't only looking down with the usual pair of eyes, but all of those spots were the the, the stars were the eyes of. So it was it was another it was a mechanism for for holding on and and feeling an assurance. Beautiful, and it's still the Mine sky again. Has two, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. version is this one sky day? The Amer the American version is Poppy Show, which a lot of people in the Caribbean will relate to. That phrase. <laughs> the short version is I love both titles. This one sky day was my choice, but the mm -hmm. American um, um, publisher thought that that was best for their their um, uh, I suppose region. They thought Poppy Show would sell sell better. Fine, I have mm -hmm. no problem. Love both titles, and I think both titles speak to the the work. In fact, I've become quite fond of the idea of, of calling it Poppy Show. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> now, um, apparently on, on YouTube, um, people are lamenting the fact that because they're not at the physical festival, they can't immediately walk out of the panel, go to the book table and pick up your books because you have, you have completely sold these books, I think, to the audience. Um, and I am, I am here as a totally objective observer to say that you need these books on your shelf. I think that these are going to be two classics, um, not just of the subgenre of Caribbean speculative fiction, but of Caribbean literature. I think they have important things to say to us about how we deal with disaster, how we deal with our personal and collective apocalypse. And, um, and most of all, there is such a familiar 
warmth and flavor, both, both of you, the way you describe food, for example, the way you describe scenery, there's something about it that the moment I am immersed in it, I'm like, this is the Caribbean. This is the Caribbean without a doubt. And, and this is the kind of work that is going to be the, the 21st century canon that is going to be in our schools that is going to be discussed and going to be influencing the next generation of writers. So you do, in fact, need to have these books on your shelf. Oh, wait a minute. Um, and not only that, to all the academics out there, I am looking forward to your um, analyses of these two books as well, especially within the larger genre of what Nalo Hopkinson is doing, what I'm doing, what Tobias Bacall is doing, Cadwell Turnbull, there's so many of us out there there's so many amazing common themes and echoes and threads that I'm seeing and one hour can't cover them all. Academics, I'm relying on you. We need some papers. We need some conferences. We're available to talk. <laughs> just, <laughs> just give us a call. We want to develop this. We want people to know about it. This is important for our nation. I will never forget that our very first um, government um, press conference after the Ashfall um, at the end of it, they read the poem, The Dust by Kamal Brathwit, which was about the ash fall back in 1902. And that was extremely relevant. We're all, almost out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you. Thank this was you. the NGC Bocas Lit you, Fest. Karen. Thank you so much. Imaginary Homelands. Thank you so much, both of you. Bye bye, Baba. <laughs> and pride. Understand what I say when I say pride. She refused to have us ride in free buses to go to school. Now you might call my mother a fool, but buses to her meant embarrassment and sufferation because she was squanched up with about two much children in the bus station. So it was the bouquet of hungry breaths, danger of heads mixed with perspiration, fused with the atomic scent for growing resentment of foreign ownership and equitable distribution of wealth. <laughs> Nah, forget all that freedom health. That scent was just Miss Betsy's daughter taking off her shoes in the bus. And Miss Betsy's daughter had this American pair of shoes in the village of Kumana. So them shoes used to be smelling high like an American pair of soldiers on top Salvatore Center watching down at the middle class. Miss Betsy used to give her daughter the same shoes that take cow down and rain water and sweat to go to school. And those American shoes were too small and couldn't fit her. I see them American shoes too small and can't fit us. That is why my mother did not want me on a bus. My mother had pride. Understand what I say when I say pride. She refused to have us ride three streets away to use the free internet cafe. Now you might call my mother a fool, but free to her meant free food and free food meant they had to qualify as poor to get it. So she rather take a loan for a computer set. It was not new but that computer set was ours. You had to be careful when using that computer set for hours. It was a fire hazard. So you had to put a fan on the computer so the computer went overheat. Then put a fan on that first fan because that fan wanted to overheat. But man, we only had one fan. But understand, 
my mother would take a stand at a time that seemed unreasonable just to create comfort. And when we give trouble, it used to be all man jack comfort. She was the fort that took sea breeze and cannonball, yet the thought of us children was always on her mind first. I remember all pride used to burst if one of these children was in danger. She had our futures protected before our womb was kicked in anger, in determination or desire. That is why I call my mother super. Now I have pride. Pride for my mother and that pride I'm gonna keep. I remember placing rubber bands on my stretch up socks so my socks wouldn't fall to sleep and muckers wouldn't muck. She accumulated a lifelong of debt to fill lunch kits and stomachs. So today I may stomach any negativity, knowing that it has been the lesson of something good. Her creativity now whirls in my veins. It is flowing my blood. No words were created in a vacuum. These words are the buds of a loving and caring mother. The nurture and care of my superwoman. My two favorite things about Trinidad and Tobago are speed guns and tow trucks. You ever see Port of Spain when they see a tow truck? It's like, oh shucks, who foot does can move like if the tow stuck when they see a tow truck? Shouting in the people, them store like bandits announcing a hold up PBM titty 74. PBM titty 74. Anybody driving? PBM titty 74. Because what fate befall that blue B14 could be for all. It don't even have to be your fault or your vehicle. But as soon as you see that cable pull, you feel things you never thought you was capable of feeling. To see a stranger's two front wheel in the sky, $500 go bye bye. And your pocket mourn the loss. I mean, it's not your car, but you understand the course, so you try to stop them. Of course, officer, he coming back for show. I know him. He's my sister, brother, dog, uncle-in-law. I like speed guns, too. Well, the ones who warn you from the other side. You could be pushing 120 in your little 120 wire, avert your eyes, and it's plenty lights, like, flickering. Unlawful fireflies, fire bun Babylon. If you wanna share ticket, you need to try harder. Farah is fast, we fast. Who could drive past our brethren on a bypass and not beep, beep, beat the system that does beat? We secrets we keep for each other. Deplorable. Applaudable. Squat on government land cause real estate not affordable. When I was younger, the current from our house came from a wall socket in our neighbor's home. And anything we had in our fridge was our neighbor's own. <laughs> Breaking law to break bread. People who look like we does never get a break, so believe we, we does bend. Contortion portions, stretch food, stretch truth, stretch through and grab whatever we need to climb. Because when a system insists in you sit down, the most radical thing you could do is rise. This is an apology to the guy that spoke love like scripture, that made me find sanctuary in the cracks of his smile and gave me an arm to rest my head and my troubles. And even if that arm fell asleep, he never did. He made me a believer in all things divine, like his voice, and his obsession with the apex predator and his random spurts of information and midnight conversations about weird family nicknames and past pets, all of which I would forget. And he would remind me again and again and I would listen with the eagerness of a child on a grandfather's lap. You were the first person I wanted to call home, to find shelter with. You were the first person to hold me accountable the first to unlock my doors, and at first you showed no emotions. And I thought that meant you felt nothing. It turns out it meant you felt everything. Every sharp cut answer, every shrug, every pull away, every I love you left hanging, and I wish, I wish you would have told me that I wasn't loving you the right way. Because nothing can grow in a toxic home environment, this poem is for the only guy to ever put me in my place, taught me to hold my tongue, Think before I speak, this poem is for the guy that was patient and slow to anger with me. He looked for lessons in every mistake, taught me to take time to teach instead of belittle. This is a letter to the first guy to leave me vulnerable, an incomplete home, 
open, broken yet whole to leave me wanting, in need of renovation yet content. And we often forget the importance of a first, but it's the foundation, what we begin with. It's where our ideas flourish. This poem is for the guy that taught me that love isn't always enough. There's more to it than that. And love wouldn't always get you all the way you have to work and try and cry and pray and choose to stay and choose to be solid. See, I've never been a ride or die kind of girl, but you were the first guy to make me want to say till death do us part. And they say home is where the heart is. So I've been homeless for about a year or so now. And I've since moved on from what I thought home was and started rebuilding my walls. So this apology is just me laying the bricks. Family is folklore. Unlikely characters creating culture, bridging gaps, setting the foundation for future generations. Family is different personalities, like Jab Jab and Papa Boa, Sukuya and Laja Bless, Mama Glow and Duen, yet still they stand as the parents of our tradition. And they may not always mesh. Cause if baby doll don't like Dame Lorraine, that don't mean that the joy of the bacchanal and the adrenaline of the lacquer race, top pump, last laps and master our veins, parades on stage and pulsate the very bane of our existence. And family is messy, like Port of Spain after Carnival Monday. And family is conflict, like a fight that break out during Juve. But that is how it is. Because family will fight all those who oppose and clean up the mess for the sake of love. Love for future generations looking to us. Unlikely characters, bridging gaps, setting the foundation. Everybody have a body, but not everybody body does body the same way your body does body. For instance, somebody body missing our air and some body body missing some hair. But that don't mean that their body is any less body than your body, yeah? Every body body different. You don't get to pick and choose the body that you're born into. If you could, I bet men would have picked a body that form fit. Somebody body born with an automatic four fit. Somebody born full length and somebody body born four fifth. But if that's where you had to work with, that's where you had to work with. Body's just kind of weird like that sometimes. Somebody body can take care of its body, so it gives the body to a relative. Which, of course, in theory, is relative to the fact that families kind of the same. Everybody family different. Somebody family have the means to raise the child with a silver spoon and tooth. And somebody family don't even have the means to raise the youth. But I don't mean that we get to shun a family for not being what we want a family to be. For some, family might mean no one gets left behind. And for others, family might mean, look, we get born a step behind. You don't get to pick and choose the family that you're born into. If you could, I bet that somebody would have picked health and wealth. But if your family do family the way you like, when you get the opportunity, Make sure that your family, family right. Treat your family finally like your body. Give it health and wealth. Okay, maybe you didn't get to choose the family that you're born into yourself. But when you pick your family, make sure that you pick a family that suits yourself. Everyone has a dream. A vision of what we want. The things that make us happy. And help us make others happy. Let First Citizens help you paint a brighter future. A new home. A new car. A new day of living stress-free. Make the things you picture a reality. First Citizens, we put you first.
No? Is that no? <coughs> Hello, and welcome to the Bokus Lit Zess. I am your host, Bookie Monster, the Book Zesser. And today, we interpret a touching coming of age novel set in the Caribbean, Crack Crack Monkey. The story is realistic, the characters are audacious, and the themes are universal. It is an enduring classic. And now, an excerpt from Crick Crack Monkey with puppets. Uh, are we rolling? Ready? How's my hair? All right. Uh, this is Lionel Wildmane of WATT. What FM? And we're here at the General Hospital with, uh, uh, we believe his name is Milford the Monkey, uh, where it is believed he has broken his back and apparently other bones on a piece of pomerac, one of our local fruit. Uh, well, uh, let, let's hear directly from this gentleman about uh, what the events are. We go right to him. Mr. Milford, Mr. Milford? This, this live TV? The, uh, on TV? Okay, now, uh, you're saying that you can't recall this, but it is obvious that you have sustained some injuries, uh, apparently to uh, your leg here and to your arm. How is it that you cannot recall this? Has it indeed affected your memory? I, 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 don't, I don't recognize what you're talking about, you know. Nothing happened. What happened? Please don't deny it. It's clear that there's been an accident here. And uh, it seems from the doctor's reports that it was, in fact, fruit-related. I, 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 I don't even know. Yeah, look, look, look. Have you always been addicted to Pomerac? I, I don't even like Pomerac. I don't even eat Pomerac. Everybody know I don't eat Pomerac. Mr. Milford, there's no need to be ashamed. I have had a Pomerac problem myself, as have many of us. Tell us. Tell us what happened. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I deny in everything. Everybody knows it's a fig man. It's a fig man. All you go from here. Claim not to like Pomerac and yet it's obvious. It's obvious that there has been some giving over of yourself to the fruit. And now you're suffering and in pain. I, I don't remember if it affected my memory. Well, well viewers, there we have it. Although Mr. Milford is denying it, the, uh, the extent of the pain that he appears to be in appears to have affected his memory, his personality, and apparently also his sense of humor, funny bone, and his uh, ability to tell us the truth. This is Lionel Wildmane reporting again from the General Hospital with Mr. Milford, who is not only lying here, but apparently is lying. W. W. A-T-T-F-M. What? Back to you in the studio. What a performance, my fellow book -sessors. That was an excerpt from Crick Crack Monkey. You know, between you and me, I did never think Monkey would have stooped so low as to break he back for a piece of Pomerac or even a old ham sack. I just say it. But join us again for another episode of the Bocas Litzess. Until then, I am your host, Bookie Monster, reminding you, more reading, less stressing, is books have we zessed, is ideas we wetting, and knowledge we get. Bookie out!
Our story today is drama at the Tobago Heritage Festival, written by children of Tobago. Every year, John and Nora took Billy, their champion goat, to Buku Race. But one year, Billy ran away from Buku Goat Race. The race was about to start. Bear, bear. Billy bleated because he did not want to race and he pulled away from his jockey. Billy turned around and head off the course and out of Buku. Stop, stop, stop. stop. Nora, John and the jockey shouted as they ran after him. But Billy continued running and shouting. Run, run, you can't catch me. I am the fastest goat on the island. He got to Scarborough and ran uphill to the cannons at Fort King George. Nora, John, the jockey and some people from Buku village followed the all shouted, stop, 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 stop. But Billy stop, shouted back, run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. <laughs> Everybody was out of breath. <sighs> and tired. Some villagers sat down to have a water break. That goat really run fast, a boy said. Yes, he could win the race this year, answered another. Billy heard and looked back. He tripped on a rock and went rolling over and over down the hill. When he got to the bottom of the hill, he get up and he started to run. He ran past the stadium all the way to Mount St. George and bounced into a crowd of people eating food. Stop! 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 You are supposed to be running the goat race, shouted Nora, John and the jockey. But Billy pushed his way through the crowd and shouted back, Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I am the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> but it was a harvest celebration and the people served plenty dishes. Rabbit meat, crab, dumpling, fish, lambi, lobster, mm, barbecue chicken, duck, cassava. And he heard someone say, pass the goat. Curry, Curry goat? goat? Billy thought and ran faster, followed by his friends. In Pembroke, he ran in and out of houses. Hey, hey, wait, 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 hold that goat. Stop that goat, hey, wait, wait. <laughs> and onto a field where people were pressing sugar cane. Stop, stop, stop. stop. Shouted the villagers, but Billy just shouted back. Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> he ran to Roxborough and through the main rich forest. Then he ran along a river bank until he reached the sea in Palatyville. Nora and John followed, running up the hills and down hills and up the hills and down again until they got to Castara. In Castara, two sisters were putting leaves and wood and dry coconut husks in the dirt oven to bake sweet bread, coconut bread and cakes. Mm. Some of the Buku villagers stopped to buy bread, but Billy the goat was not stopping. He kept running. Stop! Shouted Nora, but Billy shouted back. Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat on the island. Billy ran until he got to Mariah and bumped into a wedding party, doing the old time <laughs> wedding brush back dance from church to reception. The bride and the groom jump aside in fright. When they saw Billy Horns, Billy kept running through the wedding party, followed by his friends shouting, Stop Billy! Billy, Billy replied, Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I am the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> he reached Monkul Lane and Golden Lane, where under the gigantic Gangang Sara Silk Cotton Tree at Culloden, people were dancing the reel and jig. As he flashed up and down the hills again, he got to Lescato village and then onto Table Peace where people were listening to old time stories. Now this story is about the Lajabless and the Lagaho. Wait, wait, wait. Stop! Shouted the villagers. You are going too fast. But Billy answered. Run, run, run. As fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> he was scared of the fruit bats at Diana's Vale water wheel and speed pass and continued running through Plymouth. The village with Tobago's famous mystery tombstone of Betty Stephen. 
before the British it was settled by the Latvians and later the Dutch. The British established Fort James overlooking Courland Bay there in 1760s. He never stopped running. You can't catch me. You can't catch me. You can't catch me. <laughs> and sped past Black Rock until at last he reached Buku, followed by Nora, John, the Jockey, and the Buku villagers. Billy shouted to the group, run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat on the island, and I could prove it. He ran back onto the racetrack, followed by Nora, John, the jockey, and the Boko villagers. Everyone, Everyone get, get off, off the race course! Shouted the MC over the microphone. Billy and the jockey entered the final race, and they came last because they were so tired. But Billy was given a trophy because he was the only goat in history to run across the whole island of Tobago. 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 masculinity is a really big thing for me whether it's caribbean masculinity or any other masculinity we need to be writing me new men mm -hmm. and um i would say that's true of male writers as well um but um again i'm talking about old myths so when there's an old taino myth but there's also an old european myth in this book which is the myth of eros and psyche cupid and psyche and that's a european story about um a virgin or maiden woman who is initiated into erotic love and in in doing so to pass from maid to woman she has to surrender to eros and the story goes that you know she's eros says you know i love you i love you darling but you must never look at me you must never look at me and of course one night she peeks a look at eros and then that's her undoing and so for me, again, being a feminist writer, I wanted to flip that myth because in these old stories, it's always the young woman who learns such. It's always the woman that has to learn the lesson. The woman has to surrender to Eros. The woman has to be taught this big lesson about sex. The woman, the woman, the woman's always a young girl has to learn something. So in this book, um, it's David is the one who has, um, a relationship that changes him and changes him and makes him a better man and so we have him narrating about this love affair and how meeting such an extraordinary and different woman um changed him and and so we have eros because he is the lover he is lover man you know he gives the mermaid her rite of passage but it's really about how this completely innocent woman how he surrendered to her mm -hmm. so we have male vulnerability yeah but we've been talking about how unspeakable violence against women shapes our society and not for the better Awful. and i think books like mermaid act directly as a counter narrative to that violence they absolutely do yeah i think that's something that we that writers need to take seriously which is um which is this, you know, cultural misogyny, chauvinism, it's gotta go. We need men, we need men, we need male writers, we need male partners. I remember getting involved with the murder of Asami Nagakia, which was about five years ago. Murderer never caught. A few months later, some woman was found in a freezer down in Port of Spain. Murder Shannon never caught. Banfield. Yeah, yeah. And then this keeps happening and we have 500 murders a year, but at least a hundred of them are women um, who vanish to disappear never found you know a missing woman is a dead woman it's just shocking and you know yeah writing needs to confront this
absolutely all writers male writers need to confront what's going on yeah i think yes i think for andrea barrett for ashanti riley and for the countless women stretched across mm. trinidadian and caribbean history if writers mm. have it within them or even if they think they don't to confront it mm. there's never yeah. been a better time to do that than now <laughs> Welcome to NGC Bocas Lit Fest event uh, in a cold country is the title of this panel. And we are going to be talking with Kai Kellogg and Andrea Alexis, two Canadian authors. Um, and so the times being what they are and space and time being split in new ways, we're going to have this conversation in two parts. So we're starting now with Kai Kellogg. Um, so I, we're looking forward to talking with him. And uh, Kai Kellogg is a novelist, poet, and sound performer. His work engages at a crossroads of social engagement and formal experiment. From Western Canada, he lives in Montreal and has roots in Guyana. His book include Dominoes at the Crossroads. Uh, his newest is a short fiction collection published in 2020. There's Magnetic Equator, which is a poetry collection published in 2019, and Accordion, uh, published in 2016, is a novel. Kai's writing has been awarded the Griffin Poetry Prize and the QWF Hugh McLennan Prize for fiction. It's been listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and the Grand Prix de Louvre de Montreal the Amazon Walrus Foundation First Novel Award and the QWF AM Klein Prize for Poetry. So um, uh, we're glad to have him here joining us. We wish we were in the old firehouse with nice breezes blowing in. And it's more, it's more fun to talk about in a cold country, in a warm country, but this is where we are. Kai, welcome. Thank you, Anton. It's very nice to be here with you, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, in a cold country, indeed. It's warming up now, though. It's uh, we're we're right at the beginning of spring, so yes, that's that's one of the things about cold countries that we 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 hold on to those moments of of, of color coming in. Um, and speaking of which, perhaps you can you can can warm us a bit with uh, giving us an excerpt from from the collection. 
Sure. Um, I'm going to read a, a short passage from uh, this collection, Dominoes at the Crossroads, which actually recently came out in French translation, and the French translation takes its title from um, one of the stories. So in French, it, the, the title is different. It's Petit Marronage. Um, and um, I'm going to read from a story that has a French title. Uh, the story is called Navette, which is shuttle. Um, on January 28th, 1986, the space shuttle Challenger was scheduled to take off. My uncle was fixated on the sole African-American crew member, Ronald Irwin McNair. Ronald McNair played the saxophone and he planned to take his saxophone on board and record a solo while in space. My uncle was very serious about what this symbolized. For him, the outer space conceit that existed in some black music, the shiny metallic costumes, the lunar landscapes on album covers, the shuttle cockpits whose consoles were synthesizers, Sun Ra's belief that he was born on another planet, and the general idea that music was a kind of ephemeral space vessel would be revealed as both vanity and prophecy. Vanity because here was a man who was not getting high, who was not pretending to be a cosmic traveler while playing a synthesizer, but who was in fact an astronaut and who was going to make music in outer space. On the other hand, what if all of the costumes, antics and fantasies of interstellar travel prefigured this moment, the launch of the Challenger with Ronald McNair and his saxophone on board sent the message that black music would be at the forefront of the future, leading people beyond the inanities and indignities of police profiling, second-class citizenry, Reaganomics, referendums, dictatorships, fear, and flight. Ronald McNair's challenger flight was not about fleeing. It was about purpose and direction. The challenger lifted off, but it exploded seconds after it broke the sound barrier. On February 7th, 1986, the Duvalier regime was toppled and Baby Doc himself was on a plane to France, fleeing for his safety. Just a short passage. Yeah, that's, that's a great passage. I, I think that's a great place for us to start. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's a great place for us to start because it, I, I, it ties back into the the English title, which is, is Dominoes at the Crossroads. And I, I, I like titles and I think poets write great titles. Um, so when I, when I look at that, I, I see, you know, all of the images of, uh, of dominoes and action, you know, that, that thing about toppling dominoes over action and reaction and certainly crossroads. And so in, in that passage, there's a lot that's going on that's about crossroads in terms of, of, of moments of change, moments of decision, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about, about how that comes through in the work? You know, it's funny, I love titles too. Um, and I think that goes back to the days when you're younger, when I was younger and, and looking at, at my parents' LPs, right? Um, and you, and just the, 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 the record title and the listing of the song titles always um, sort of represented like a, in a way, a guide to what the record, to the content of the record, to what it could possibly mean to you, to where it was pointing you. Right. Um, and so I like titles because they, they, they show the direction in a way, or I like titles that can do that. So I don't treat them lightly. Um, and Dominoes at the Crossroads came to me as a, as a title when actually seeing men playing dominoes at a crossroads and the phrase just sort of, you know how a phrase can just idly kind of meander through your head just as an observation, when an observation of something, like something that you see actually appears in your mind as language, you know, just, it just sort of happens suddenly. And that was the phrase that came into my head and um, I thought that it had a nice role to it and that it rhymed. Um, and uh, it, it, it stuck, you know, it stuck. And it, uh, it gradually kind of became attached to not only a story, but to the collection. 
And what I like about it is that it, it for me represents a kind of, um, I mean, dominoes isn't always a relaxed game. You know, it can be a pretty intense game, but nonetheless, it is a game. Um, and it can be, and so for me, it represents a kind of detente right at that place where life and death meet, you know, where a serious decision has to be made or perhaps a, 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 it's a crossroads, um, you know, a, a, a meeting of different options and directions in life. And right there, people are, are, are sitting down and watching time pass and playing dominoes. And that, that sense of, of, of being aware of the moment and being at that crossroads, but not, um, <clears throat> but it, it sort of being relaxed in that, in that, at that moment of intensity um, and that meeting of directions uh, struck me as something that, um, you know, these characters over, throughout the collection consistently face. Um, there are a lot of moments of decision. Uh, one of the main themes in the collection is, is um, travel and kind of displacement. Um, and so people have to consistently, you have to continue to carry out your life and make decisions for yourself, um, choose your direction um, in spite of um, <clears throat> maybe feeling like uh, direction is something that is hard to come by um, or that um, your direction has been, um, I guess you have been redirected by forces that are beyond you, beyond your control, but you still have to find direction in those moments. So that's those are sort of some of the ideas behind the title. But I also like the title. Um, I thought about that title because it, um, it references an actual physical image of people doing something. So you kind of see it. Um, Absolutely, and um, you know one thing that we, one thing that we talk about in in New York anyway, where so many uh, African diaspora people meet is, and Caribbean diaspora people meet is that you can tell by how someone plays dominoes which which country they're from. You know, uh, Trinidadians I think are kind of laid back with their dominoes playing, but Jamaicans are very serious, H Haitians likewise. So I'm not sure how Guyanese folks play it, but but, but, you know, I think that's kind of fun. Um, I'm thinking, too, of the French title, Petit Marinage. And um, I noticed in your acknowledgments, uh, Nalini Mohabir is, is someone that you mentioned. And I, th and I, I look at the first, the first piece in the collection, which very much situates this as, you know, stories that are going to engage in geography. Geography in that sense, not just of, of physical geography, but of human geography and, and how uh, uh, living in a cold country, living in, 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 a, in a country that doesn't see us in the same way that we might want to be seen, how, how, how city planning and city development, all of these things come into play. Um, so maybe, you know, you can talk to us a, a little bit about geography. Um, in the collection? You know, the collection, um, one of the things that I was setting out to, to attempt with the collection was to have um, um, sort of formally an idea of displacement um, active in every story um, throughout the collection. So there's a sense that what I was trying to reach was a sense that nobody ever really arrives, um, that you're always in flux and in movement and so is your story. And so I don't think that, I think there may be only one or two stories in the collection that are told from the place where they occur. So if a story happens in um, uh, Toronto, say, it might be told from, um, you know, uh, uh, Vancouver, or if it happens in Jamaica, it might be told from uh, Montreal or something like that. So there's always a kind of just a slight shift in terms of place. Um, uh, but, you know, one of the things that um, you mentioned Nalini and, and Nalini is a friend, Nalini Mohabir is a friend of mine. And, and one of the things that we had discussed um, uh, sort of in the days that were, the times that were preceding sort of the release of this book 
one of the things that we had been in discussion about was this historical figure in Montreal, in Quebec, named Marie-Joseph Angélique, who is a, um, she was an enslaved woman and uh, who came to Quebec. I think she was in Portugal for a while. Um, and then she was brought to the States and then up to Canada, uh, up to um, Nouvelle France, which is New France, which is what it was called at the time. Um, and she is credited with uh, burning down the, the port, the old port of the city, um, which was then located on the river. And um, it's never been fully substantiated whether that was um, really a full-blown act of rebellion, in a sense, whether she was burning down her mistress's house in order to um, explicitly escape from slavery. Because there's another story that goes with that, that she might have been trying to run away with her beloved, who was uh, a white painter named, I don't remember his name, but he, and after these events happened, he just vanished. Um, but uh, whatever the degree of deliberateness behind her actions and whatever her end goal was, uh, the actions were fascinating because they represented um, actions against the system of slavery that was active here. And she is a towering historical figure here, but who has never really been given her rightful place in history. And um, Nalini and I had been discussing what would be the case if she might have been a figure who had um, resisted slavery in the Caribbean. Um, and there like so many of the figures who had done so, they are considered you know, national heroes and they're venerated. But Marie-Joseph Angélique is not, and she doesn't have the same kind of historical status here that she might have back there. So one of the things that we had joked about was that Montreal is an island um, and that if it were an island in the Caribbean, there might be a gigantic statue to her here and she would occupy a totally different place. And our conception of our history would be um, very different than what it is now, because our conception here flows totally from the, the, the perspective of, of colonial conquest. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the perspective here. So, um, you know, some of these considerations were a lot of the considerations about the book came from, um, as you mentioned, a sense of place and a thought about place that at least in the imagination, place can really shift. One place can be superimposed onto another. One place can sort of slide into or out of another. Multiple places can be held in the mind at the same time. Um, so a story can take place, um, you know, at, in another um, hemisphere, uh, or another part of the hemisphere at a different time in history while it's taking place here as well. Um, so this overlapping of times and places that, um, that really uh, um, sort of was thought of as, 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 as an animating force behind the collection. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, see, I see that time space kind of just, just troubled um, view of time space really playing out as you as you read through the collection and you realize how things connect. Um, you you talk about Marie Joseph, and I want to say that there are fascinating characters throughout this piece, and and so she's a, an historical character. But you know we have uh, characters that really the readers are gonna be able to just be arrested and drawn into um, their stories. Um, there's a story, um, Extraordinaire, Extraordinaire, uh, where we have um, what seems a very simple story that stands alone and we have uh, someone telling a story who is, when I read that story, I thought, okay, I know, I know where this story started, right? We have this man telling a story about his former life as a spy, but more importantly, now he is a he's he has a shop, a, a, an underground shop, and he he sells African art. And I I thought, oh, I know where this story started. This is this is a mat, you know, Kai walked past this 
this shop one day and created a story, a backstory for this person's life. But then as, as we read through the entire collection, we see that there is so much connected and interconnected with this through time and space and through place. Um, so I, there's, it's really fascinating how as we, we go further in this story and closer to the end, we see sort of a, a, an unfolding of things that connect. Um, Along the way, we have things that connect stories, especially music, um, other you know, conversations about art, about sculpture and art, and how those impact in stories. But talk to me a little bit about structure and the conception of this larger collection through time and space and character. Sure. Uh, thanks for mentioning that um, that character who who um, owns the shop. That character is actually a character who's plucked from um, uh, a Quebecois novel from that was published around 1968. Sort of important Quebecois novel, and it's this peculiar uh, moment um, where um, suddenly, in this novel that is about the you know the Quebec. I guess struggle for independence against the the English um, but the novel is set in Lausanne and suddenly in like the first third of the novel um, this character named Hamidou Diop appears and Hamidou Diop is presented to us as a Senegalese double agent um, he's described in about I think it's like 56 words or 57 words and you can only develop a character so much in so few words in such a short passage and then the character disappears and van vanishes and is never brought up again in the book and is not brought up in other books of of Akane's. so you know as a reader you're forced to ask well or as a as a as a reader who's attuned to these these curious placements of black characters and characters of color and uh, in you know who suddenly come out of the margins of the experience that's being told and appear in the spotlight for a brief moment and then vanish. You're like, why did that happen? How did that happen? And so um, Domino's was an attempt to think about instances like that um, and to think about characters like that who pop out of, um, uh, who exist in fiction or who existed in history or who exist in historical paintings, who are sitting at the margins of a historical painting, contemplating the action that's going on. And, um, you know, to, I guess, um, shift the discussion a little bit, or at least um, enter into um, uh, a heated conversation uh, with, the kinds of perspectives that push characters like that to the margins and that have these bizarre moments where the character has, has, a, has a brief moment of spotlight and vanishes or the character plays a purely um, uh, um, supporting role, which is essentially in some, in some respects can be seen as a role of, um, you know, you are, your role in this story now is to push the narrative along so that the central characters can enjoy the spotlight, right? Which is a role of, in a way, a role of literary servitude. So um, the, the aim of this collection is to enter, enter, enter that conversation and take it up with, um, I guess with, with literature and with painting um, that has served to um, fortify and establish um, particular colonial narratives and perspectives here in Canada. I don't know if that answers your question um, <laughs> about characters, but... And uh, no, it, it took me to, it, it took me to a better understanding and it certainly was, it's, it's great to, to see that and to know that's what's going on here. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, we're going to be talking with Andre Alexis later and, you know, he has um, his collection, Beauty Sadness, that in, in some ways, you know, is about speaking back and talking back to literature. And, the, you know, there's there's this tradition um, of doing that. And I think it's so important um, 
So it's nice to know that that's part of what's happening here. Um, uh, the one of one of the central things that goes through is 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 music, and and there's the character who's the saxophonist, um, and from your from your bio, um, I see that, and I'm not from the direct, but I see that you you work very closely with a saxophonist in your own poetry and your own your own sound work. Um, I'm thinking perhaps you can can talk about how that influenced the book, and perhaps if you like, you could share a bit of poetry that 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 ties in. Um, I can, yes, I've worked and collaborated with a saxophonist named, uh, Jason Sharp, uh, for a long time. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that I just can't emphasize, um, enough is just how amazing it is to participate in the live making of live music. Um, uh, and, but, you know, more toward the book. Um, there's a story in the middle, a long story called uh, Petit Maronage, which became the title of the French translation. Um, and that story is about a musician on tour. And one of the things, you know, I read Jack Kerouac's On the Road when I was way too old to read the book, right? To be impressed by it. Like if I'd read that book when I was 19 or 22, it might have made a much bigger impression than it did because I read it when I was about 37, right? Um, so definitely like out of the uh, age bracket uh, or the target audience, target demographic for that work, I think. Um, and one of the things that struck me was, you know, it, of course it's a road narrative um, and kind of embedded in that narrative is this idea of discovery, um, you know, especially when, when the characters go to Mexico um, uh, but they go back and forth across the states and formally and structurally what's interesting about a road narrative is that you don't really need a plot you don't have to do any explaining or any setting up or constructing of the plot because that is the plot like it's 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 wherever the book goes um and um i thought that within this collection given that it thinks about place and displacement and movement and migration, immigration, that, um, that it could be interesting to include a road narrative and a narrative of movement across the country. Um, and so it's a, it, that story is about a, a musician who is on tour across Canada and internationally, and a saxophone player who plays um, the tenor, but who starts, I think, on the alto. Um, and one of the reasons for writing that story as it was written was to um, kind of situate and locate the black presence in Canada in a variety of places across the country, uh, but also to, 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 um, to uh, you know, it, given my, in my own experience, right, touring the country, not every city you go to is Toronto. Um, and what that means is that when you go to some of the smaller cities, shall I say, you're, um, you enter into the, the, the cultural relationships that exist there. And your presence might not be something that is familiar or that is desired or that is um, uh, you know, palatable to some people. And so, you know, your experiences traveling and touring across the country really give you a sense of um, some of the attitudes and perspectives that exist there. And the, the zones of comfort and familiarity and how narrow those are in a, in a country like this, how small they are um, uh, for a black person in a country like Canada. And I'm sure this, the, something similar might possibly be said for the States, um, but um, the experience touring and playing events and going to literary festivals around the country really informed that story in particular um, and in a way the collection formally. Uh, but I don't know if I can find a passage for you. Um, 
that would that would be appropriate uh, and that would reference um, music in the appropriate way. But I can I can definitely try something. Um, so here's a short here's an the truth is white cursive issued from a brick chimney is a skeleton in brown gabardine wandering the underground city, an accent, a drift in its second language over a B-side version of empire. I speak French. I am a sovereign state drifter, winter hinterlander with a mortgage and expired aeroplan points, a vacation blazing on the credit line, unnecessary to history, my culture extracurricular, Creole vernacular stutterer. I ride the Metro underground with my fur, collar tickling my chatter, Metro stuttle station to station, but I don't matter. Carapace of white earbuds contains my rude redemption. I go to work in the heart of a conquered devotion. A thin mist descends over me, a blown surrender. Snow falls through me. It is always snowing inside me. My hand is a blue fleur de lys torched by autumn. My sap is slow. It hardens glistening in its circuit. The sharpness of pine and spruce tingles on the yellow edge of my breath. I find refuge from winter in the Hudson's Bay, Boxing Day sail, born in a corporation. I can't pretend. I was not born on the equator. I died in the upholstered ease of a sedan. And here is my after. City blistered, gray by salt and winter, work in a tower, a payment plan carrying anonymous class aspirations. And this is my squalor, an abstract longing to cruise the foothills in a Lincoln Continental hearse, bleached teeth chattering nonsense as the zero of winter ascends. I think that might dovetail with the idea of a cold country, huh? <laughs> Very much so. And that's a beautiful way to tie this together. We want to thank everyone for joining us. Kai, thank you for sharing with us uh, your poetry and your fiction. Um, we continue now with Andre Alexis. Uh, we welcome him back to the Bocas Lit Fest. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Um, uh, perhaps like me, you uh, first read Andre Alexis, uh, when 15 Dogs won the Giller Prize. Um, and once reading that, you were fascinated, impressed, moved, and you had to find out uh, what this mind does with other writing. And so then you found other novels, Childhood, Asylum, now uh, the novella A, Pastoral, um, and later you get treated to the Hidden Keys and most recently Days by Moonlight. Um, along the way, you know that these, uh, Mr. Alexis has won the 2017 Wyndham Campbell Prize and he had earlier won Books in Canada First Novel Award, the Trillium Award, and that he showed up on short lists and long lists for all, all as the kids say, all the Canadian awards. Um, and then you find out that there are short stories that uh, the collections Despair and Other Stories of Ottawa, Beauty and Sadness. And you, you, you go into the, the realm of Andre Alexis, enjoying every moment of it. And perhaps you haven't um, read short stories by Mr. Alexis, or you've read some of these and not all. And so now we're thrilled that we have the collected short stories uh, under the title, The Night Piece. So we're gonna talk a lot about the short stories that are collected here. And um, uh, we're glad to, Mr. Alexis is gonna read a bit for us. So Andre, if you would. I will. I'm gonna read the first um, piece in the collection, which is called Wilderness and which was actually used as a libretto for a piece for voice and I believe trumpet or voice and cello, one of those, anyway. So this is normally accompanied by um, music. Wilderness, one. Days before traveling, she dreamed of pine trees and mountains. 
In her dreams, the trees and mountains were a barrier behind which there was nothing. Not the usual nothing, but an unnameable blank. In one dream, for instance, she put out a hand to touch a spruce, only to discover that the tree was made of glass, that all the trees were fragile and broke into darkness if touched. In another, a man in a white coat smiled at her, pointed to the trees and mountains, and then, without asking, took her hand in his, brought it to his lips. This was an erotic dream. There were others, more disturbing. The sky on fire, the water on fire, the air on fire. The kind of dreams that made you wonder if you'd eaten something foreign for dessert. But these days, she ate only the dullest things, bowls of gelatin, grapes and strawberries entombed within, rice and corn, vanilla cake and strawberry jam. Not the kind of things to bring fiery dreams, though, to be safe, she gave up eating jello. The dreams persisted, however, and Audrey began to think of them as heralds of Canada, as if the country cast its mythic shadow, green, broken glass, forward to meet her. Two. Papers, please. Just a moment. Ma'am, your papers, please. I can't find them. I think I've misplaced them. I, I don't know what to do. If you don't have proper papers, you'll have to turn back, or... Or what? Well, I could allow you in, but without papers, you'll have to wear a porcupine. What? You can't be serious, young man. I'm too old for such things. Look, you have three choices. You can show me your papers, or you can turn back, or you can wear this porcupine around your waist while you visit our country. And she found herself standing beside the car, the young border guard beside her, his hands around her waist as if taking her measurements. Gradually, and with the economy that comes of habit, he pulled the length of twine from the loop he'd brought with him and tied the porcupine to her, twined beneath the animal's front legs, its spiny back rubbing against her lower belly. The porcupine struggled very little, and it occurred to her just before she woke up that there was something strangely pleasing, even arousing, about her predicament. Perhaps, this being Canada, the small animals were well behaved. This, too, was an erotic dream, one she had repeatedly while in Canada. It was more mysterious than those she'd had before coming to the country. She'd seen no porcupines in Canada, had had no difficulty at the border, and what's more, she had no interest in small mammals. Something about the country, something about the north, expressed itself in prickles and binder twine. Three. And then, almost before she could stop and say, I'm in a new country, she was home, bereft of dreams. Canada receded like, well, the dream it had been. Who could keep in mind so many trees? But though her dreams stopped, they left a kind of residue, what would you call it? An oneric dust that, from time to time, rose up like black talcum powder or black mist and obscured the whole world around her. When that happened, when in daydreams or reverie, she found herself fading into darkness. She remembered Canada. Not specific details, but impressions. Maple trees, washed out blue sky, mountains, cold green lakes, and the smell of pine gum. And it comforted her to imagine the darkness as a country she might visit or visit again. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I, I'm glad you read that piece, although I could be happy if I closed my eyes and picked one any piece in the book that you would read from. Um, some things in that piece that I'd like to talk about as we go through, um, there is the, you know, the use of dreams that uh, comes up very often. Um, there are lovely little touches of humor, just the, the wry humor that there are just a couple places. I just read that story, you know, in the past few days and you reading it, I just smiled as you got to a couple lines. Um, but, but the porcupine, right? Um, one thing that I'm fascinated by that I, I, I think is throughout the stories is the way in which you employ almost like a, a scientist in, in a lab, you create an experiment where there is this, this 
absolutely non-real element that forces characters and readers and perhaps author to consider, to contemplate life and to contemplate action decisions. Um, and is that fair to say? Does that that's resonate? True. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think it's actually also a bit of a, um, I think it's a bit of an aesthetic constant for me. Um, I think uh, the experience of the uh, unplaceable, something that just doesn't fit into your conception of the world, forces, of course, uh, a, a reconsideration of your own world as it forces you to consider the thing that you're seeing. And of course, as, a, as, a, as an immigrant, I, I was born in Trinidad and uh, went to Canada when I was around four years old. Um, the experience of uh, Canada was an experience of strangeness. I mean, on a very, very fundamental level, what snow is to a child from Trinidad is very hard to express. And it went beyond that. It went to the different kinds of um, smells, the different kinds of flora, the different kinds of fauna. So that my experience of a new country is partly the constant refiguring of what is and what is not the world. And so in, in a way, my fiction is a, a, a way to constantly experience that moment and rejig or reorient myself within a world that sort of briefly doesn't make sense or profoundly doesn't make sense too. And dreams are really, um, they're really lovely for that because they're environments in which you have to fight to understand meaning, sense, but there is sense there. And that's the uh, tantalizing thing about dreams. So yeah, you say there, there is sense there um, mm -hmm. and you, you fight to get the meaning. Another thing that in reading in reading the stories that is is throughout for me is that each story can be read in so many different ways on so many different levels. Um, mm. And and that is a hard thing to pull off as a writer, but a wonderful thing as a reader to to encounter. I'm thinking, for an example, of the story um, letters. Um, and so here we have this, this it's, it's letters that go back and forth, well, just, just in one direction um, mm. for um, folks who haven't read it yet. It, letters go from one person working in a Canadian office um, and the story starts off very traditionally as many of the stories do very realistically and sort of devolves or certainly evolves um, the characters things that he's encountering are very strange and they continue to get stranger and stranger. And so it can be read as, as a, a mental health, um, someone decompensating as time goes by. It can be read as a commentary on family dynamics and office dynamics. Um, in reading it now, I look and I think of, I was reading it in terms of nationalist movements going on. I mean, you know, in the United States, it's hard not to read anything um, yeah. in that in that way. True. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in in how you pull off the, the that multi layered um, approach. And well, it, it's kind of deliberate. Um, this this is going to be a slightly longer answer than um, you might have hoped for, but partly it's because I started off wanting to be a poet, and one of the things about poetry that I adore is that unlike prose, unlike a novel, where you provide the environment and then you make signs, words, images that make sense within that environment. Here in poetry, you don't have the whole environment. You just have these moments of sense-making. And those moments of sense-making, nouns, verbs, that come at you and are suggestive, they're a little bit like dreams, but they're also, um, just nicely layered so that a poem on rereading can mean so many different things. Um, from reading to reading, you can go from thinking it means this to thinking it means literally it's, ob it's opposite. Mm -hmm. And I've always found that to be one of the, not just charms, but profound aspects of writing poetry that I was not able to 
uh, on the surface at least get as a prose writer. I started off as a very frustrated poet. And so some of my sense making and symbol making has to do with that. But deliberately having different layers of meaning comes from, you know, in some ways, a, a longing for poetry, a longing for multiplicity, which is, of course, again, the situation of someone who comes from elsewhere and sees a world, but also sees another world on top of that one. Do you know what I mean? I see Trinidad and Canada at the same time. For a while, when I was growing up, these things were com competing impulses, even at the, at the, at the sonic level where, uh, you know, how I pronounced words was teased out of me by people who said, you know, you can't say ax, you have to say ask. And so sonic reality was even double in that sense. So there's something, uh, there's something hospitable to me in the idea of poetry. And there's something about what poetry does that comforts me in the sense of being, you know, in an environment that is strange and one has to interpret. Um, poetry is a good way to get used to that interpretive impulse, which is a natural to a, to an immigrant, and which is, I think, valuable to humans in general. Anyway, I that I, I that so makes sense um, from from the readings. Uh, your connection to poetry, I it, it comes up again and again, and and I want to ask maybe us to talk maybe a bit about, about the genres to continue that conversation and the differences, because I do see in, in looking at the short stories, a sort of, that they compared to the novels, while we are still looking at the same sort of like, you know, examination of life in, in, in very similar ways. And certainly the ability to read them differently, yes. But the novel, the, the, the short stories in particular seem to, occupy a, a different realm, perhaps I could call it darker, perhaps you would choose another word. And I'm wondering if, you, if it's fair to say that they, they occupy a different, a different space. Um, I would agree with that, but I might attribute it more to, um, my, well, let's see if you, if you agree with me. I feel like when I was editing these things and I didn't want to touch them too much because I kind of, there's a, there's a good 30 years between the first pieces and the last. And I felt that the person who had written the early pieces had to be respected. Mm -hmm. um, but also some of his um, stories were profoundly disturbing to me. I didn't really get why he was mentioning, and I don't want to mention things, but you know, there's certain things that happen in some of the stories where I'm like, what the hell is going on with your psyche? <laughs> Um, you know, but I also feel that um, from those early stories in despair, which are uh, untamed, if you want, because mm. they are um, a, not a cry for help, but a, um, they're ones in which my aesthetic ambitions were not at the same level as my personal ones. I needed to express certain things and I wasn't really as uh, deeply committed to a, a kind of aesthetic exploration as I became, which I think is natural. After a while, you constantly do a thing and you start to be interested, not just in the message, not just in the surface, but in the how to, the why, the, the, the kind of root level creativity that's going on. And I feel that sort of the later stories are more conspicuously literary and also um, a deeper examination into my discipline. Whereas the earlier stories feel at times like a, a bald revelation of um, personal distress. And that, um, you know, as a 60 year old, I can see the distress of my 20 year old self and feel um, mixed emotions, happy that the, that 25 year old or so was able to express these things, but also kind of bewildered that he did. <laughs> like, why would you, <laughs> you know? It's it's incredibly brave. It's incredibly brave to to have done that. I um 
and and this is something that you address too. That sort of line between between author and 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 subject, author and work. Um, mm -hmm. I, I oftentimes people and myself included think of fiction as this thing that is it's fictive. It's 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 entirely divorced from you know anyone's reality, and and we know that's not the case and and and, and you you burst that line by including andre characters in, in different ways in different places but i really enjoy hearing you talk about you know the andre as the man in the 20 year old versus andre as the 60 year old that's mm -hmm. that's so it's fascinating it's it's really instructive um yeah and it's really important in uh uh, I, I wanted to express this very succinctly. I feel, um, and, and, and this, is, this is a tricky business here. I feel that my 20 year old self was very faithful to his emotional distress. But I also feel that my 20 year old self could not be faithful to anything but his emotional self because he didn't have the means. And in a way, if you go back to the earliest work, there is the least division between the writing self and the living self. But as I've grown older, I've wanted to insist on the writing or aesthetic self because sometimes people force you to be the living self, the, the, the realist. And they look at your stories and search out personal meaning in them. I actually feel that that's detrimental to the story. I want there to be an aesthetic involvement with the stories. And that's why to an extent I'm happier with the later stories because I feel that um, it's a trap for you to try to imagine the man uh, the, what the man is feeling who is writing those stories. And I'm playing on you trying to imagine what that man is feeling and using aesthetic means to say, no, this is about the imagination. No, this is referring to other literature. This story is called Kawabata because I was thinking of a Japanese writer named Yasune Kawabata and thinking of him while I was writing this. I want to frustrate you from thinking this is Andre Alexis speaking from his real life and um, that what the real is here is somehow much more valuable than the imaginative or the aesthetic. I've come in some ways full circle on that um, question to want to insist on the imaginative, the aesthetic and the playful because I think that's a way for the audience to get closer to themselves rather than to me that the work can function then as a way for a reader to get to know what they're feeling about this, the surprise, the shock, the unhappiness, the, what it is to read something that is foreign. That should be a deep involvement with you and the work, not with you and the writer, which is always kind of an illusion anyway. You know, you don't have a relationship to me. You have a relationship to my aesthetic work. And I, I, I prefer it that way. I, yeah, I, I think, well, writers around the world uh, and maybe across time, thank you for that work in, in, in kind of that educational, that kind of like thought work that for readers. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, as you were talking about that, I, I think of a couple of things. I think of, of A and, and how that does some of that work in creating in talking about the writer's process and sort of like allowing the readers to imagine different ways, really troubling the concept of how work comes um, and forcing them away from closer to this, this a very imaginary um, process. Uh, and there are other, other stories as well where you really kind of hold up the writer's process to a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, and I guess that's a function, as I was saying, of becoming a lot more aesthetically inclined as I got older. 
a lot more committed to the art that I was doing um, rather than to the life that is producing that art. A in particular is, uh, I think, I was gonna say it's my favorite thing that I've ever written. Um, but I think Days by Moonlight is actually my favorite thing that I've ever written. Um, but A is pretty close. And that's because A, um, by delving deeply into how the imagination works, does kind of touch on personal things for me as well, you know, um, what it is to interpret. They're, they're, they're weirder or more difficult questions like, what is it to interpret? What is it to create? Is there such a thing as a, um, you know, the platonic idea of inspiration from the gods to you? What would that mean? If we literally say that God inspires poets, well, let's think of that notion of an all feeling and all sensing being. That means as in the moment in A that is the one that my mother hated, um, where uh, the God feels both the pleasure of eating a small child as the crocodile and the terror and fear of the child as it's being eaten. On some level, as creators, if we have to embody those two things, it's a really complicated thing that we do writing. And I think that we do have to enjoy eating the child and be the child being eaten. And uh, that's why A for me is so personal. For that image, you know, in, 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 in particular, I just thought, yeah, that kind of gets to the heart of um, the tricky business that we do as writers. I, oh, I'm, I'm searching my mind and, and I can't search my notes. There's a phrase that you use in A to sort of sum up that. And it's, it's, it's it, um, I, I don't know if maybe I can help, if you can help me out. Um, it's something. There's something empath. It's it, it describes an empath, but but sort of the tortured empath. I think it might be something along those lines. And I think that yeah, the, yeah I can't remember. But yeah, that would seem to be referring to the 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 notion of the god who is necessarily uh, what we would call a fragmented personality. I mean, that's our notion of god that each one of us is, you know, pertains to this God. Well, then that God is in fact crazy by our own definition because mm. to keep so many absolutely opposite and uh, horrifyingly different psychic moments in mind at the same time, that psyche would have to be splintered, fragmented and unhealthy. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that comes from, you know, extreme creativity. I um I I I think it's no accident that the the work reflects your constant work and thought about the creative process um, and your 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 reviews and your essays that talk about that I, you know as we look at the the stories from beauty and sadness are here but the sort of introduction to beauty and sadness is, is not here in the collection. Um, and mm -hmm. I invite readers to, to search that out and, and read that as well alongside, because I think it, like this conversation, it really, it really enhances the read and really brings just more to a reader. Um, I'm glad. Sorry? I'm glad. Yeah, I hope that that's <laughs> true. Yeah. yeah, that was a moment of crisis, you know. A, um, Beauty and Sadness was a moment of, of real crisis of um, having written from the age of 19 to the age of 55 or so and been barely able to pay rent, you know, realizing that there comes a moment where you have to look back and say, well, should I keep going? Um, was this the right path that I've chosen? And to recommit to that path and to um, literature, to the creativity that comes from the use of words. And in, in, in some ways it was really stressful to go through that, but it was also a settling of accounts with my life. No matter what my life is from here on in, I'm a writer. I'm someone that has to take into account what it is to write. 
I'm not good for anything else. I'm sort of like a very bad tool when it comes to any other use. But I think I'm an okay instrument for the use of um, the art, which I, uh, you know, from that moment too, I kind of was in touch with how much I love literature, which I do. It's everything for me. Mm. Clearly, clearly the love shows. Um, mm. I'm glad you're not good at anything else as a reader. I'm <laughs> yeah. glad that that's what... <laughs> and, and I think of, of Toronto 4, which is the final piece in the collection. Um, mm. And that sort of like, it, it speaks to that moment that you describe of, of and, and it's there's this beauty and there's a different relationship with God. There's a prayer that, that, that comes through from this writer in crisis um, that as a writer, I find very empowering. Often in Q and A's, people will ask what advice you can give to young writers and what, you know, how, how do they, they go forward with this? And I think very much Toronto 4 is, is, is a beautiful answer to those questions. Oh, good, I'm glad. Yeah, that was one of the, was that one of the later pieces? No, that was put at the end by my editor who made, who did a good job. That was, a, in, in some ways, that um, was one of the most distressing moments in my life as well. In this case, I had broken up with somebody that I loved, and it was horrifying, as everybody would know. Um, and these four pieces came out of the pain of losing somebody that I loved. Um, just a breakup, not a life loss. Um, and so there's something, it's interesting that uh, those are maybe more personal statements than, uh, again, than I might've intended, but, you know, sometimes you need the writing to work out these things that are part of your psyche, don't you? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And again, I'm glad I have the writing to do that oftentimes. I'm yeah, glad that we had time for this this conversation, I, unsurprisingly, you surprised me. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, Good. Folks, I'm glad you joined us this afternoon for uh, uh, our panel uh, uh, from the NGC Bocas Lit Fest um, in a cold country. Andrea Alexis, thank you for being our 